Hello there! In this tutorial, we will create a Pokemon-inspired RPG. In there, you can explore an overworld full of characters, and you can fight trainers and wild monsters. The battle system is also quite complex. You are able to choose a range of attacks, switch monsters, and even catch wild ones. The entire thing includes a lot of animations and visual details to make it look nice. Also, monsters can level up and evolve. They also learn new attacks on some levels. To visualize all of that information, there will be a monster index that shows you the attacks, stats, and abilities of all of them. All combined, this will become a fairly large tutorial. But you are going to learn how to organize complex projects, how to manage databases, and how to build your own user interfaces from scratch. Skills that can be incredibly useful. Now, creating these projects requires a broad range of skills. For example, in this game, I have relied heavily on vector map and geometry. If you want to practice these concepts more thoroughly, check out the sponsor of this video, Brilliant.org. They offer courses on all of these concepts that are full of interactive lessons and hands-on problem-solving skills. Not only is this approach uniquely effective at learning, it is also much more fun than just passively reading a book or watching a lecture. It is also really good at getting you to build problem-solving skills, since this is what you were doing from day one. On top of that, all of the content has been made by award-winning teachers, researchers, and professionals with industry experience. You can access Brilliant via a website or an app, and spending just a few minutes on it every day will help you learn a lot. So instead of scrolling idly on the bus or at the gym, you can build a powerful habit that will make you a more competent thinker. Brilliant also recently added a lot more content, like programming with Python, data visualization, and how LLMs work. And they regularly add more content. If you head over to brilliant.org slash clearcode, you can get 20% off a subscription and the first 30 days are free, so not much to lose. And if you subscribe, you also help me make more videos. So thanks again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Let's get started with the game. And the first thing that we need is the overworld with all of the characters. This will include a lot of imports since we have to cover quite a bit of artwork. So I suppose let's start by looking at the project folder in which we have four subfolders. Audio, code, graphics, and data. The only folder that we will work in is the code folder. This one actually already contains a few Python files. I will talk about them once they are needed. Besides that, we have a data folder with a whole bunch of tiled maps. Those store the various layouts of the overworld. Finally, the graphics folder contains, well, all of the graphics. It's probably a good idea to have a quick look at all of these files, just so you have an idea of what we are working with. Although, I will also talk about it when we import them into Pygame. You can get the start folder and the folder for each stage of the tutorial on GitHub and from Google Drive. Just check the video description. Now, to get started, I want to go to the code folder and open main.py and settings.py. Here we are inside of main.py, and at the moment, nothing is really happening. We are simply importing everything from settings. Let's have a look at that one. All the way at the top, we have a couple of imports. The most important one is Pygame. But on top of that, we are importing from Pygame Math a vector2 as a vector. For this project, we are going to rely very heavily on vectors. So I want to have them available quite easily. This part isn't strictly necessary, but it makes our life a bit easier. Finally, from sys import exit is going to be used to close down the game later on. After that, we are defining a couple of basic constants, like the window width and the window height, the tile size, the animation speed, and so on. None of this is too complicated, or at least I hope it isn't. After that, we have a couple of dictionaries. For example, this one defines all of the colors in the game. These dictionaries aren't too important for now, so don't worry too much about them. I'll cover them in more detail later. So that's the basics of settings.py. Although, before we continue, there's one really important thing. For this project, I am going to use pygame-ce, or Pygame Community Edition, not the regular or traditional Pygame. That is because there are two versions of Pygame, the traditional Pygame and pygame-ce. And the version that you want to use is pygame-ce. This one has frequent updates, it has more features, it runs faster, and it is 100% backwards compatible. There really isn't any reason to use the old Pygame anymore. And if you want to install it, you either go to the PowerShell or the terminal and type pip install pygame-ce. That's all you need to install it. In my case, I already have it installed, so I don't have to do it. 
Now, the one important thing you want to keep in mind is that inside of Python, you are importing Pygame and Pygame CE in the same way. Both are imported with import Pygame. That is important to ensure backwards compatibility for Pygame CE. But if you have both versions installed, then this is going to cause some problems. So I would recommend to get rid of the old Pygame entirely and only use Pygame CE. You are retaining all of the features and you get some additional ones. So you're not losing anything and all of your old projects are still going to work just fine. Righty, with that, we have the setup. That means we can work inside of main.py and create the basic game class. Let's call it class game. No need for inheritance, but we will need a dunder init method, in which we first of all want to initialize pygame with pygame.init. Next up, we will need a display surface. Let's call it self.display underscore surface. This one we are creating with pygame.display.set underscore mode. This one wants to have a tuple with the window width and the window height, which we are getting from the settings. There we have window width and window height, and those we want to pass into a tuple inside of set mode. Also, while we are here, we can set a window title with pygame.display.set underscore caption. And to make sure that I am not getting sued, let's call it monster hunter. Cool. With that, we have the basic setup. Next up, we want to have a run method in which we are going to run the game loop, meaning while true, then we want to get an event loop and we want to run the game logic. The event loop is fairly simple for event in pygame.event.get. At the moment, the only event that we care about is if event.type pygame.wit. If that is the case, we want to run pygame.wit and the exit method that we are getting from settings, this one. That way we are able to close down the game. After that, inside of the game logic, at the moment, we can't really do anything, but I want to set pygame.display.update. So we're making sure that whatever we are drawing inside of this run loop is going to be displayed. And that is it to get started. All we have to do now is inside of the global scope, check if dunder name is equal to the string dunder main. So we are checking that we are in the main file. If that is the case, we want to create one instance of the game class. And on that class called the run method. If I now run the game, we should be seeing a window. And there we go. That looks good. We can also close it. So all of this is working just fine. Oh, and by the way, if you have no idea what these terms are, so if you don't know what a display surface is or what an event loop is, I should mention that this tutorial is for more advanced users. I will already assume that you have a basic understanding of Pygame. If you are entirely new to it, check out my ultimate introduction to Pygame. This one is going to cover all of the basics. The next part that we have to work on is going to be the imports for the level. And for that, let's have a look at the project folder. In there, we want to look at data, and in there, we have all of the maps. Those contain the data for every level inside of the game. And the most important one is world.tmx. And by the way, all of these files have been created in Tiled, which is an open source map editor. If you have that one and you open a the map, there you can, for example, see the overworld. Now for this tutorial, you don't have to know Tiled in too much detail. Although, if you want to expand the game on your own, you should probably know the basics of it. And I have made a tutorial specifically on it, so check this one out if you are interested. But the basic gist of it is, if you look on the top right, there we have a whole bunch of layers, like terrain, terrain top, entities, and so on. The layer that we care about for now is called terrain, so let me hide everything else. Like so. This is going to be the background for the level, and this is basically a grid. If I go to view and show grid, you can see we are simply dragging from the layers specific graphics into a position. I could, for example, select this mountain and then place it in these positions. That's all that's happening in here. So ultimately what we want to do is import all of these graphics and then display them via Pygame. So inside of Pygame, 
I want to create two more methods. The first one is called import assets. No need for custom parameters. And in there, we are going to import all of the assets. For now, the only one that we really care about is going to be self.tmx underscore maps. And this is going to be a dictionary with key value pairs, where we have a world and then an associated tmx map. Now to import this tmx map, we need a specific Python module, or rather one specific part of a custom module. We want from pytmx.util underscore pygame import load underscore pygame. PyTMX is a module that is really good to import TMX files into Pygame. And the specific method that we are looking for is called load Pygame. Now, if you run the code, you should not be getting an error message from this line. If you do, you have to install PyTMX, which you do inside of the PowerShell. You want to type pip install PyTMX, and that's all you have to do. With that, we can import PyTMX maps. And we're using this with load pygame and then a file path. In our case, we want to go up a folder, then we want to go to data. In there, we have the maps, and in there, we have world.tmx. So if you look at the project folder, we are starting inside of the code folder in main.py. Then we want to go up to project, to data, maps, and then world.tmx. That is the relative path we have just created. That being said, approaching file paths like this isn't ideal because some operating systems use a forward slash, others use a backward slash. And if you have a hard coded relative path, this might cause some problems. To fix that, we can use another Python module from os.path import join. And all that join does is it creates custom paths. The way you use it is instead of one hard-coded path, you simply specify the folders or the nodes you want to go through. You want to go up a folder, then we want to go to data, then we want to go to maps, and finally, we want to go to world.tmx. And that is all we need. Those two things for Windows are basically going to be identical. But depending on the operating system, you might get a different kind of slash. Now we don't need the original path anymore, and we can print self.tmx maps. On top of that, inside of the done init method, I want to run self.import assets. If I now run the entire code, after a second, we are getting a dictionary with a tile map. So that is looking really good. That means we don't need a print statement anymore. And next up, we can create a setup method, which is going to need two custom parameters. The first one is the TMX map that we want to use. The second one will be the player start position. Later on, this setup method is going to load different kinds of levels, depending on what TMX map we are putting into it. But for now, we only have a single one, so this one isn't too complicated. All that we want to do for now is loop through one of the layers of our TMX map. And if I open tiled, you can see that the one layer we care about for now is called terrain. This is the one that we want to import. We're getting that with TMX map and then get underscore layer underscore by underscore name. The layer name for this one is terrain. And it's essentially going to be a list with all of the positions and the images that we have laid out inside of tiled. Although to access all of that, we need dot tiles afterwards. With that, we can put this data inside of a for loop for X, Y, and the surface in this particular layer. That way we can print X, Y, and the surface and we would get access to the position, so x and y, and the surface. And that is all we need in the setup method for now. So next up, we can call self.setup with two arguments. The first one is the tmx map, which we get with self.tmx maps, and this one has the key world, the one we have just created. The player start position doesn't matter too much, but later on, this is going to be house. If I now run the code, 
We can't see anything, but we are getting positions and then a surface. And quite a few of those. The way to read this information is the surface is simply the graphic that we have placed. And then the numbers next to it are going to be the column and the row. Keep in mind for this one, we are at the moment working inside of a grid. We do not have pixel positions. Or in other words, if we are inside of tiled, I can zoom out. And if we go all the way to the top left, this tile here would be tile zero and zero. The one to the right of it would be tile one and zero. Or in other words, X would be one and Y would be zero. That would be the position inside of the grid, but it's not a pixel position. Since our tile size is 64 pixels, this tile would start 64 pixels to the right of the origin point. That's an important thing to keep in mind and something that we want to use right away. So instead of using X and Y, we want to multiply both of these values with the tile size that we are getting from the settings. And there we have tile size. I want to multiply X and Y with the tile underscore size. And then we should have the correct position. If I run this again, you can see that we get much, much larger numbers. And that does look quite a bit more accurate. So ultimately, our map is going to be 4,500 by 4,900 pixels. So with that, we know what graphic we want to display and where to display it. But we don't actually show it. And for that, I want to create a sprite, which I'm going to do in a new Python file. Let's save this one as sprites.py. And first of all, in there, we want from settings, import, everything. And then I want to create a class called sprite, which has to inherit from pygame.sprite.sprite. And be careful in this one about the spelling. The second sprite should have an uppercase S. Inside of the sprite, we want to call a dunder init method and then define a couple of basic parameters. We, for now, want to define a position, a surface, and the groups. After that, we want to call super dunder init to initialize the parent class and then pass the groups in there as an argument. In case you don't know how sprites work, you should really check out the basics of Pygame. But basically, a sprite is a simple class that contains a position rectangle and a graphic that we are placing inside of a group, and then via the group, we are updating and drawing the sprite. To make all of that work, we have to define self.image and self.rectangle. The image is simply going to be the surface that we are getting from the parameters, meaning we are simply passing this thing right through and saving it as a parameter. For the rectangle, we want to get self.image and then get underscore f rectangle, where we are defining the top left and setting this to the position that we are getting from the parameters once again. And I should mention get f rect is short for get floating point rectangle, which is something unique to Pygame CE. If you're using the traditional Pygame, this would get you an error. Hence, make sure to update. The reason why you want to use a floating point rectangle is because in the traditional rectangle, you are storing all of the points via integers. For example, the top left could be a position of one and two. Two very simple numbers, and importantly, those are both integers, which are a good start, but very often you want to be a bit more precise. And for that, you want to have floating point rectangles which work exactly like the old rectangles, except now you can store floating point values for the position. So the top left could be, for example, 1.5 and 2.13. Significantly more precise. And that's basically the entire difference, but this precision can be incredibly useful. So I would generally recommend to use floating point rectangles. But anyway, with that, we have a basic sprite. Inside of main.py, first of all, we want from sprites import the basic sprite. After that, inside of the dunder init method, let's do it all the way at the top. We want to create a whole bunch of groups. Or oh, well, for now, we only want to create a single group, self.all underscore sprites, which is going to be pygame.sprite.group. 
this group or sprites is going to contain, well, all of the sprites, or at least all of the visible sprites. And then via this group, we're going to display and update all of these sprites. So after we have that, inside of the setup method, when we are looping through all of the terrain tiles, I want to create a sprite, and then we want to get a position, a surface, and the groups. Let me paste it in. Position is going to be a tuple that we have just created with x multiplied by tile size and y multiplied by tile size. The surface is the surface we are simply going to get from the for loop, i.e. we are taking this surface and we are passing it into the class. Finally, for the groups, we only have a single group, self, dot, or sprites. And with that, we have a basic sprite. If I now run the code, we are not getting an error message, that's a good sign, but we still can't see anything. The reason for that is that we have to draw this all sprites, which is going to happen inside of the run method before we are updating the screen. We want to run self dot all sprites dot draw. And the argument we have to pass in there is the surface we want to draw on. In our case, we want to draw on self dot display surface. If I now run the code, we can see the top left of the map. So if you look at tiled, we are currently drawing this top left part, more or less. And I realized there's one graphical issue, this part here, that isn't looking correct, that we can fix right away. So I want to select this one tile and then place it in there. And that looks much better. If I now save the tile map, go back to my code editor and run all of this. Now we have fixed this corner, much better. That covers the basic imports, but that's still not really useful. Simply because we want to display more than this top left corner, we have a huge map that we want to display. To make all of this visible, we have to create a basic player along with a camera. To create a player, I want to create a new Python file and save this as entities.py. Besides the player later on, we are also going to store all of the other characters in there. But that is going to come later. For now, I first of all want from settings, import everything, and then create a class called player. Like the sprite, this one has to inherit from pygame.sprite.sprite. And then we will need a dunder init method with self, a position, and the groups for now. After that, we will need super dunder init along with the groups. After that, we will need self.image and self.rectangle. The image isn't too important for now. Later on, we are going to have proper graphics. For now, I simply want to create pygame.surface with a size of, let's say, 100 by 100. Also, this self.image, I want to fill with a color so it looks a little bit better, let's say red. For the rectangle, I want to get self.image and get underscore f rectangle, where I am setting the center to the position that we're getting from the parameters. With that, we have a basic player that is very similar compared to the sprite we have just created, which means inside of main.py, I can from entities import layer. And then we can use that class inside of the setup method. Although for that, we need another for loop because the player is not inside of the terrain layer. If you look at all of the layers inside of tiled, we have one object layer called entities. And you know it's an object layer because of these purple dots next to it. If you enable that one, you can see two things. Or well, you can see all of these markers. Those can do two things. If you look on the left side, a name could either be player or a name could be a character. A character would either be a trainer or a hospital nurse. For now, we don't really care about either. We only care about the player nodes. And if I display all of the objects, they're going to make a bit more sense. So for example, this node here for the player would be the start position if we just came from the plant arena. And if we go, for example, to this point, it is hospital two, and the marker right in front of it would be the start position if the player just came from this hospital too, and so on. Basically, we have a whole bunch of start positions for the player. And the one that we want to start with is this one, which at the moment is not in the right position. 
it should be in front of this house. Inside of your project, it should have been in the right position. I was simply testing things. This should be the starting position for the player, where we have a position, so house and the direction. That way we can identify this particular marker. Now, inside of the code, first of all, we have to loop through this particular layer from tiled. And since we have an object layer, we have to approach this just a little bit differently compared to this tiled layer. Instead, we want for obj in tmxmap.get layer by name, and the name we want to look at is called is entities. No need for dot tiles afterwards, and now we could print obj. If I run the code, we are getting a printout of all of the objects on this layer. We have a name, either player or a character. At the moment, we only care about the player once, which means we want to run some code if obj.name is equal to player. If that is the case for now, let's say I want to print the object node. So if I run all of this, we are only getting all of the player start positions. That's a good start. Now from this object, we can get quite a bit of information. For example, we can get X and Y for the position, or we can get the properties that we have defined. If you look at tiled, the custom properties I'm talking about are in this case, the direction and the position. Direction for now doesn't really matter. The one that we care about is the position. And this one would define where the player came from. In this case, the starting position would be the house or this house to be a bit more specific. If you go to another start position, this one, it would be planned for this planned arena. Now back in the code, when we are calling the setup method, early on, I have passed in the house for the starting position. And we basically want to look at all of the objects and then find the object that has the custom property house for the position. To get that one, we want to get the properties and then look for the position. If I run the code like that, we can see we have all of the starting positions and the one we care about is the house, which means to single out this one object, we want to expand this if statement. If obj name is player and obj dot properties with the position is equal to the player start position. If that is the case, we want to get obj.x and obj.y. I can now run the code and we should only be getting one position. That looks really good, perfect. That also means now that we have a position, we can start working on the player because this one needs a position and groups, both of which we have. Meaning I want to create a player, obj.x and obj.y will be the position and then for the groups, I want to have self.all sprites. And if I fix my typo, this should also work. If I now run the code, we are not getting an error message, but we also cannot see the player. Simply because at the moment, we are only displaying the top left of the map. And to see the player, we have to create a camera. That being said, inside of Tiled, if you move this player start position all the way to the top left, like this, save the tile map, return to Pygame, and then run this again, we can see the player. So this one does indeed work, which means we have everything we need to get started with the camera. Although before that, there's one more thing that I would like to do. The player should be able to move around. Without that, the camera is going to look a little bit weird. Now moving around is going to involve two parts. Number one, we have to capture input. Let me add a pass in there for now. And the second part is going to be the actual move method, which will need self and delta time. I'll explain that one in just a second. Although for now, I will simply add pass in there. To get started with input, we first of all want to get all of the keys being pressed which we get with pygame.key.get underscore pressed. That we can use, for example, via keys and pygame.k underscore up, which is a constant inside of pygame that tells us that we are pressing the up arrow key. 
If that is the case, I want to, for example, print up. And that logic should be sound, but we have to call the input method for it to work in the first place. And that we do via an update method, which for now is only going to accept self as a parameter. In there, we want to call self.input. Now to call this update method, we have to look at the all sprites group, because this one can draw all of the sprites and it can call the update method, which is quite easily done. Before we are drawing all of the game logic, we want to get self.allSprites and then call the update method. All that update is doing is it looks at all of the sprites inside of all sprites or whatever group you have and then call the update method. In our case, this will only apply to the player because the sprites do not have an update method. But other than that, if I now run the code, we are getting an error that inside of Pygame, I have a typo. This should be Pygame. If I now run all of this and I press the up arrow key, we can see up, so that is looking really good. We can now capture keyboard input. We just have to use it inside of the game. And the way I usually approach that is by first of all creating another vector that I call input vector, which is simply going to be a vector without any values. The default value for a vector is zero and zero for X and Y, meaning if you simply create a vector like this, you're getting zero and a zero. This vector I want to update. For example, if we press the up arrow, then I want to get the input vector, update y, and subtract one from it. All of this I want to copy, because next up, we want to check the down arrow. If that is the case, we want to increase y by one. I can do this once more. Next up, we want to look at left. And if that is the case, we want to get the x part of the vector and reduce it by one. Finally, we want to walk to the right, which means we want to increase x by one. The end result, if I print the input vector and run main.py, you can see if I press different arrows on my keyboard, we are getting the various directions. So that's looking really good. One thing that I do want to mention before we continue, this input vector is quite important because it gives us a blank vector with values of zero and zero. That way, whatever we're doing here simply gives us the keyboard input and nothing else. If the input vector already had any other value, this would cause some problems. Hence, I want to keep this inside of the input method and not have anything else influence it. But that causes another issue because we're getting the input in there, but we want to use it inside of the move method to actually move the player i.e. we have to connect these two. And this I do via another attribute of the class that I'm gonna call self.direction, which by default is going to be another vector. Now, after we're doing all of the input, I am updating self.direction and set it to the input vector. That way we can use direction inside of the move method. And I think for now, we don't actually need delta time. So let me get rid of it. To move the entire sprite, all we really need to do, at least for now, is self.rect.center plus equal self.direction multiplied with some kind of speed. For now, let's go with 250. And that is it. If I now run self.move after the input, run main.py again, I can move around. But you can see that the player is moving way too fast. If I run this again, and simply tap right once, we are going way too far to the right. I suppose if I reduce the speed to something like five, and that is looking significantly better. At least now we can see the player movement. This is still not ideal, simply because this update is not frame rate independent. That means inside of the game, we have some kind of frame rate that we can actually measure via a self.clock, which we get with pygame.time.clock. That clock inside of the game loop, we have to call self.clock.tick. This simply tracks the frame rate. And once we have that, we can measure the frame rate and print it out self.clock.get underscore FPS. And don't forget to call this one. If I now run all of this, 
you can see that our frame rate is around 250 frames, a little bit more than that. Meaning we are running this while loop 270 times per second and then apply this update to the player position by the same amount. So 270 times per second, we are changing the center of the player, which is fine on its own. However, it does not work when the frame rate changes, which we can emulate by adding an integer into the tick method. If you leave it empty, the game tries to run as fast as possible. But if you add a 60 in there, then our frame rate is going to be 60. And now our player is going to move significantly slower which is not ideal. Our movement problem at the moment is that the game tries to run as fast as possible and then update the player position. Since we are doing this by default very often, the player is going to move really fast. However, some levels, especially the smaller ones like the hospital, are going to run even faster because we don't have to render as many elements. Not to mention that the game is going to run on a variety of computers, some more powerful than others. And because of all of that, the frame rate of the game is not really going to be predictable. On some computers, it might run at 30 frames per second. On other computers, we might get a thousand frames. And we want to account for all of that. And that we are going to do via Delta Time, or DT in short. Now, I am not going to cover Delta Time in detail in this tutorial. That being said, I have made an entire video on Delta Time. So check this one out if you want to learn about all the details. Essentially. We want to run our game as fast as possible. No arguments inside of the tick method. And then capture the return value of the tick method and store it inside of dt. This dt is now going to give us the time difference between the current frame and the last frame. Or in other words, how long it took in seconds to render the current frame. And this we want to have in milliseconds. At the moment, we have all of this in seconds, so we want to divide it by a thousand, since there are 1000 milliseconds in a second. And just to print out what we are getting, I want to print delta time, run this entire thing again. And now if I run around for a bit, you can see on the last frame, we had a frame rate of 270 and a delta time of 0.003, which means that it took my computer about 0.003 seconds to render the current frame, which by itself isn't particularly useful, but we can use that information inside of the update method. So I want to pass it in there. Although for that to work, inside of the update method in the player, we have to create another parameter, delta time, which we then want to pass into the move method. So now we can recreate the delta time parameter. Basically, all we have to do to use delta time is to multiply it with the update of the movement. And now I can use a speed of 250 again, because if I run main of pi, even though our speed is 250, we are moving at a reasonable speed, which is going to be the same speed regardless of the frame rate. If I set, for example, the frame rate to 10, really low, we are still moving at the same speed. Now the game is going to look really choppy because the frame rate is terrible, but the actual movement is the same. Cool, so with that, we have some very basic player movement. That's all we need for this part. Which means next up, we can work on an actual camera because at the moment, the player can simply move outside of the window and then it disappears. So we want to create a camera to follow the player. And the way that works in Pygame is by creating a custom group. For that, I'm going to create a new Python file that I want to save as groups.py. And there, first of all, we will need from settings and I want to import everything. Then we can create a class called all sprites, which needs to inherit from pygame.sprite.group. After that, we will need a dunder init method with self and nothing else. For now, the only thing that we will need in there is super dunder init to initialize the parent class. And with that, we have basically created a copy of the inbuilt sprite group which means inside of main.py, I can from groups import all sprites. And then instead of assigning pygame.sprite.group to all sprites, I can simply assign it all sprites. If I now run all of this, we cannot see a difference. The game runs just as before. That being said, we are now able to customize the drawing logic. Basically what we want to do we want to create a custom draw method, 
which by default will need self and a surface to draw on. So this draw method is what we are already using down here. So if I don't do anything in there and simply add pass, I can run main.py again. And now we can't see anything anymore, simply because this draw method doesn't do anything. To recreate the default behavior, we will need a for loop for sprite in self. This one would give us all of the sprites inside of this group. Self is going to return all of the sprites that are contained inside of it. Now, by default, all that Pygame really does in there is it takes a surface and then runs the blit method with sprite.image and sprite.rect. I can now run all of this again and we get the default behavior. That looks good. Except now we can customize this quite a bit more. For example, in our case, we always want to draw on the display surface, meaning we don't really want to pass a surface in there. Instead, in the dunder init method, I want to get self.display underscore surface, which I'm going to get with pygame.display.get underscore surface. Only on this surface do I want to blit all of the sprites. Because of that, I don't need the surface parameter anymore. I want to get rid of it in there and then inside of main.py as well. If I now run the code, everything still works just as before. That's the first step. The next one that we need is to offset all of these graphics. By default, we are placing the sprite image always in the position of the rectangle, but that we don't have to do. For example, we could define self.offset, which would just be a vector. And let me add in a default value, let's say 100 by 20. That value I can use to offset all of the sprites, which I'm doing by getting the top left of the rectangle and then adding self.offset. I can now run main.py again. You can see that we are drawing everything 100 pixels further to the right and 20 pixels further down, which means all that we really have to do is somehow connect this offset to the player position so that we are always centering the player. For that, first of all, we need to get access to the player itself, which I want to do via a parameter. Let's call it player underscore center. That we can get inside of main.py, although for that, we will have to store the player inside of an attribute. Self.player is going to be the player. That way, inside of the draw method, I can get self.player.rect.center. After that, inside of groups, I can update self.offset. Let's say for now, self.offset.x is going to be player center and zero. Remember, this player center is a tuple with x and y, which means to get the offset.y, we want to get player center one. Also, by default, the offset shouldn't have any values. If I now run main.py again and I move the player around, we are getting something. This isn't working perfectly yet, but well, we are making progress. The way you want to approach all of this, if this is the entirety of the window, our offset position by default is going to be in the top left or zero and zero. We want the player to always be in the center of the window, which means this offset point should have a distance to the center of half the window width, like this, and then half the window height on the vertical axis, like this. Which means on the X part, I want to subtract window underscore width divided by two, and then on the vertical axis, I want to get window height. And now if I run this again, we are getting something well, that is working a little bit better. The only thing that's left to do is to get the negative value for both of these. Let me put it inside of parentheses and then add negative. Now all of this is going to work just fine. So that is looking much better. I can move around freely, the camera is working. Now, the reason why we have to get the negative values is imagine once again, we have the window, we have the player in the center, and then we have a whole bunch of tiles around it. Let me just draw them in something like this. And there are some elements outside of the window. 
All that the camera is really going to do, if the player is moving down, we are moving all of the elements up by the same amount. Or in other words, we always want to move the camera in the opposite direction compared to the movement. That way, we keep the player in the center of the window. And well, that is all we need to get started with the camera. Which means back inside of Tiled, I can move the starting position of the player back to the original point here-ish. And now inside of Pi, we are starting in a really nice spot. So that is working much better. Although you can see, if we go outside of the map, everything still falls apart. That is because we are not filling the background. What is happening here is that Pygame doesn't discard a previous frame. It simply draws on top of it. Because of that, we're getting all of the fragments if we're not filling the background. That is an issue we can fix quite easily. Before we are drawing all of the sprites using the draw method, I want to get self.displaySurface and then fill it with a black color. I can now run this again. And now we don't see the fragments anymore, which is feeling much better. Now, later on, we're going to fill this area with a coastline and with water, and the player is never going to see the black background, simply because we're going to have collisions, for example, here with the rocks, and the player will then not be able to see any of the black areas. But that's a problem for later. And I think this part has gone on long enough, so let's do an exercise, and then we are finished with this part. What I want you guys to do is, number one, place all of the objects from Tiled and make them visible inside of Pygame. In other words, if you look at Tiled, we have an object layer called Objects, which contains all of the houses, trees, rocks, and so on. This one is quite extensive. I want you guys to display all of these elements inside of the game. After that, import the Hospital TMX map, and also display all of the tiles on the terrain top layer. Inside of Tiled, you want to open hospital.tmx. This one contains a level very similar compared to the overworld. I want you guys to launch this level inside of the game. And also, we have Terrain Top, which contains the counter top thingy. This I also want you guys to display inside of the game. This is going to take you a little bit of time, so try to go through it slowly. And if you can't do it, don't worry too much about it. I will go through it in just a second. Pause the video now and try to figure this one out on your own. To get started, I want to work inside of the setup method and add a few comments to make this thing a bit more readable. We have the terrain tiles and then we have the entities. Besides that, I also want to have the objects, which we're getting via another for loop. I want to have for obj in tmxmap.get layer by name. The layer name for this one is objects. All we want to do in there is to create a sprite, at least for now, which like before is going to need three arguments, position, surface, and groups. The position we can get from obj.x and obj.y. The surface we get from the object as well, obj.surface. The surface we can get from the object as well, obj.image. And finally, for the groups, we only have a single one, self.allsprites. And that should be it. If I now run the game, we can see all of the objects. Now, this isn't perfect. For example, this tree is on top of the house. And also if you go a bit further down, we have a few more issues. So this isn't working perfectly yet, but it's good enough to get started. Which means we have covered the first part. So next up, I want to work on the hospital. First of all, for that, we have to import it. Inside of import assets, I want to add a second entry to the dictionary. And let me do this over multiple lines. In fact, I can duplicate all of this and add a second key value pair. The key is going to be hospital, and we want to import data maps and hospital.tmx. After we have that, inside of the setup method, I want to load tmx map and hospital. 
Although if I run the code now, we are going to get an error. That game object has no attribute player. That is because inside of the hospital, we don't have a house starting position. To get the actual starting position, you want to look at tiled and then the entities. Let me hide everything else. This marker is going to be the starting position of the player. And that position is called world. Which means for this part, we want to start the player in the world position. If I now run the code, we get the hospital. So that is working pretty well. There's just one more thing that we have to do. We want to display terrain top. This one contains the counter on top of all of the other tiles. So that part is going to be fairly similar compared to the terrain, which means we can literally copy the entire for loop and then change the layer name to terrain top. If I now run all of this, we have a counter that is later going to have collisions. Now that being said, there's one important thing you do want to keep in mind for all of this, and that is the drawing order. At the moment, we are sorting all of the sprites by the time of their creation, which means the terrain tiles were created first. So they are always at the bottom. Then we are creating terrain top, then the objects, and then the entities, meaning the entities are always on top of everything else. However, if I create terrain top before the terrain and run this again, we cannot see terrain top anymore. That is because the terrain is now on top of terrain top, which shouldn't be the case. Now later on, we're going to create a much better system to sort all of the sprites. In fact, if you look at settings, there we have world layers. This one we will later on use to sort all of the sprites, but for now that's a bit more advanced and we don't have to worry about it too much. The one thing you want to keep in mind is that you want to have the terrain tiles first, then terrain top, then objects, and then the entities. If you couldn't see some sprites, that was probably the reason. But all right, with that, we have a basic level setup. There's just one last thing that I want to do to clean this thing up just a bit, because we have two for loops that basically do the same thing. That we can simplify with another for loop. We want for layer in, and then we have terrain and terrain top, which needs to be a string. Instead of this for loop, we want to have the for loop that actually creates the sprite. Except we don't want to have the terrain name, we want to have the layer. That way we shouldn't need the second for loop anymore. And now if I fix my typo, this should be terrain. All of this should also work just as before. And that looks really good. Cool. Perfect. With that, we have covered the basic outline of the level. The next major part are going to be the overworld animations. Specifically, we want to have a coast animation and a water animation. That is going to make everything look significantly nicer. For these animations, we have to go through two steps. The first part is the actual animation itself. And this part is fairly easy. Inside of a sprite, we're going to store multiple surfaces and then cycle through them. For example, we could have four sprites like this, and we are simply going to play one after the other, and that way we are getting an animation. What is actually a bit more difficult is to get all of the data, because for these animations, we have to import a lot of data, and this we cannot do manually. So we want to create a couple of functions to mass import data, and that is going to be the main part of this section. As a matter of fact, we already have a couple of functions ready. But step by step, first of all, let's have a look at the project folder. And there, we want to look at graphics. And for now, we only care about the water animation and the coast animation. I want to start by looking at the tile sets. And in there, we have a folder called water and then a graphic called coast. Those two we want to work with, and they are different styles of graphic. If you look at the water folder, we have four graphics, and if you combine them, you get a water animation. Besides that, for the coast, we want to import all of this and then take it apart. If I make this full screen, the way you want to think about all of this is we have a tile here, a tile here, a tile here, and a tile here. And if you play all of those in sequence, so with zero, one, two, and three, then you would get one coast animation 
for this style of coast. If you then go a bit further to the right, you can import all of the center tiles and get another kind of animation for the same coast type, but for a different section of the coast. So when we are importing this graphic, we have to take it apart and then store it in a way that is more easily usable. That will be the most complicated part of this section. Although ultimately, it's not going to be too hard. Back inside of the code, I want to first of all go back to the overworld, meaning tmxmap.world, and the start position is going to be house. If I now run the code, we are back in the overworld and we can move around. That still looks just fine. With that covered, we have to talk about the imports. And for that, we actually have already a Python file. So in my case, I want to open up support.py. In there, we have five functions that take care of the imports. The first one is the easiest one. This one simply imports a single image. And there are two things it simplifies. Number one, when we are creating the path for the import, we are using the join method, meaning this is going to work across operating systems without a problem. And on top of that, we are also specifying a default format. So when you're using this import image, it's a bit easier to use than pygame.image.load. Not terribly, but it's a bit more convenient. After that, we have import folder, and this one basically goes through a path and then imports all of the images inside of that folder. Now for this function, we are only storing the surfaces, but if you want to retain the name, you would look at import folder dictionary. This one stores the file name and the actual surface. After that, we have import subfolders. This one goes through a folder with lots of subfolders and then imports all of the images inside of each subfolder. And finally, we have import tile map. This one imports a tile map and slices it up depending on how many columns and rows we have. Now these functions, I am not going to explain in too much detail because I have made a separate video on them. So if you want to know all about them, check out that video. But for now, I want to work with import folder because if you look at our tile set folder inside of graphics, there we want to import the water folder. This one simply contains four surfaces and we don't really care about the name. Inside of main.py, I first of all want from support, import, everything. And then in the import assets method, create another dictionary, self.overworld underscore frames. For the key, I want to go with water. And for the value, I want to use import underscore folder, the function I've just talked about, this one, and then we have to specify a path with comma separated values. We want to go upper folder, then we want to go to graphics. In there, we have a folder called tile sets. Finally, we have the water folder. So the folder path we have just specified is upper folder, graphics, tile sets, and water. If I now run the code, we're not getting an error message. That is a really good sign. On top of that, I could print self.overworldframes. And if I then run the code, we are getting a dictionary with one key called water and the associated value is a list with surfaces. These are going to be our water surfaces. So this one is working just fine. Now we have to figure out how to display them. And for that, we will need a new type of sprite, animated sprite, which we'll need to inherit from the sprite we have already created i.e. this sprite will be the parent class of the animated sprite. Which means when we are creating the dunder init method with self, we will need a position, surface, and groups to also satisfy the parameters of the parent class, which we are doing by calling super dunder init. And then pass in the position, surface, and groups. That way we would simply duplicate the sprite Although that's not actually what we want to do. Instead of a single surface for animated sprite, we want to have a list of surfaces that I usually call frames. And then when we are initializing the parent class, so the sprite, I want to get frames and for now use the first item inside of the list. Now that is not going to create an animation, but at least with that setup, we will not get an error message. 
So we can get started with this class right away. Which means, next up, inside of Tiled, we have to figure out where water actually is. And for that, we have another layer called water. If I make this one visible, you can see we have a whole bunch of objects that are going to define where water is. All of those are going to be rectangles in various sizes. The way we are going to use them is we are always going to separate each area. For example, this would be one area that we are going to import, a simple rectangle. This we are then going to separate into three individual parts. This would be one, this would be the second one, and this would be the third one. Via that system, we're getting the proper position for every water animation sprite. Which means, back inside of the code, and I want to move support.py all the way to the right, that just feels a bit cleaner. Next up, inside of main.py, in the setup method, I want to add another section, we can do that one all the way at the bottom, for the water. And there we want for obj in tmx.map and then get layer by name. The layer name is water. And just to see what we are getting, let me print obj.width, obj.height, obj.x, and obj.y. If I now run the code, we are getting a whole bunch of output. So we have a lot of areas for the water. But the way you want to think about it, we always have triple values with an X position, a Y position, a height and a width. These numbers we have to use to create the proper areas. So what we want to do is first of all, a for loop where we are going through all of the X positions, which we're getting for X in, and then a range where we need a start position, an end position, and a step size. Imagine that this is the entirety of the map area. And we, for example, have one water area here. At the moment, we want to splice this thing up into columns and rows, something like this. At the moment, inside of our for loop, we are simply looking at the columns, meaning we want to start here and there, and then jump by these column sizes. That would be our step size, and also the easiest part. That one is simply going to be the tile size. We always want to move in increments of 64 pixels. Also, let me clean this one up a bit so you can see what's going on. Next up, we have to figure out the start and the end position. And those are going to be fairly simple because the start position is this one and the end position is this one, which we can get with obj.x. And this at the moment is a floating point value, which the range function does not like, meaning we have to convert this to an integer right away. But that way we're getting the left side of the object area, or in other words, this line. Next up, we have to figure out the end point which is simply going to be the start point plus the width of the entire area. This one also has to be an integer. We want to get obj.x, which is the left side, plus obj.width. That way, we're getting the right side. Next up, we have to do all of that for the vertical part. So for y in range, int obj.y, that's the start, then integer obj.y, plus obj.height. That would give us the endpoint or the bottom of the rectangle area. And finally, for the step, we want to use the tile size. And now we have an xy position, which we want to use inside of the animated sprite, the one we have just created. Although for that to work all the way at the top, we have to import the animated sprite from sprites. That way we can use it and we have to pass in a position, the frames and the groups. The position is super easy. That one is simply going to be X and Y. The frames are going to be self.overworld frames and water. The one we have just imported, this one. And finally, for groups, we only have a single one, self.all sprites. And now, if I run all of this and move a bit down, we can see the water 
And at the moment, the water is on top of the player because we are creating it after the player. That's going to be an issue we have to deal with later on, but for now, that is looking pretty good. And by the way, this black area between the sand and the water is going to be for the coastline. That's there intentionally. First of all, though, we have to create an animation. For that, I want to create two more attributes. Self dot frame underscore index and self dot frames. We can do all of that on a single line because the frame index is going to be zero and the frames are going to be the frames we are getting from the parameters. These frames here. Self dot frames is simply going to store the frames so we can reuse them. And we are going to pick one frame via the frame index. For example, when we are initializing the parent class, we don't want to have a static integer, we want to have self dot frame index. Which is not going to change anything, this value is still a zero, but if we increase the frame index, we would get a different kind of graphic. That system we can use by creating an animate method, which will need self and delta time. All that we are going to do in there is self dot frame index plus equal some animation speed. Let's for now say four, and this we have to multiply with delta time. That way, all of the animations are going to be at the same speed, regardless of the frame rate. And that we can then use to update self.image, for which we want to get self.frames, and then pick one of the self.frame index values. That, however, is not going to work for two reasons. Number one, self.frame index after this line is going to be a floating point value. Remember, delta time is a really small value, something like 0.004. If you add that to the frame index, which at the moment is zero, you are going to get a value that will not be an integer, which we have to fix right away by turning this into an integer. That's the first issue. After that, we have to account for this number growing without any kind of constraint. But we have a limited number of frames. At the moment for water, we have four animation frames, so the frame index cannot exceed that. And that we can implement via modulus, where we want to get the length of self dot frames. That way, if the frame index exceeds the length of the animation frames, we are starting back from the beginning. And that is all you need for the animation. It's ultimately very simple. All we have to do now is to create an update method with self and delta time and then call animate, or more specifically self.animate with delta time. That should be all we need. If I now run main.py, we have animated water, and that is looking pretty good. Cool. The only thing I want to change is instead of using this for, I want to go to settings and then use the animation speed. Let's paste it in there, and now main.py looks about the same, but now we have more control over it. Or rather, we know a bit more what's happening inside of this method. This feels more readable. That's the first part. Next up, we have to work on the coast tiles. For that, we are still going to use the animated sprite class, but we have to figure out a few more things. The first thing that we have to work on is what frames to use. And for that, let's have a look again at the graphic I talked about earlier. This is what we want to import and then take apart so that we can use it for animations. After that, we need to figure out which of these tiles to play. So do we want this grassland, this inverted grassland, the beach, the snow, or any of these other graphics. On top of that, we also need to know where to place an animation. All of that you can find inside of Tiled. Let's have a look. At the moment, we don't need the water anymore and we also don't care about the objects. Instead, we want to look at the coast layer. Let me make this one visible. And this is going to give us a whole bunch of object areas that all have the same size. That part actually doesn't matter very much. What we really care about is their X and Y position along with their custom properties. There we have the site and the terrain. The terrain should be fairly straightforward. This one could either be sand or it could be something like up here where we have grass inverted. And just to explain inverted, if I maximize this, all of these tiles would be the grass tile sets and all of those tiles would be grass inverted. 
So with that, we know where to place this tile and what kind of graphic we want, which means we can now go through the entire process step by step. And let's start with the imports. That is going to happen inside of support.py. In there, we already have one function that can import a tile map. It's called import tile map. For this one, we have to specify the amount of columns, rows, and then a path. That function we are going to use, but we need a bit more extra functionality, which means I want to create a function called coast importer, for which we are going to specify the amount of columns, the amount of rows, and then once again, a path. That information we are going to use right away to create a frame dictionary, which will be the return value of import tile map. Let me copy it. And then we have to pass through the columns, the rows, and then the path that we also want to unpack right away. And just to make sure you see what's going on, let me print the frame dictionary right away. After we have that, I want to copy coast importer and then inside of import assets, in the overworld frames, we want to create host tiles which is going to store the return value from import folder, for which we will need the columns, the rows, and the path. To look at the graphic once again, this one is going to have 24 columns and 12 rows. It's a bit hard to see, but basically every single one of these individual tile groups, like one of those, is going to be three by three tiles. And we have eight of those in total, and each of those has four iterations, which means we have three times eight on the width and three times four on the height, i.e. 24 by 12, meaning 24 by 12. And the file path is going to be a folder up. Then we want to go to graphics. Then we want to go to tile sets. And the actual file that we want to import is called coast. If I now run all of this, Pygame is going to load for a second, and then we are getting a pretty substantial dictionary. So what happened here? Well, we are getting a dictionary where each of the keys is a tuple that has an X and a Y value, or rather a column and a row value, with the associated key being a surface. What that means, if I open up the graphic again, all the way in the top left, this first tile is going to have the key zero and zero. If we then go one field further to the right, this one, we would have a column of one and a row of zero. That would be the key for this surface. And this we're going to do for every single one of these tiles until we reach the end of the graphic, which is going to result in this entire dictionary. It is actually quite long. That's a good start, but not actually what we want. What we instead want is a list with surfaces, let's say this one, then this one, then this one, and finally this one. Along with an appropriate name that is going to give us the position on the tile set and the kind of tile we are working with. For that, we are going to write a bit more logic inside of Coast Importer. First of all, I want to create a new dictionary which for now is simply going to be an empty dictionary. And then we're going to create a list of terrains. For that value, let me paste it in so you don't have to watch me type. We're going to have a list with all of the types of terrain that we are working with. I.e., if I open the graphic once again, the first tile set would be grass. That is this one. The second one would be grass inverted. That's this one. Then we have sand inverted. That's this one. And we keep on going until we reach the end of the tile set. After that, we will need the sites that we are working with. And for that, we will need a dictionary that gets a bit more extensive. So let me copy this one in as well. It's going to look like this. And this should happen over multiple lines. I guess we can do it like this. That looks good. For this one, we are looking at the various sides of the coastline. For example, in the top left, we have this part, and that is zero and zero. Then we have the top, which is going to be the one right next to it, where we have column one and row zero. 
However, if we take another example, the bottom right one, this one would be the one in the bottom right, where we have the second column and the second row. The way you want to think about the sides is that we are looking at the first eight tiles, or rather the first tile group. And that can be really useful because if we are offsetting all of these numbers, for example, to go three columns further to the right, then we are getting all of these tiles, while still keeping the same top left, the same left side, the same bottom side, and so on. Also in the description of this video, I'm going to add a note with all of these values, so you can copy them right in. Anyway, after we have that, we can work on the actual logic. And essentially what we want to do, we want to look for terrain in the uh, rains. The list we have just created. Although on this one, we also want to note the index we are on, which we get via enumerate. And then we can expand the for loop. We want to have the index and the terrain, which means what we're going to get is index and terrain. Let me print it, run main.py, and we can see we get zero for grass, one for grass inverted, and so on. After we have that, inside of the new dictionary, I want to create a new key, which means I want to get the new dictionary and the new key is going to be the terrain, which itself is going to have a value of a dictionary. And this dictionary, we're going to fill with key value pairs where the key is the site and the values are the associated graphics that we need. For that, we're going to need another for loop for key and position in sites dot items. After we have that, I want to work inside of the dictionary we have just created, which we can now access via this value. And then we want to create a new key value pair, where the key is going to be the key, i.e. top left, top, top right, and so on, with the associated value being a list of frames. Those frames we are going to get from the frame dictionary, the values we imported all the way in the beginning. Now this is a dictionary, meaning if we specify a tuple with a column and a row, we are going to get a value. For example, what we want to do. At the moment, we are inside of this for loop and have some kind of a position. Let's say we have the top left. That would be this top left tile. From this tile, we want to jump down three tiles to get this one, then three more tiles to get this one, then three more to get to this part. These are the four tiles that we actually want to store, which means first of all, we need to figure out the row and that we can do via a for loop. And by the way, we are going to use list comprehension. I already started doing that. We want to use for row in a range. For this one, we always want to start all the way at the top, so zero. Then we want to go to the amount of rows that we have. That's the number we have specified in the parameters. For the step size, we want to go with three. That would almost give us the row. The one thing we have to add is we want to get position one, the position we are getting from the for loop, and then add the row to it. This position one is really important because in the top left, we get a default value of zero. So there it's not going to do anything. But if we are going to go a bit further down, for example, to bottom right, there the start row is going to be two. This we have to account for. And after that, we have to work with the column for which we once again will need a start position, which is going to be position zero. We want to add the index and multiply it with three. The index is what we're getting from the enumerate of the parent for loop. If we are on grass, this would be a zero. If we are on grass inverted, this would be one and so on. That way, if we are on grass inverted, the column wouldn't be zero anymore, it would be three because we are multiplying one with the number three. That is always going to give us the right column. And with that, we are done. All we have to do now is at the end of the function, return the new dictionary. Then we can work inside of the overworld frames and print self.overworld frames and we only care about the coast. If I now run all of this, we are getting an error. And that is a really easy one to fix. I have simply made a typo inside of the dictionary. Let's try this again. And there we go. This is looking much better. Now we still have a massive dictionary, but now the first key is going to be grass. The associated value is another dictionary 
where the first key is top left, and then we have a list of surfaces, and those we can use for the animation. That is a really good start. Now we just have to figure out how to use all of these graphics. That is going to happen inside of setup, specifically after the water. I want to have a section for the coast. And figuring this part out is going to be your exercise. I want you guys to use the coast tiles we have just imported to actually display the graphics. All of that information you can get from the TMX map. Pause the video now and see if you can figure this one out on your own. We are going to need another for loop for obj in tmxmap.get layer by name. The layer we want to work with is called coast. For each of those objects, we want to get a terrain and a side. For that, inside of tiled, you want to look at the properties because there we literally have a side and a terrain. Those values we can access via obj.properties. And for the terrain, we want to get the terrain. And for the site, we want to get the site. Finally, we can create an animated sprite, which is going to need three parameters, position, frames, and groups. Groups is the really easy part. We only have a single one, all sprites. Position is also fairly easy. It's simply going to be a tuple with obj.x and obj.y. The only thing that's a bit more complicated is going to be the frames. For that, we will want to get self.overworldframes. Then we want to have the terrain. And finally, we want to have the right side. And that's basically it. If I now run all of this, we are getting an error. And I hope you can see the problem. At the moment, I am getting all of overworld frames. That would be this dictionary, which at the moment has only two keys, water and coast. But I am trying to get the terrain right away. To fix that, what we have to add is, first of all, we want to get the dictionary coast. And now this should work. And now we have an animated coast line. So that is looking pretty good. Now the coast is on top of the player, which looks a bit weird, but that's an issue for later. I think for now, this is working pretty well. And let's try and check the other coastline. Should come up, there we go. This is looking pretty good. So I am quite happy with that. Perfect. I hope this section wasn't too complicated. Basically, the imports can get a bit confusing, but ultimately, when you're looking at this again, we're not doing anything fundamentally complicated. We are simply writing a nested for loop. So I would really recommend to go over this thing a couple of times to make sure you understand it. Mastering list comprehensions in Python is a really important skill and something you definitely want to practice. For the next part, we are going to start with the characters, meaning we are going to animate the player and we're going to create all of the other characters. They are not going to do anything and we have no collisions, but at the very least, we are making some solid progress. Now for the logic of this part, the player and all of the NPCs share quite a few attributes, meaning we can rely on inheritance, where we have a parent entity class. This one, for example, covers the animations and the setup of the character. This will then be the parent class for the player and for all of the characters. After that, for example, for the player, we are going to capture user input and check collisions, while for the characters, they are going to get some other code, for example, to look around or for the dialogue. Should be a fairly straightforward section, although before we get to any of that, we have to do a few more imports. Because if you look at the project in graphics, there we have the characters and we have to import all of this. Let's get started with that part. For that, I want to work inside of import assets. Besides the water and the coast, I want to have another key value pair, which is going to be for the characters. And essentially, I want to have a function called all character import, where we simply have to specify the parent folder, which is going to be going one folder up. Then we are going to go to graphics. And finally, we want to go to characters. That would get us to the folder I just talked about, this one. Now, this all character import doesn't exist at the moment. So let me copy it and inside of support, I want to minimize 
everything. So we have a bit more space. And then below the import tile map, I want to define all character import where we have to specify a path. For this one, like we have done with the coast tiles, we want to create a new dictionary. Where, for example, we have a character like the player, and then the associated value is going to be another dictionary. For example, one key could be called down underscore idle, and this would be a list with a single surface. So basically, this is going to be our player. And the down idle key is going to get a list with this surface only. So if the player is facing down and not moving, this is the animation we are going to play. Now, since we have an animation with a single frame, we are only going to play this individual frame. So that's not going to do very much. However, another key that we are going to add could be, for example, down, where we want to have a list of frames. Specifically, we want to import the entire first row. If you play all four of those frames in sequence, you get a down walking animation. That's all we have to do. And by default, I do not want to have any value inside of the new dictionary. Instead, first of all, I want to get all of the characters, meaning I want to get all of those images. To get that, we could look at the other functions we have already in there. For example, if you look at import folder, we have a for loop, for folder path, subfolders, and image names in the walk function. This one simply walks through a folder and then gives you all of the content. This is what we want to do as well for this one. As a matter of fact, I can literally copy this line. And just to demonstrate what we are getting, let me print the folder path, the subfolders, and we want to get the image names. If I now run main.py, we are getting some data. The first entry is the folder name. That we don't really care about because we already have that one. Then we get an empty list. And this is what we're getting from the subfolders. Since in the folder we are currently looking at, there are no subfolders, we are getting an empty list returned. That's also not a part we care about, so we can just ignore it. Finally, the only value that we really care about is image names. That would be a list with all of the images inside of the folder. Or to be a bit more specific, this is going to be a list with the name of every single file in that folder. In our case, it just happens to only have image files. Now, this is the only value that we actually care about, meaning I can replace the folder path with an underscore and the subfolders with a double underscore to indicate that I don't care about these values. All I want to look at is the image names. This is a list that I want to cycle through, which we do before image in image names. If I print the result, we only care about the image. We are getting the file name for every single one of these files. This data I want to retain and use it as the key for the new dictionary. Although I do want to get rid of the .png. Let's create a new local variable. I guess we can call it image name, which we're getting with image. And then using the split method, we can separate the string wherever we have a dot and then only pick the first value. That way we are getting rid of anything after the dot. Once we have that, we can get the new dictionary and create a new key, which would be the image name. The value we want to assign to it is going to be another dictionary, where, for example, we have a key with down and then a couple of frames along with it. But this we can't do easily right now. Now, you could use the import tile map function, the one we already have. And we know if you look at the folder or any of these graphics, we have four columns and four rows for every single one of the characters. Meaning we can get four and four along with a file path. That file path we can get from the parameters, the one all the way at the top, along with the image name that we have created here. If I now run main.py, we are not going to get an error. And if I print self dot overworld frames with the characters, I can run this again. And now we are getting none. That is because at the end of this function, we are not returning anything. So 
return view dictionary. And now let's try this again. That looks a bit better. Basically, the first entry is called blonde. And then we have all of the frames that we have gotten from the tile map importer. Then we get the second character, Fireboss, and a similar kind of dictionary. That's a good start, but we have to organize this better. Inside of support.py, I don't want to use import tile map. So let me cut it out. And instead, I want to create another function that I called character importer where we are specifying rows and columns just as before, and then we are assigning a path. Let me create that function right away, actually. Define character importer, where we have the columns, the rows, and a path. Inside of that function, we are still going to use import tile map, although now we are only going to need a path because the actual path we are creating inside of all character import. All we have to change is that instead of a four, we want to have the columns and the rows, and then we should get roughly the same result if we are returning the values from this tile map function. So, so far we haven't really achieved anything, but what we can now do is instead of returning the value right away, I want to for now store it inside of a local variable called frame dictionary. Now this value we want to change quite a bit, so I want to create a new dictionary, which for now is going to be entirely empty. And now to separate the graphics, let's have a look at it. If you look at the first row, you can see that we are just moving down. So on zero, we get all the down animations. Then on the second row or row one, we are going to the left. On the one with index two, we're going to the right. And on index three, we are going up. That information we can use right away inside of a for loop. We want to have for row and direction in enumerate. And then we can add a tuple with the values down, left, right, and up. Just to demonstrate what we are getting, if I print the row and the directions, I can run main.py. And we are getting for every character zero down, one left, two right, and three up. Meaning we are getting the right row along with the state of the character for that row. That information we want to use to create a new key value pair inside of our dictionary, which means new dictionary and the direction is going to be a list of frames where we are looking at our frame dictionary, the one we are getting from import tile map. And for this one, we have to specify a tuple with a column and a row. The row is the easy part because this is what we are getting from the for loop. That part we don't have to worry about. The only thing we have to worry about is the column. And for that part, we can use the list comprehension once again, because I want to go for column in range false. Very much a similar thing compared to what we have done with the coast importer, this stuff down here. With that, we are getting a new value inside of our dictionary. So at the end of the function, I want to return the new dictionary, which we are capturing inside of this other dictionary, which we are then storing inside of the overworld frames in the characters key. Let me print the result. Self dot overworld frames. We want to get the characters. And now if I run all of this, we don't need the output. For the blonde character, we still have a dictionary, but now the first value is going to be down with a list of surfaces. There should be four in total. Those four, and then we get the left movement. There we have four more entries, then we get right, and so on. That is looking really good. But we want to have just a little bit more. This is only going to give us the walking animation. Besides that, I also want the idle animation which is always going to be the first frame of the walking animation for each individual direction. The way we are going to get that, I want to get a new dict entry where we are going to get the direction, but now this part is going to be inside of an F string where we are going to add underscore idle at the end. The value for this one, and this is really important, has to be a list. 
even though we are only going to add a single surface in there, we still need to have this inside of a list. That will simplify the animation logic a lot. But other than that, we want to get the frame dictionary again, for which we have to specify a tuple with the column and the row. The row, once again, we are getting from the for loop, and the column is always going to be zero. And that is it. If I now run main.py, we get the dictionary printed out, and you can already see at the bottom, we're getting right idle that has a list with only a single surface inside. And well, then we have a whole bunch more values. I am pretty sure that this is working well. Cool. So with that, we have done a lot of importing. Let's minimize this. And now we can actually create the characters. That's gonna happen inside of entities.py. In there, all the way at the top, I first of all want to create a class called entity. That is the class I talked about in the beginning, which will become the parent for the player and for all of the other characters. For this one, we want to inherit from pygame.sprite.sprite. .sprite. We also want to create a dunder init method where we are specifying self, then a position, frames, and the groups. Also, we have to initialize the parent class, which we do with super, dunder init, and pass the groups in there. Now this entity class will become the parent of the player, which means the player shouldn't inherit from a sprite, it should inherit from the entity. Meaning we have to update the super dunder init method. Or in other words, we have to get a position, frames, and groups. Let me copy all of those parameters actually. Now position and groups are fairly straightforward. We're getting those for the player right away via the dunder init method. Although frames we do not have at the moment. To fix that, the player is going to need another parameter, frames. Which means inside of main.py, when we are running the setup method and create the player that happens here, we have to add another argument in there. We want to get self.overworldframes. In there, we have the characters, which is going to be a dictionary on its own, which has the key layer. Also, I am running out of space, and later on, we're going to add more values into the player. I want to use multiple lines and then named arguments. We have the position, we have the frames, and finally, we have the groups. That is much more readable. Cool. With that, inside of entities, we get all of the arguments for the player and to initialize the parent entity class. Which means if I run main.py, the code runs just as before. We are not using any of the data, but at the very least, the game doesn't crash. So that's a good start. Next up then, inside of the entity class, we want to organize the animation. Or in other words, I want to set up the graphics. For that, like in the animated sprite, we will need two attributes, a frame underscore index and self dot frames. The frame index will always going to be zero by default, and the frames are simply going to be the frames. After we have that, we can cover the actual sprite setup, for which we are going to need self.image and self.rectangle. The image is going to be self.frames, and from that, we want to pick a single surface. However, that we can't do immediately because these frames are different compared to the frames we are using inside of animated sprite. Inside of that class, frames are simply going to be a list with surfaces. So indexing is very easy. We simply have to specify a value like zero, one, or two, and so on. For the entities, this gets more complicated because this one has a dictionary where we have a state like down, and only then do we get a list with all of the surfaces, which means to get a single surface, we first of all have to get the state of the animation, and then we want to get self.frame underscore index. I suppose to get started, the state could simply be down for now, although later on, this we are going to change. Next up, we have the rectangle. This part is quite simple self.image.getf rectangle. We want to set the center to the position. After we have that, inside of the player, since entity is already covering the image and the rectangle, the player doesn't need that part anymore. 
let's try main.py and now we can see the player. There's no animation yet, but at the very least we have a basic graphic. To animate all of that, we have to create an animate method with self and delta time. For this one, we want to get self.frameIndex and then plus equal the animation underscore speed multiplied with delta time. After that, self.image needs to be updated where we are going to get self.frames. Then don't forget, we will need the state. And then we can pick one surface from the list of surfaces via the frame index, which is going to happen basically in the same way compared to what we have seen inside of the animated sprite class. We want to get an integer with self.frame index and the modulus operator along with the length of self.frames. Although, once again, this is a dictionary. To get the actual frames, we need the state again. Cool, that looks pretty good. Next up, we need an update method with self and delta time, in which we are going to call self.animate with delta time. Let's try all of that. And nothing is happening. The reason for that is that we don't actually have an entity class. We have a player class, and we are only calling the update method on that class, or on the instance of that class. Meaning in there we have to call self.animate with delta time. We do not have to do that inside of the entity class. What happened there is that we have this update method inside of the entity class. But since we also have an update method inside of the player, this update method overrides this update method. We can actually get rid of it entirely, it's not needed. But if I now run main.py, we get a walking animation. We are only walking down, so not amazing, but at the very least, we have something. To actually have a proper animation, we will need another method that I called get underscore state. No need for custom parameters in this one. And in there, we basically want to get the state of the player, i.e. if the player is going down, left, right, if the player is idle or not, things like that. And the way this function is going to work is we're going to have a whole bunch of logic. And by the end of it, we are returning the proper state. For example, this one could be right. And then instead of always having a default value, let me select all of them. So all of the down values should instead be self.get underscore state. With that, if I run the code, now the player is always walking to the right. We could also change this to return right underscore idle then the player is always going to idle in the right direction. That is looking pretty good. Now we just have to figure out the logic to make this get state interactive. This get state needs to know in what direction the entity is moving. And that's actually a really good start. This self.direction should be inside of the entity class, not inside of the player. Let me add another section in there for the movement. There we have self.direction. Also, while we are here, at the moment for the player, we have a generic number for the speed. This should be an attribute that we are going to store inside of the parent class, self.speed, which can be 250. This self.speed we actually want to use for this move method. That just feels a bit cleaner. After that, we have to figure out the logic for the getState method. And the first issue we have to address here is that we only want to update the state if the player is moving, which we can do by creating a local variable moving that is going to be the Boolean value of self.direction. The reason why this is necessary, imagine that our player is moving and we are currently moving to the right and then we are stopping. If that is the case, we do not want to play the animation anymore, but we still want the player to look to the right, which means we want to store the last thing the player has done when he was moving and then use that information when the player is idling, which we can do by only updating the movement direction when the player is moving. So when the player stops moving and we have been moving to the right, then the player is still going to face to the right when we are idling. I hope that makes sense. I suppose to do this a bit more practically, Inside of the graphics, I want to create another attribute, self.facing underscore direction. By default, this one could be down. This is the value we actually want to update. 
for example, inside of get state, we want to return an f string where the first value is always going to be the direction or self dot facing direction to be a bit more precise. But after that, we want to add another value, which is going to be empty if we are moving. That way, we would simply get down, left, right, or up, which is going to be the walking animation. However, if we're not moving, so else, then we want to add underscore idle. That way, if I run main.py, we are currently not moving, so the player is idling. But if I start moving, we are getting the walk animation. Now, this at the moment only works in a single direction, so not great, but we are making progress. What we now want to do is to check if the player is moving. Then we can check if self.direction.x is different from zero. If that is the case, we know we are moving on the horizontal axis, which means self.direction is going to be right if we are moving to the right, i.e. if self.direction.x is greater than zero. If that is not the case, else we know we are moving left. That we can already try. If I now run the game and I move to the right, we are getting an error that the string object has no attribute x. And I think I can see the issue. So the error happened on this line, but the actual problem happens on the next one. Because on this line, we are overwriting self.direction, which is supposed to be a vector, where we get x and y but we are now assigning a string to it, either left or right. This is simply a typo. I meant to update self.facing direction. Now this should be working. If I move to the right or to the left, we get the walking animation for that state. So that's looking pretty good. However, down and up don't work yet. That we can fix quite easily by simply duplicating this if statement and check if self.direction.y is different from zero. It is going to be down if self.direction.y is greater than zero. And if that's not the case, we are going up. And now I can walk around and we are getting the proper animation for each direction. So that is looking pretty good. That means we can minimize both of these methods and then we can start working on the other characters. For that, if you look at tiled, we don't need the coast anymore and we only really care about the entities. So let me hide everything else. Basically, we have in the overworld a whole bunch of markers. Some of these markers are going to be just for the player. You can identify all of those via the name. If the name is player, we don't really care about them for this part. We only care about the markers with the name character. For those, we also get a graphic, like straw, for example. And this graphic is simply the file name. For example, straw would be this character. On top of that, we're getting a direction. And this would be the starting direction of this character. We have all the information we need to create a character. So this is going to be your exercise. Create a new class for all of the characters and then display them via this class inside of the game with the correct start facing direction. The one that you're getting from tiled. Pause the video now and see how far you get. First of all, inside of entities.py, I want to create another class called character, which needs to inherit from the entity class. Then we will need a dunder init method, self, a position, frames, and groups. Later on, we will also add the facing direction in there, but let's keep it focused for now. Next up, we have to initialize the parent class with super dunder init and pass through the position frames and the groups. Now at this point, we don't need to animate the characters, meaning there's no need for an update method, which makes our life a bit easier. Meaning next up, inside of main.py, Inside of the setup method, we want to look at all of the character markers. We are already isolating the player. If we add an else statement, then we can print obj.name and let's see what we get. We are getting mostly characters, but there are some players in there. That is because for this if statement, we have two conditions. 
which is not ideal. Let me take the second condition, cut it out, and then add an inner if statement. We only want to create a player if obj name is player, and we are on this starting position. After that, we can indent self.player one more time. And now if we run this, we are only getting characters. That looks pretty good. So now we can create an actual instance of the character class. Although for that, first of all, all the way at the top from entities, we want to import the character and the character class. Next up, for each character, we are going to need a position, frames, and groups. Now these arguments are going to be fairly similar compared to what we are doing with the player. Hence, we can literally copy all of the named arguments from the player, so I have to write just a little bit less. There we go, now we have a character class with position, frames, and groups. This is actually already going to work. If I run the code, we can see there's one NPC, and if I go a bit further down here, there we have another one, there's one more, and that's a good start, but the graphic isn't right. That is because we are always using the player graphic from the overworld frames. For this one, I want to get obj.properties and then get a graphic. Let's try off this again, and now this is working much better. We are getting a whole range of different characters, so I am quite happy with that. Cool. The last thing that we have to figure out is the start facing direction for each entity. At the moment, this one is always going to be downwards, but that we want to customize via another parameter. Let's call it facing direction. And this value we are assigning to the self.facing direction attribute. That means when we are creating the characters and the player, we have to add one more argument, facing direction, which we are getting when we are creating this class. So for the dunder init method for both of these classes, we will need another parameter, facing direction. Once we have that, we can work inside of main.py. And to both of those class constructors, we want to add facing underscore direction. If we set this one to right, we should always have a right starting direction. So that is working pretty well. Cool. To make this more interactive, let's have a look at tiled. In there, when you look at the markers for the characters, you can see that we have a direction. This one, for example, should face down by default. This one should face left by default and so on. We got a few more. This one, for example, faces up. And then for all of the player starting markers, we also have a direction, which we can use. This one would be down. Then we have one here for down as well. And I think all of the markers in the overworld are down. But if you look at the hospital, for the marker for the player, the direction is going to be right. Although this one should actually be up. Anyway, you get the idea. Back inside of the code, for the player, we are currently working with a marker. That's our object. And on this one, we can get obj.properties along with the direction. The same thing we want to do for all of the characters. It's actually the same property. If I now run this again, the player looks down by default, this character looks to the left, this character looks down, and this character also looks down. And if we go a bit further up, then we should see a character looking up as well. This one here. And that is working pretty good. Cool. So with that, we have a pretty good start to all of the characters. They don't do anything at the moment and we have no collisions, but at the very least, we are making some pretty solid progress. So at this point, we do have a basic level, but there are a couple of things that could be improved. And that is what we are going to work on in this section. Number one, we are going to add all of the grass tiles. Those we are later going to use for monster encounters. But for now, they are simply part of the overworld. Number two is going to be a better drawing order. That way we don't have trees on top of houses or the player below the water anymore. And finally, we're going to add collisions, which is going to make the game feel significantly more realistic. That should be fairly straightforward. Let's get started with the first point, the monster grass patches. For that, we have to first of all look at tiled. Here we are, and at the moment we only have the terrain visible. On top of that, we have a layer called monsters. If you make this one visible, 
we have a whole bunch of grass tiles. Also, if you look at the top left, there we have a few ice grass tiles. Also, what is very easy to miss, if you look at the beach and select this section, there we have a bunch of beach tiles. Those are not going to be visible, but we can use them to control where monster encounters happen when the player is on the beach. Sadly, there's no grass on the beach available. But anyway, if you look at one of these grass tiles, you can see we have a couple of custom properties. The biome, the monster level, and the monsters available. Although for now, this isn't really information that we care about. We simply want to have the graphic. That we can use inside of the code. I want to work in the setup method, and in there we can create below objects, although the actual position is not going to matter in just a bit. I want to add the grass patches. For that, we will need a for loop for obj in tmxmap.getLayerByName. The layer we want to look at is called monster. And I suppose for now, we can simply create a sprite. For which we are going to need, let me copy the parameters, a position, surface, and groups. Position is super easy. We have obj.x and obj.y. For the surface, we want to get obj.image and for the groups, self.allsprites. If I now run main.py, we are getting an error because this layer is called monsters. If I now run the code, you can see that we have the grass patches. So that is looking pretty good. And if you go all the way to the top left, there should also be the ice grass patches. There we go. That is looking pretty good. So we are making progress, but it's still not ideal because there should be some overlaps. And that is going to bring us very nicely to the next part. That would be the drawing order. So for example, if you look at these two trees right next to the player, the drawing order here is a bit messed up because the shadow of this tree is on top of this other tree. The same happens to this tree as well. And if you walk a bit more around, you can see that this is a very common problem. You can see it here as well. You can see it here in particular because the player is below the water. And finally with the houses, it becomes incredibly noticeable. So on there, the tree is on top of the house. And the issue here is that at the moment, we are sorting all of the sprites by the time of their creation, i.e. the stuff that we are doing in the setup method, which is not a reliable solution at all. What is going to be a much better approach is to give each sprite a layer. And then when we display the game, we are going layer by layer. Or in other words, what we are going to do is we are first going to draw the water, then we're going to draw the backgrounds, and then we're going to draw the characters with all of the other objects, like the houses and the trees. Now this system isn't terribly difficult to implement, but there are going to be two complications. Number one is that each character should have a shadow. And this we have to incorporate with the layered approach to drawing. Besides that, there's one object that should always be on top of everything else. And that is the top bit of the pillars. Or in other words, if I run the game again and I go down a bit, this pillar thingy here should always be on top of the player. That way we can walk below it and it looks like there's a bit of three-dimensional depth in the game. So how can we start approaching this kind of problem? And first of all, if you look at settings, there we have a dictionary called world layers. This is going to define the drawing order, i.e. we're going to draw water first, then we are drawing the background, then we are drawing the shadows, then main, and then top. Because of that, since water is drawn first, Everything else will always be drawn on top of it. So what we need to get started is to tell each sprite what layer it is on. And for that, inside of sprites, I want to give every single sprite a Z parameter, which is going to get a default value. We want to get the dictionary world layers, the one I just talked about, this one. And by default, a sprite should be on the main layer. So dictionary, indexing, and main. This value we now have to store as an attribute. Self.z is going to be z. After that, we also have to update the animated sprite. And for that, I can duplicate the parameter and don't forget to pass it through to the parent class. So we want to add z in there as well. With that, we can store the z parameter. 
That means inside of the setup method, we have to actually pass in that information. When we are creating the terrain, we want to have world underscore layers, and those will always be BG. After that, we can work with the water and with the coast. Because for those, we have world layers and water. And then we have for the coast, world layers and BG. And I realized while recording, you could combine the water layer and the BG layer. Since they're both simply going to be in the background, it's not going to make a massive difference. But in practice, this isn't going to make a difference. Although what I do want to do is to copy all of these lines and then move them up just a bit. So we have the terrain, the water and the coast all in one place, like so. You don't have to do that, but it just feels cleaner. Alrighty, next up, we have to cover the objects, the grass patches and the entities. And while we are here, I realized the character objects do not have a Z parameter. This we have to fix right away. And each entity should have a Z parameter. I suppose we can put it all the way at the top. Self.Z. And this one is really easy because an entity should always be on the main layer. World layers. And we want to go with main. No need for a parameter for this one. That way we have finished the entities as well. And the grass patches we don't have to touch. Those will always be on the main layer as well. The one thing that we do have to care about is the objects, because for those we have to be a bit careful. To understand why, let's have a look at tiled, and I want to look at all of the objects. So, in there, we have a whole bunch of trees and houses, and then random objects like the rocks, and those pillars and the top thingy. Now, basically all of the objects should be on the main layer, with one exception, and that is this top part. This one should always be on top of everything else. That way the player can walk below it. And this object we can identify by its name. It is called name top. And this is unique. No other object has any name. Which means inside of this for loop for the objects, we can add an if statement. If obj.name is equal to top. If that is the case, we want to create a sprite that has all of the same arguments that we have used before. So let me copy them and then add world layers with the layer top. However, if that is not the case, else, then I want to create the sprite we have already created. Later on for the collisions, we have to add a bit more logic in here. Hence, I do want to have a proper if statement. Anyway, let's try. And the game is still running as before, but we do not have any update to the drawing method. Because so far, we only added a single attribute. It's not actually used yet. For that, we have to look at the groups, because in here, we are drawing everything. This is the part that we have to refine. And essentially, I want to create three lists of sprites. I want to have the BG sprites, I want to have the main sprites, and I want to have FG sprites. After we have that, inside of the for loop for the actual drawing, we're going to go through all of these lists and then draw them one by one. I.e. we're going to first draw all of the background sprites, then the main sprites, and then the FG sprites. Because of that, the FG sprites will always be on top of everything, and the main sprites will be on top of the background sprites. For the background sprites, I want to use list comprehension with sprite for sprite in self. That way, we are simply going to copy all of the sprites inside of the class. But there's going to be a condition. I only want to get a sprite if sprite.z is smaller than world underscore layers and main. I.e., I want to get all of the background sprites that come before the main layer. We can do the same thing for the main sprites, because in there, we simply want to check if we are on the main layer. And finally, for the FG sprites, we want to check if we are greater than the main layer. That we can now use with another for loop. I want to have for layer in the tuple BG sprites, main sprites, and FG sprites. And the order here is really important. 
BG sprites has to come first, then we have main sprites, and then we have FG sprites. The for loop is going to go through those in order, and this is really important for our purposes. Once we have that, we want to go through every sprite inside of the layer. And for that, we already have this for loop. We simply have to indent it, remove the white space. That should be all we need to get started. If I now fix the extra character here and run main.py, you can see that so far, not much has changed. However, if I go a bit further down, the player should at the very least be below this part. And that is working really well. Also, if I now walk over the water, the player is always going to be on top. So that is working pretty well. We are definitely making progress. And I hope the logic for all of this makes sense. Ultimately, we are simply splitting up all of the sprites into three separate groups and then draw the groups in order. But we are not entirely done yet. If I run the game again, we still have this kind of issue where, for example, the trees are on top of the house, this issue here. That happens because this tree, this tree, and this house are all on the same layer, meaning we still have the same issue that they are being drawn by the time of their creation. It simply happens to be that this house was created first, and then we created those two trees. Which means when we are creating the main sprites layer, we want to sort them in a different way which we can do with the Python sorted method. We just have to figure out a specific key to sort them by. And let me talk about the logic here really quick. Imagine we have two characters, although it could be any two objects. For those, we want to have a criteria to figure out which character should be drawn on top and which one should be drawn in the background. And usually the best approach is to simply use the vertical position we have the vertical center for the player and for the other character. To put some actual numbers on this, let's say the player center.y is 100, and for the other character, it is 120. All we really have to do is to look at the largest number, i.e. the character has a greater y position, so it should be drawn on top of the player. That's literally all we have to do. That way, the further down an object is, the later it is going to be drawn. Inside of Python, the key we want to assign is a lambda function with one parameter that I usually call sprite. Oh, and by the way, what is going to happen in here? The sorted method wants to have a list that we already have. It will then go through every single element of this list and pass that element into this lambda function or whatever function you specify. From that lambda function, it is then expecting some kind of return value, ideally some kind of integer. All of those integers are then stored in a list. And this list will be sorted from the lowest all the way to the highest value. Or in other words, what we want to do, this lambda function is going to get a sprite, whatever sprite we are getting from the list. And the value that we want to get from the sprite is sprite.rect.centerY. Via that system, we are extracting all of the vertical center points and then sorting them from the lowest to the highest value. And well, that's literally all we need for this part. If I now run main.py again, you can see that the trees look significantly better. And if the player walks through the house, at some point the player disappears. And with that, we have a much better looking game. This feels drastically better. Also, you can see with the grass patches, they are starting to come together, but we do have to refine things just a bit, because something like this shouldn't happen in the game. Now to fix that, we want to work inside of the sprite class. In there, I will add another parameter, self underscore, let's call it y sort. For now, this can simply be self dot rect dot center y. That way, when we are sorting all of these sprites, we don't need sprite.rect.centerY. Instead, we can simply get sprite.y underscore sort. Although once again, I forgot that we have to do the same thing for the entities. I.e. below self.z, I also want to have self.y underscore sort, which is going to be self.rect.centerY. If I now run main.py, we are getting an error. 
That happens because when we are running this y sort, the rec does not exist yet. We only create this one down there. So I guess we have to move y sort all the way to the bottom. With that, I can run all of this again. And now we are getting something weird. The player is always on top of these sprites, but he will always be below all of the others. So what happened here? Y sort is not being updated. Hence, when the player is moving around, Y sort is always going to remain the same. That way the player sorting doesn't really work. But for that, for the player, when we are updating everything, first of all, we can update self.y sort. If I now run all of this again, the player should integrate much better. And that is looking good. Also, if we are now walking over the grass, this is working perfectly fine again. Alrighty, so with that, we haven't really achieved very much. The game still looks the same. But what we are able to do now is to customize this Y sort. Or in other words, we have a bit more control over what kind of sorting behavior we have. For example, if you reduce the center Y for the sprite by 40 and run main.py again, now this grass is going to overlap with the player much, much faster, which is going to look a lot better. Now for the other objects, this is going to look a little bit weird, but we are making some progress. Basically what we are going to do, I want to have one kind of drawing logic for the grass and then another drawing logic for everything else. And by drawing logic, I simply mean that we have a different offset for the Y sort. And for that, I have actually created a whole nother class. Although for now, this isn't going to be the most useful part. I want to have a monster patch sprite, which has the sprite as the parent which means in there we will need position, surface, groups, and Z. And we don't need Z in the dunder init method of the class itself. With that, we can pass position, surface, and groups right through. And Z, at least for now, is going to be world layers and main. And only in there do we want to update self.y sort. And we simply want to reduce it by 40 pixels. We don't need to do that in the original anymore. And now, inside of main.py, when we are creating the grass, I don't want to create a sprite. I want to create a monster patch sprite. Although this we have to first of all import all the way at the top. I want to import sprite, animated sprite, and monster patch sprite. Let's try this one now. And the grass is still looking much better. But if I look at the other objects, there the player disappears once we are behind the object. And once we have collisions, that is also going to look much better. Cool, so with that, we have quite a nice overlapping behavior. There's just one issue we do have to work on, and that is here. We have the sand monster sprites overlapping with the player, and this shouldn't happen. Those tiles should always be behind the player. That is an easy part to fix. Inside of sprites.py, when we are setting the Z layer for the monster patch sprite, it should only be main if we are on grass or ice grass. If we are in the sand, it should always be in the background. Now for that, we have to know what kind of monster patch we have. Or in other words, inside of tiled, if we are looking at the monster layer again, we want to look at the biome, because in there we have either forest, we have sand, or if you look all the way in the top left, we have ice. Which means if we are on the sand layer, we want to change the layer for the drawing. Now for that, we will need to know the biome. That will happen inside of main.py when we are creating all of the grass patches. In there, I want to get obj.properties and then the biome property. With that, inside of sprites, after groups, I want to have a biome. And for now, let's simply print what we get. So if I run main.py again, we are getting sand, ice, and forest. And that is looking pretty good. That information we want to store right away. So self.biome is going to be biome. 
That will become important later on, although for now, I simply want to update the world layers. This one should be main if biome is different from sand. And if that is not the case, then we want to have the BG layer. Let's run main.py again. The game doesn't crash. The overlapping still works, but now there should not be any visible sand patches here anymore. And there aren't. So this is working perfectly well. Cool. So with that, we have the drawing logic that is going to work much better. And ultimately, the only really important part is inside of the groups. Because in there, we are separating the sprites via the world layer, and then we are drawing the layers one by one. That part alone will make the game feel significantly nicer. That nearly finishes this part. There's just one more thing that I would like to add, and that is a shadow below all of the characters. Something like this, a shadow below all of them. Now this shadow needs to follow all of the characters. In fact, it needs to be in the same place. And also it needs to respect the drawing order. Or in other words, it has to be on top of all of the BG sprites, but below the main sprites. Because in there, we have all of the characters. But let's go through it step by step. First of all, we will need an import. And since the graphic is fairly simple, we can do it right away. And by the way, what we want to import is inside of graphics. There we have, I believe it's in other. We have a shadow. That is what we want to import. Let's save it as the attribute self.shadow underscore surface. And this we are going to import via support and import image. Which means from support, I want to import, import image. Then we are going to need a file path. I want to go up a folder, graphics. Then I want to go to other. And finally, we have shadow. Let's try to run main.py and the game is not crashing. So the import is working. Cool. Next up, when we are drawing the entirety of the game, we want to draw a shadow before we are drawing any of the entities, i.e. before we are drawing a player or a character. The easiest way I think to approach this problem is inside of this for loop to check if we have an entity and if that is the case, before we are drawing the actual sprite, we are going to draw a shadow. For that, we have to do one more import. I want from entity import entity. Or in other words, I want to import this class. That allows me, before we are blitting the image, to check if is instance the sprite and the entity class. If that is the case, then we know the sprite that we are currently getting from the for loop is an entity, which means it would be this entity, it could be a character, or it could be a player. Since character and player inherit from entity, they would also fall into this is instance. And if that is the case, I want to get self.display surface and then blit self.shadow surface. After that, we are just going to need the position. Let's go with sprite.rect.top left plus self.offset. Basically the same thing we have done right below. If I now run main.py, we are getting an error because inside of groups, this shouldn't be entity, this should be entities. Let's try it again. And there we go. Now we have a shadow below all of the entities. Let's have a look at another one. There we go. So this is working, but the shadow is in the wrong position. Now to fix the shadow, we could do a couple of things. We could create a rectangle around the shadow surface and then place the center. Or to keep things a bit more simple, we could add another vector two with a certain position. I found that the numbers 40 and 110 work really well. If I now run main.py again, the shadow is right below where it's supposed to be. And that is working pretty well. And now the game just feels a lot better. And all of the other characters are also looking really good. Perfect. So with that, we have finally covered the entirety of the drawing order, which means now we can work on the collisions. And before we start working on the actual logic, we need to do a bit of groundwork. Number one, 
The player can collide with other characters, the objects, i.e. houses and trees and rocks, and with collision rectangles. Those we are getting from Tiled. Now the last part I do have to explain, and let's do that in Tiled right away. Here we are inside of Tiled, and at the moment we have the object layer and the entities layer. Those are what really matters at the moment. And when it comes to collision, I think there are some fairly easy parts. For example, we want to have a collision with the tree, we want to have a collision with the house, or generally any kind of object we want to have a collision with. On top of that, if there is a character like the one here, we want to have another collision with that one as well. All of those are going to be fairly simple because they have a simple area that we can work with. However, what is going to be a bit more complicated are these cliffy areas, all of this stuff here. Because those don't really have a regular shape. We could have one area here, then we have another one here, we have a weird one here. All of those are kind of annoying to work with. As a consequence, to make our life a bit easier, I created another layer that is called Collisions. And this one is full of, let me isolate it, it is full of very small areas. All of those are also going to be collidable. And if you combine it with the terrain, you can see that those collisions are basically there for all of the walls and the cliffs and things like that. Could also be a safety area like this one, so the player cannot exit the window. Those are the three kinds of objects that the player can collide with. On top of that, I want to have a custom collision size. So at the moment, this is our player, and the rectangle around the player looks like this. It is quite large since we imported the player via a tile set, which I should probably explain. Here we have the graphics folder again, and in there we have the characters with the player. Although this applies to all of the characters. We are importing all of this, and then we are cutting out one part for the player. This would be the rectangle of the player, which, as you can see, is quite large. Which, for collisions, is going to look really weird. So what would be much better is a smaller rectangle for the hitbox that doesn't even cover the entirety of the player. That way, since we have an overlap, these parts and these parts are going to give additional depth to the game, which looks really good. You're going to see in a second what that means in detail. But first of all, we have to get all of our areas, i.e. we have to get the player hitbox and the character hitboxes in general, and then all of the collidable areas. And I suppose we could start with the entities. For all of those, I want to create another attribute, self.hitbox, which is going to get self.rect.inflate. And in case you don't know, all that the inflate method does is it takes a rectangle and then expands it or shrinks it. And all of that happens around a center point. For example, in my case, I want to get negative self.rect.width divided by 2. This would be the horizontal size change. And for the vertical one, I want to go with negative 60. What is happening here is we are taking the original rectangle, which would look something like this. And then via the inflate method, we are looking at the center point, and then we are creating a new rectangle from these numbers. For example, self.rect.width, and this is negative, really important, so we are shrinking the new rectangle. In this case, we are getting half of the width of the original rectangle. So the new rectangle would have a width of something like this. And then on the vertical axis, we have negative 60, so we are removing 30 pixels at the bottom and 30 pixels at the top. At the end, we have a rectangle that looks something like this. And this rectangle is what we actually want to use for the collisions. For that, since the characters are not moving, we can ignore them for now. But for the player, we have to make sure that when we are moving the player, we are also updating the hitbox. Otherwise, the hitbox would always remain in the starting position of the player, which would obviously look very silly. Now, luckily, that part is fairly simple. We simply want to get self.hitbox and place the center to wherever self.rect.center happens to be. 
And that is all we need for now. If I now try to run main.py again, the game doesn't crash, that's a good sign, but we can't really see the hitbox. And I suppose that's okay for now. We are going to make all of this a lot more visual in just a second. First of all though, we have to get all of the collidable objects. Those I want to store in another sprite group. I usually call this one self.collision underscore sprites. And this one can just be a normal pygame.sprite.group. It is just there to identify all of the collidable sprites, so it doesn't have to actually do anything. Speaking of which, when we are setting up the overworld, we have all of these objects. The top one we can safely ignore. This one is not going to have any collision. However, for the sprite, we do want to have a collision. Because of that, this sprite will be in self.all sprites and self.collision sprites. Besides that, the other collidable object is going to be the character, meaning for the group, for this one, we have all sprites and collision sprites as well. This would give us the objects and the characters. That leaves us with the collidable areas. Those we first of all have to import. I suppose the best place would be right below the object, but for this one, the position really does not matter. We want to have the collision objects. As always, for obj in tmxmap.getLayer by name, the layer name we are looking for is called collisions. This sprite that I want to create, I called a border sprite. That is going to get a position, a surface, groups, and that's all we need for this one. Now this border sprite does not exist at the moment, so let's create it by first of all importing it, and then inside of sprites below the sprite, I want to create a class border sprite, which will inherit from the sprite class. Then we need dunder init, with self, position, surface, and groups. We also have to initialize the parent class with super dunder init and pass through the position, surface, and groups. Now those border sprites are not going to be visible, so the Z layer doesn't actually matter. We can just keep it with the main one. The one really important thing that we have to add to this one is self.hitbox which for the border sprite is simply going to be self.rect.copy. We want to have for the hitbox the same size as the rectangle, at least for the border sprite. However, later on, when we are placing the objects, so all of those, we want to have a custom hitbox for the sprites as well. For now, I am not going to do that because that way it's a bit easier to see what's going on. But what we do want to do is we only want to check collisions between the hitboxes. So all of the collidable sprites will need a hitbox. So inside of the sprite class, we also need self.hitbox, which for now can be self.rect.copy. So with that, we have all of the hitboxes. I think the last thing that we have to do is to actually add proper arguments in here. For the position, we want to have obj.x and obj.y. For the surface, we want to create pygame.surface with obj.width and obj.height. Finally, for the groups, this one is only going to be in self.collision sprites. And that is really important. If this sprite was inside of all sprites, it would be visible, which we really want to avoid. As a matter of fact, I can actually demonstrate. I want to place this sprite inside of collision sprites and self.all sprites. On top of that, when we are creating the surface, there should be pygame.surface, and we have to add a tuple in there as an argument. Now the game should work, and there you can see we have all of the collision shapes. That looks pretty good. There we have a few more and those we can work with. Now obviously those we do not want to see. Hence collision sprites should not be inside of all sprites. That way, if I run the game, 
we can only see the actual objects. So with that, we have all of the collidable sprites and those we have to make accessible inside of the player because only in there are we going to run collision logic. Meaning I want to give the player another named argument. Collision sprites is going to be self.collision sprites. After that, inside of entities, the player is going to need another argument. Collision underscore sprites. Those we want to store as an attribute, self.collision sprites is going to be collision sprites. And now that we have that, we can create a method to check collisions. For the parameters, we will need self and the axis that we are looking at. This could be either horizontal or vertical. And before we continue, let's talk about collision logic. For the collision, we are first of all going to split the axes, meaning we do first of all the horizontal collisions and then the vertical ones. Now the order does not matter, but separating them is going to make our math a lot easier. After we have that, we are going to check for overlaps. For example, if we are doing this on the horizontal axis, we have one object that we can collide with and our player. So in the current example, we have an overlap on this side, which would indicate that we have a collision on the right side of the player or the left side of the obstacle. But this doesn't necessarily have to be the case because it could be that the player came from the right side and simply moved really fast. The correct answer could also be that the player actually collided on the right side of the obstacle. We simply don't know yet, so we need one more piece of information, which is going to be the direction of the player. Let's say if the player is currently moving to the right and we have a collision on the right side of the player, then we know we are on this side. That's kind of all we need to know. So in other words, the direction of the moving object tells us on which side the collision happened. Now this is a very easy collision method to implement. It does however have the downside that it only ever works with one moving object. Which for this game is the case. The only object that can move and collide is going to be the player. All of the other characters aren't really going to move. Or rather, when they are moving, we're going to block the player. So they can never overlap. Although if you want to learn more about complex collision behaviors, check out this tutorial of mine. It goes into much more detail. Or if you want to do all of this in practice, I have also made a Mario style platformer. That is going to do a lot of collision logic. Anyway, inside of the collision method, we first of all want to go through all of the sprites for sprite in self.collision sprites. After that, we want to check if sprite.hitbox.collide rectangle. Remember, we only want to check the collision between the hitboxes of all of the sprites. So at the moment, we are checking the hitbox of the sprites and we want to check that against self.hitbox. If that is the case, we know we have an overlap. As a matter of fact, we can print that. I want to print collision. This we want to call inside of the move method, self.collisions. We also have to add the axes, and this one could, for example, be horizontal. If I now run main.py, by default, nothing is going to happen. But if we are overlapping with the house, we're getting collision. The same would happen to the tree or any of these objects. We always get a collision. That is a really good start. So now we know that we have an overlap. But that's not a collision. So basically, once we have an overlap, we want to resolve that overlap and place the player in the new position. And for that, we have to go through the logic I just talked about. And the first step was to separate the axes, which is also going to involve the movement. Which means in this case, we want to update self.rect.centerx and to this we want to add self.direction.x multiplied with self.speed and delta time. After that, the hitbox is also going to be updated to only include the horizontal movement. And after we are doing that, we are covering the horizontal collisions. 
Now this at the moment means that we can only move left or right. There's no up or down movement, which I think for now is okay, so we can focus on one collision axis. The way we want to approach this one is inside of this if statement, if we have an overlap, we want to check if self.direction.x is greater than zero. If that is the case, we know we are moving to the right, which means self.hitbox.right is going to be sprite.hitbox.left. The way you want to think about this one, imagine we have the player and the player is moving to the right. Or in other words, self.direction.x is greater than zero. This means we are moving right. And then we are overlapping with some kind of object. That information we are getting from this line. If that is the case, we basically want to move the right side of the player and move it to the left side of the obstacle. That way it looks like the player is stuck on this side. And then we have an actual collision. And that's literally it. Although at the moment there's one more thing that we have to do. Currently we are only updating the hitbox, but what is actually displaying the player is the rectangle. Which means at the end of this line we have to get self.rect.centerx and set it to self.hitbox.centerx. With that we should have a collision on the right side, and if I move to the right that looks pretty good. So we now have one side, which means we only have to cover three more, and then we also have to give all of the sprites a smaller hitbox. This part is going to be your exercise. For this one, I want you guys to first of all finish the other three collision sides, and on top of that, create another class called Collidable Sprite. This one should be for all of the collidable objects, i.e. the trees and the houses and the rocks. This class is going to be basically identical to a sprite with one major difference, and that is that the hitbox should be 100% of the width, but only 60% of the height, with the same center point. Once we have that, we should be done with the collisions, so pause the video now and see if you can figure this one out. I suppose we should start with the player, or more specifically the player movement, so that we can move around freely again. I want to copy all of this for the horizontal logic and then change it to be vertical. This should be self.rect.centerY, self.direction.y, and then center y and center y. And after that, we want to do the vertical collisions. That means inside of collisions, we actually want to check if we have a vertical or a horizontal collision. For that, we are going to need another if statement, if axis is equal to horizontal. Only if that is the case, do we want to do all of this. And if that is not the case, else, then we want to do something else. Let's say pass for now. Because on the horizontal collision, we have to check if the player is moving left. Or in other words, if self.direction.x is smaller than zero, then we want to set self.hitbox.left to sprite.hitbox.right. And that is pretty much it. Next up for the vertical side, I want to check if self.direction.y is greater than zero. That means we are moving down. And if that is the case, self.hitbox.bottom should be sprite.hitbox.top. Finally, and for this one I can simply duplicate these two lines, I want to check if self.direction.y is smaller than zero, meaning we are moving up. And if that is the case, we want to check the top of the player hitbox. And if there's an overlap, we want to set it to the bottom of the colliding object. And finally, we want to update self.rect.centerY to self.hitbox.centerY. That should give us proper movement again. I can move in all directions and now we have collisions. So there is the house, there is a tree and we have a hospital. We should also try the characters. That looks pretty good. And cool, I am quite happy with that. 
Now, there is a bit of an issue that I don't really like, and that is, let me find a single tree, this one. The collision with the tree happens right here, or here on the side, or here at the top. And I think there is a bit too much of a space between these two objects. Or in other words, the collision side of the tree looks something like this. And for the player, the collision hitbox looks something like this. Because of that, we have just a little bit of overlap right here, which is looking really good. And I want to have more of that. And to get that, we want to reduce the size of the hitbox of the tree to make it something like this. In fact, for the tree, you could even create a smaller horizontal hitbox. So you get this part for an overlap as well, which is probably going to look really good. But that you can do in your own time. What I want to do when we are creating the objects that we can collide with, all of those, I want to create a collidable sprite that does not exist at the moment. So once again, we want to, from sprites, import the collidable sprite. And then inside of sprites, we have to create that class. Since it's going to be fairly similar to the border sprite, let me copy this one and then create a collidable sprite. Nearly done. The last thing that we have to do is for the rectangle, we don't want to create a one to one copy. Instead, we want to use inflate to keep 100% of the width and 60% of the height. Which means for the width, we want to have zero pixels in change. But for the height, we want to get negative self.rect.height and multiply it with 0 0.4. That way, we are reducing 40% or 20% at the top and 20% at the bottom. And now, if I run main.py, let's move back to the tree, this one over there. Now we get quite a bit more overlap. I think it's easier to see here. Now the player is much more behind the tree. And I think we could push this even more. Inside of sprites, let's go with 0 0.6 and see how good that is going to look. So let's try this tree. We are quite close to the center, but I think it's working fairly well. Let's try this one. And yeah, now we get a ton of overlap, which is actually looking pretty good. And yeah, I'm quite happy with this one, but once again, play around with the numbers and just see what looks good on your end. Either way, we have finished another important part. Although before we finish up, there's one more thing that I do want to cover. And that is, if the player is simply moving left and right, we have one kind of speed. The same if we are moving up and down. However, once the player starts moving in the diagonal direction, we are actually moving quite a bit faster, and this is a noticeable change. So I think you can see it fairly well. The reason why the player is moving faster when we are moving diagonally is because inside of the input, this line here, we are not normalizing the input vector. If our direction is 1 and 0, i.e. we are moving to the right. If that is the case, our speed is just going to be one multiplied by whatever speed we have, which is totally fine. However, if our direction is one and one, so we are moving right and down, then the actual movement is actually going to be 1.4 multiplied by the speed that we have, simply because we are moving on two axes via speed, and those two add up together. The way around that is to normalize the vector. That way we are setting the length of the vector always to one. All we have to do is to use the normalize method. This, however, if I run the code, is not going to work. We're going to get an error right away that we cannot normalize a vector of length zero. And that should actually make sense if you think about it. Imagine you are Python and we are telling Python that we have an arrow that looks like this or like this. We are moving to the right or we are moving down and right. All that normalize is going to do is it takes this vector and it sets the length of it to one. So if we are going down and right or simply right, it is always going to work. But now imagine we have a vector with zero and zero. 
This thing doesn't really move in any direction, it's simply a point. Hence, Python cannot set the length of this thing to a 1. It's simply not possible, it doesn't know in which way to go. As a consequence, we're getting an error. Now the way around that is fortunately fairly simple. We simply want to check if we have an input vector. If this vector is 0 and 0, which it is by default, then we want to do something else, which in our case is going to be the input vector on its own. If I now run the game again, I can move left, right, up, down, and if I move diagonally, we still get the same speed, which feels much more consistent. Cool, and with that, we have made a whole bunch of progress for the game. Now we actually have a proper overworld, and the player cannot leave the game anymore. Oh, and also I didn't mention, for the beach, we have collisions, so there's no way for the player to see the black background of the map. Perfect. So at this point, we have basically finished the overworld, which means next up we can start working on the dialogue tree. That way the entire game is starting to become interactive. And to get the dialogue system, we broadly need two things. Number one, we have to check if dialogue is available in the first place. And number two, once we have that, we need some kind of dialogue tree system. I'll buy a fairly simple one. First of all, we have to check if dialogue is available in the first place, and this will involve a couple of things. First of all, we want to check if the trainer and the player are on the same axis. For example, if this is the trainer, we want to check if the player is roughly on this axis or on this axis. Or in other words, if the player is for example here, or here, or here, or here. Only then should the player be able to talk to this character. After we have that, we want to make the entities face each other, that should be fairly straightforward. Then we have to block player movement, and then we can start the actual dialogue. None of this should be too difficult, so let's jump right in. Back in the code, first of all, we have to get access to all of the trainers easily. And for that, I want to create another sprite group. On the groups, I can duplicate the collision sprites, because besides that, I want to have a character sprites group. Which, like the collision sprites, doesn't have to do very much. It's simply there to get easy access to all of the characters. Which means when we are creating all of the characters, which happens down here, we have to place them in three groups. All sprites, collision sprites, and self.character sprites. That's all we need in here. Next up, inside of the overworld, I want to check input as well. At the moment, the only input that we have is inside of the player class, to move the player itself. But I also want, in the actual main game class, have an input method. Let's place it right above run. I want to check for input. No need for custom parameters on this one. And just as before, I want to get all of the keys, which we are getting with pygame.key.get underscore pressed. And the key I care about is keys and pygame.a underscore space. And if I spell this correctly, this would also work much better. Now, if the player presses the space button, I want to print for now dialog. Now don't forget to run this method. That is going to happen before we are doing anything else. Self.input. Now, if I run all of this, we are getting an error because this should be key and dot get pressed. If I now press space, we are getting dialog. That means input is working, but it's not working as intended. Because even though I only press space once, we got dialog a few hundred times. That is because of the frame rate. All that Pygame really checks is if this button is pressed and then it prints dialog. And this happens on every frame of the game. In our case, our frame rate is probably around two to 300 meaning this method runs way too often and we are getting way too much output. If we had actual dialogue and we press space, then we would skip dialogue 200 times. So that's not ideal. And there are broadly two ways to get around this. Number one, you could create a timer that after keys was pressed, we have to wait, let's say half a second to press the button again. Could be implemented and later on, we are going to do something like that. But for now, an easier way of solving this is get 
just pressed. If I now run the game and I press space, we only ever get a single dialog output. Essentially, get just pressed is only going to return newly pressed keys, which for any kind of UI work is incredibly useful. So that is what I'm going to use. Also, get just pressed is a Pygame CE feature. If you're using traditional Pygame, you would get an error at this point. So do be careful and make sure you have the most recent version of Pygame. Anyway, after the player has pressed space, we want to check if we are close to one of the characters. For that, we will need four character in self dot character sprites. This would give us all of the characters. And basically what we want to do is we want to check the connection. Now this check connection is going to involve two parts. Imagine this is the trainer and this is the player. First of all, what we want to check is the distance between the two, i.e. if the player is within a certain radius of the character. These two entities should only be able to interact if they are close enough. Should be fairly straightforward. And on top of that, we want to check if they are roughly on the same axis, i.e. if the player is either roughly here, let's say with a margin of error, or on this axis. Now, this kind of check connection, we are going to reuse a couple of times, meaning I will keep this as a function and then actually keep it inside of support. So in there, let me minimize everything. And all the way at the bottom, I want to have some game functions while all the other stuff is import functions. Which means in here, I want to have a function check underscore connections. The same function we are using here. And in there, I want to have three arguments, the radius, the player, and the character. Radius for this is always going to be 100. And player is going to be self.player. After that, inside of support, we want to have a radius, we need an entity, and we will need a target. Also, we can set a tolerance that by default is going to be 30 pixels. Inside of this function, first of all, I want to get the relationship between the entity and the target, which we can do via vectors very easily. I want to get the vector of target.rect.center and from that, subtract the vector of entity.rect.center. If this is our current entity and we have a target, the relation would be an arrow pointing from the center of one to the center of the other, like this, which is already really useful because on this thing, we can get the length and then check how far apart these two entities are, which we actually are going to do right now. I want to check if relation dot length is smaller than the radius. If that is the case for now, I want to return true. And if we don't return anything, this function is going to return none, which is going to be falsy. Hence, we only need a single return value. Now with that, inside of main.py, we can check if these two entities are nearby. And if that's the case, only then do I want to allow the dialog output. Meaning now, if I run all of this again, I press space and we are getting an error because this should be check connections. Let's try it again. If I press space, nothing happens. But if I get close to this character, I can press space and we are getting dialogue. I can move away. If I press space, nothing happens. But if I get to this other character, I can press space and we are getting dialogue once again. So this is working really well. That means next up, we can work on the second part where we are checking if the player and the character are on the same horizontal or vertical axis. Now to understand how this is going to work, imagine once again, we have the player and we have the target with an arrow between the centers of these two. Ultimately, all that we really have to check to, for example, test if those two are on the same horizontal axis, we simply need to know the height of this line. If it is below 30, then we know it is inside of the tolerance. Although we do have to be careful because below 30 could be any negative number, which means what we actually want to check is the absolute value of relation dot y. If that value is below the tolerance, only then do we want to return true. 
With that, I can run main.py, I can press space, nothing happens. If I am on the left side of the character, we are getting dialog, but if I go on top, I can press space and nothing is going to happen. Because of the collisions, this is a bit hard to see. Let me try another character, this one. So at the moment, I'm on top of the character, I can press space, nothing is going to happen. But if I am on the side, we are getting dialog. So the system is working. So this is kind of working, but at the moment it looks a bit weird because the player is facing downwards. And what I would rather want to check is if the player is on the same horizontal axis and if the player is facing the opponent. Only if those conditions are met as well, then I want to allow dialogue. Now we do know which direction the player is facing. That we are getting from get state, we have a facing direction. This we want to use again. Which means what we actually want to check is, first of all, if entity dot facing underscore direction, if that is, for example, left, then we know the player is facing left. On top of that, we want to check relation dot x is smaller than zero. <clears throat> that way we know the player is facing to the left and we are to the right of the opponent. And then, finally, we are also on the same horizontal plane. Only if these three conditions are met, then I want to allow dialogue. So at the moment, we should only be able to talk to an opponent if we are on the left side and if we are facing that character. So for this one, there's no way to talk to her at the moment. But if I go to the other character and I'm on the right side and I'm facing left, I am getting a dialogue. But if I am on any other side, it doesn't work. And if I'm facing the wrong way, we also do not get a dialogue. But if I'm facing her and the other conditions are met, then we are getting a working system. Cool, so with that, we have one side. This we just have to expand a bit to cover the other sides as well. For that, I can actually just copy all of this because we only have to change a few things. For the second line, I want to check if we are facing right. Then we want to check if we are currently on the left side of the opponent, and we still want to check if we are on the same horizontal plane. That's the next part. After that, we have to do up and down. I want to check if we are, let's start with facing up. Then we want to check if relation.y is smaller than zero. And we want to check if relation.x the absolute value is smaller than the tolerance. Nearly done. The last thing that we have to cover is going to be if the player is facing down, relation.y is greater than zero, and the tolerance part is still just fine. That should actually be all we need. So we don't need the or at the end anymore. And for once, let's try a different character. This one, I can talk to him from this side, from this side, from this side, and from this side. But if I face another way, or I am diagonally compared to him, we are not getting a dialogue. So that system is looking to be working pretty good. Cool. That also covers the check connections function. We are going to reuse it later on, but for now, this is all we need from this one. We want to block player input. After that, we want to make the entities face each other. And then finally, we can create the dialogue. To go through it step by step, let's start with blocking the player input. For that, we have to work inside of the entities. And let me minimize all of this so it's a bit easier to see. Inside of the entity, under movement, I want to add another parameter, self.blocked, which by default is going to be false. On top of that, I'm going to create two more methods. Define block with self, which is going to set self.blocked to true. And on top of that, self.direction is going to become a vector with zero and zero. That is definitely going to stop the player. On top of that, I want another method, unblock with self. And all that this one is going to do is self.blocked is going to be false. With those attributes in place, I can look at the player input. Essentially what we want to do 
If the player is blocked, we don't want to allow any input, and we also do not want to allow anything inside of the move method, which means inside of update. These two methods should only run if not self.blocked. I suppose we could put animate in there as well. It's not really going to make a difference. With that, we can go back to main.py, and then if there's a connection, self.player.block. Let's try. And if I talk to this character, the player cannot move anymore. Although you do get some weird behavior. We simply stop mid animation. So actually, I was wrong. This animate does care about being inside of self.blocked. If we take it out of it and try all of this again, now we are getting the player blocked and we are also getting back to the default state. Let's try this one again, just to make sure it wasn't an accident. With that, we can block the player. Next up, we want to make the entities face each other, or in other words, if the player talks to this bug catcher. The bug catcher should start facing the player. For that, we want to get the character and then call a function change underscore facing underscore direction. For which we will need a target position, which will be self.player.rect.center. Now this method doesn't exist right now, and we want to create it inside of the entity class. It is going to be used both for the player and for the characters. Let's place it right below get state, define, change facing direction, with self and a target position. Like we have done with check connections, we first of all want to get the relation between the target and the current character. The same thing we have done here, I can actually just copy the line. Although we do have to update it because now the target is going to be the target position. And instead of entity.rect.center, we want to have self.rect.center. After that, we want to check if they are on the same horizontal plane. If absolute relation dot y is smaller than 30. If that is the case, we have to decide if we're going to face right or left. In either case, we want to update facing direction. And let's say by default, we're going to go with right. That should already work at least for one direction. If I now talk to this guy, nothing is going to happen. That is because this change that facing direction is being called, but inside of the character, simply nothing is going to happen. The character never updates. So it doesn't really matter what this attribute is doing, it's not being used inside of the character. All we need to fix that is define update with self and delta time and proper spelling, and then call self.animate with delta time. The character already has the animate method because this one is part of the entity class. If I now try this again, we should be seeing an update. And there we go. This is working really well. So next up, let's finish up this method. We only want this character to face right if the player is to the right of it. Or in other words, if relation.x is greater than zero. If that is not the case, else it should be left. After that, we want to check if the player is on another plane, i.e. on the vertical one. If that is the case, self.facing direction is going to be, let's say, down by default if relation.y is greater than zero. If that is not the case, else it should be facing up. And with that, let's try another character and make her face down. That is working well. And one more attempt. Let's try the character down here. And she is facing up. So that seems to be working just fine. Cool. So finally, we can start working on the actual dialogue, which we want to initiate with create dialogue. A method we have to create, let's do it right below, define create dialogue. For the parameters, we want to have self and the character, which means when we are calling this create method, we have to pass in the character that we currently have. After that, we want to create a dialogue tree class. 
that is going to get the character, it is going to get self.player, it will need self.all sprites so we can show things, and then it is also going to need a font. Now the font we don't have at the moment, and that's the easiest part to fix. After we have that, we can create the actual class. But let's first of all import some fonts. That is going to happen inside of import assets. And there, I want to have another dictionary, self.fonts. Now later on, we are going to have quite a few key value pairs. For now though, I only want to have one for the dialog, which we create with pygame.font.font. Then we will need the join method for the path, and I want to go up a folder, then I want to go to graphics. In there we have a folder called fonts, and in there we have a file called pixeloidsans.ttf. For the font size, I want to go with 30. Now, if I run the game, we are not getting an error message, so that is looking really good. With that, we have a font. And that we want to paste into the dialog tree right away, which we do with self.fonts, and we want to have the dialog font. Next up, we have to actually create this dialog tree. For that, I want to create a new Python file that I saved as dialog.py. As always, we will need from settings and we want to import everything. After that, we can create a class called dialog tree. No need for inheritance, and then inside of the dunder init method, we have to cover all of the arguments I just talked about. These ones here. We want to have a character, we want to have the player, we want to have all sprites, and then we want to have, let's call this one simply the font. All of those need to become attributes. So self.player is going to be player, self.character will become the character, self.font will become the font, and self.all sprites will be all sprites. With that, the game is not going to crash anymore once we are talking to a character. But fundamentally, we're not really doing anything. So how can we actually display some text for each of the characters? Well, first of all for that, we have to get some data. And for that, we need to import a file I haven't really talked about yet. That one is called game data which is a massive dictionary, so let me hide everything. For now, we only want to look at trainer data, and this is a giant dictionary with the data for all of the trainers in the game. And if we look at the first one, O1 stands for Overworld 1. In fact, if you look at all of the entities inside of the Overworld, I believe the first character is this one. Yeah, this one is called O1. Or in other words, via the character ID, we are going to associate this marker in the tile map with this entry inside of trainer data. Now in there, we have quite a bit of information. We have the monsters of this character, we have the dialogue options, we have the looking around directions, and if the player looks around, i.e. if this character is looking out for the player. Then we are checking if this player was defeated and what biome he is in. That could be forest, sand, or a bit further down we have ice as well, like this one. Now that is quite a bit of data. And I suppose before we continue, we have to get this data into the character class, i.e. inside of entities, we have to get all of the data into this thing here. For that, I want to create another parameter, character data. For now, I suppose let's simply print what we are getting. After that, inside of main.py, when we are setting up the entirety of the overworld, inside of the characters, we will need another named argument, character underscore data. Now the value from this one, we are getting from game data, this one, and there we have trainer data. Although I suppose a better name would be character data, but I guess both work just fine. And from this dictionary, we want to pick one item which we're getting via obj.properties. The property we want to look at is called character underscore ID. Or in other words, this character ID I just talked about. If I now run the game, we are getting trainer data is not defined. That's an easy thing to fix. All the way at the top, we need 
from game underscore data, import everything. Now let's try this again. And there we go. We are getting the data for all of the trainers. For example, for the first trainer, we have monsters. Then we have the dialogue options. They start here. We have directions, defeated, biome, and so on. That looks really good. This character data, we do want to store as an attribute. Self.characterData is going to be character data. On top of that, I want to create a method for get dialogue. No need for custom parameters. And then we want to return the data for this character. Although this could be one of two options. If you look at game data, for example, trainer01 has a dialogue option for default and for defeated. We want to get the right option depending on the character being defeated or not. Which means we want to return self.characterData and the dialogue. But then we want to create an F string, which is going to be defeated if self.characterData is indeed defeated, if that is not the case. So else, then we want to get default. Inside of game data, we are simply checking if this value is true or false. Oh, and by the way, it's really important to keep all of the data inside of this dictionary. I.e. later on, once the character is defeated, this value changes. We do not keep that data inside of this class. That is important later on, because when the player changes the map, for example, to go from an arena back to the overworld, then we are going to recreate this class. And any attribute would be reset. So we cannot keep data in here, it wouldn't be persistent. Anyway, with that, we have get dialog. This we can use inside of the dialog, because in there we have the character. So we can print character and get underscore dialog. Let's try this one. If I now talk to the blonde girl, we are getting an error. The dialog tree is not defined. That is quite fixable. I want from dialog import dialog tree. Let's try this again. And if I talk to her one more time, we're getting one more error that we are taking four positional arguments, but five were given. That is because I forgot self in there. Next attempt. And there we go. We are getting an actual dialogue output. And I realized I was really bad with consistent quotation marks, but doesn't really matter. I suppose we should try another character, this one here. And this one also has a dialogue. That looks pretty good, cool. Next up, instead of simply printing the dialogue, I want to store it as an attribute self.dialog I suppose works. On top of that, I also want to have self.dialog number, which is simply going to be the length of self.dialog. And finally, I want to have self.dialog underscore index, which by default is always going to be zero. Once we have all of that, I want to create self.current underscore dialog which is going to be a dialogue sprite. This one doesn't exist just yet, but we are going to create it in just a second. For that, we want to have a message, we want to have the trainer, we want to have groups, and we want to have a font. This dialogue sprite is what will actually display the message. Let's create it right away. Class dialogue sprite, which has to have a parent of pygame.sprite.sprite. There, we want to initialize the class with the message we want to display, the trainer, the groups, and the font. With that, we can add actual arguments into this class. For the message, I want to have self.dialog and then pick one of the options with self.dialog index. Trainer is quite easy. This one should be self.character, and I suppose I should always call this character. Groups is super easy. This one is simply going to be self.all sprites. And for the font, we want to have self.font. We only have a single one. Inside of the dialogue sprite then, first of all, we want to have super dunder init, 
and initialize the groups. We will also need self.z, which is going to be world underscore layers. And these sprites should always be on top. After that, we have to create the actual text. I want to have a text underscore surface, which we create with self.font.render. We want to render the message. Anti-alias should be false. And the colors we are getting from settings. In there, we have a colors dictionary, which means inside of dialog, I want to get colors. And for this one, I want to have a black color. So that would give us the text surface, but what we actually need is self.image. I suppose for now, we can simply set the text surface to the image just so we have something, but this we do have to change. Anyway, next up, we want to create self.rectangle, which will be self.image.get underscore f rectangle, where we are placing the mid bottom to character.rect.mid. And we could add a bit of an offset, let's say vector zero and negative 10. That should give us something. If I now run main.py and I talk to the girl, we are getting an error message that we do not have a font. That is because this font is not an attribute. Let's try this again. And there we go. I don't like sand. We are getting one dialog output. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't look particularly good. For that, inside of dialog, we have to work more with the sprite. The problem that we have to fix is that the image is simply going to be a text surface. Hence, we have no background whatsoever. After we are creating the text surface, I want to set the width and the height of the background. Both of those should be basically the text surface, and then we add some padding to it. That padding, by the way, should probably be a local variable, padding, and I went with five pixels, but simply choose what you like the most. For the width, we want to get the text surface and then get underscore width. This would give us the width of the text surface. This we want to increase by self dot padding multiplied by two, i.e. this is our text and we want to have padding to the left and to the right. And so we are multiplying padding with two. Now there's one more thing that I do want to do, and that is to set a minimum width, which I'm doing with max and then 30. That way our width is either 30 pixels or the text width plus the padding, whichever one is larger. That way, even if we don't have much text, we always have a bubble that is noticeable. For the height, we have to do something fairly similar. I want to get the text surface, then get underscore height. And to that, I want to add self dot padding multiplied by two. There's no need to set a minimum height like we have done for the width because the height is always defined. Even if we only have a single character, we are always getting a sufficient amount of height. Next up, we can create the background. This is going to be a surface, which we are creating with pygame.surface. For the tuples, I want to have width and height. And for now, I want to fill the surface with a color, self.fill color. Then I want to get my colors and the bubble color should be a pure white. One of the colors we are specifying inside of settings, this one. This surface will then become the surface we are actually going to display which is a good start, but with this system, we're not going to see the text anymore. We are simply getting a surface with the same size as the text, which means we have to put the text on this surface, which we do with surf.blit. I want to blit the text surface in the center of this surface. I want to get the text surface and then get F rectangle, where we are setting the center to the center point of this surface. Or in other words, we're getting the width and the height and divide either of those values by two. We have a tuple with width divided by two and height divided by two. 
And that should be it. Although I did realize that this shouldn't be self.padding, it should just be padding. Because padding is a local variable. If I now go to the character and I can talk to him, we are getting a speech bubble. That looks pretty good. Although it is very blocky. That happens because this surface is simply going to be a rectangle. And we're going to fix that by adding another argument, pygame.src alpha. That way we can set an alpha value for the surface. And by default, I want to fill the surface with, well, nothing, i.e. a tuple with 0, 0, and 0 for RGB. This value doesn't actually matter because we're going to specify another value for alpha, which is 0, so we're not going to see anything of the surface. Let's try this one, and there we go. Now we cannot see the background anymore, which is totally fine, because before we are drawing the text, I want to go with pygame.draw.rectangle. I want to draw on the surface. I want to draw with colors and pure white. The rectangle I want to draw is surface and get f rectangle, where we can set a top left, of zero and zero. That way we are simply covering the entire surface with a rectangle. So far that isn't going to do very much. But what we are now able to do is specify two more arguments, a border width of zero and then a corner radius of four. With that, if I run my.py again and I talk to a character, we are getting rounded corners. So that is looking pretty good. And I suppose with that, we can close the dialog sprite for now. We will not need it for a while. Instead, we have to figure out how to get to the next dialog option. At the moment, we are only ever getting the first one. For that, inside of the dialog tree, I want to look for input. Just as before, I want to get all of the press keys with pygame.key and get underscore just underscore pressed. Then I want to check if keys and pygame.k underscore space. If that is the case, first of all, I want to get rid of the current dialog, self.currentdialog.kill. That way we are not going to see a dialog anymore. After that, I want to get to the next dialog index, i.e. the dialog index we are using to pick one of the dialog options. This one we simply want to increase by one, self.dialog index plus equal one. Finally, we have to make a choice. If self.dialog index is smaller than self.dialog number. If that is the case, we know there is a next dialog option available, which means we can create another self.current dialog, which will be another dialog sprite with the same options we have specified up here. I can literally just copy all of them and paste them in here. However, if that is not the case, else, then we want to end the dialog. Although for now, we can't really do that. So I'm gonna add pass in here. Also to make sure that we are actually calling the input method, we will need define update with self. And in there, we want to call self.input. However, now we have an issue. Inside of this dialog tree, we are checking for the space bar. But inside of the main game, we are also checking the spacebar here. So we have a bit of a problem. At the moment, we would activate both of those options, meaning we would get the next dialog option, but we would also get an entirely new dialog, which we want to avoid. I only want to check this input, if not self.dialog underscore tree. Only if we do not have a dialog tree do we want to check for this input. Although at the moment this attribute does not exist, but we can fix that very easily. When we are creating a dialog, I want to assign the dialog tree to this attribute. And then inside of the dunder init method, and let me clean this one up a bit. Inside of the dunder init method, I want to create self.dialog tree, which by default is none. And once we are creating a dialog, we want to assign the dialog tree to this value. That way, this if statement is going to run and give us all of this. There's just one more thing I do want to do, and that is we only want to create a new dialog tree if we currently don't have one. 
i.e. if not self.dialog tree in here as well. Just as a safeguard that we don't create two dialog trees at the same time. Cool. So with that, we have our dialog tree. We just have to make sure that we are actually calling this update method. For that, inside of the game logic, I want to create another section for the overlays and then check if self.dialog tree exists, that I want to run self.dialog tree dot update. Let's try. I can now go to this character, talk to him, and we get some updates, although this is way too fast. Let's try it again, actually, just so we can go through this one by one. I am standing next to the character, and if I now press space, we very quickly go to the second dialogue option. Although if I press space again, we get progress. And then the dialogue disappears, so this works, but we cannot move. We do have something, but this is not ideal. To start with the first issue, when we are starting the dialogue, we almost immediately switch to the second dialogue option. That is because when we are creating the dialogue, we are checking this input for the last time, but then we also immediately get this input. That way we are switching right away to the second dialogue index. To avoid that, we are going to need a timer. That way we are ensuring that we only get this input, let's say once every half second. Unfortunately, the inbuilt Pygame timers aren't particularly flexible. However, I have made a timer class. So if you open the file explorer and go to timer, you can open this one and there we have a fairly simple timer class for which you can set iteration, repeat, auto start and the function you want to call once this thing times out. Now the class itself isn't terribly complicated. And if you want to know more about it, check out this video. It builds the entire class up from scratch. Now in our case, I am simply going to use it which we start doing by from timer import timer. And then we want to create one instance of a timer, which I want to store in self.dialog timer. For that, we want to create a timer class and the one argument we will always need is the duration in milliseconds, which in my case is 500 or half a second. After that, I want to specify one named argument, which is auto start true. Once we have that, inside of the input method, I only want to skip to the next dialog if we are pressing the space key and not self.dialog timer is active. Also, whenever we are getting a new dialog in this if statement, I want to activate the timer, which we do with self.dialog timer and activate. That way, after we're getting a new dialog timer, we have to wait for half a second to get to the next option. Finally, the last thing that we have to do is call self.dialogTimer.update. The entire logic of the class is basically inside of this update method. If you look at the timer class, in there, we are basically checking our current time and then a start time. If that difference is greater than a duration, we want to deactivate the timer. That's basically all that's happening inside of the class. Because of that, we always have to call the update method to make sure that this class actually does something. But with that, if I now try the dialogue again, we are getting, hi, how are you? Do you want to fight? And fight. And then we are finishing the dialogue. Although we cannot move anymore. And later on, we also want to start a battle. But for now, I simply want to end the dialogue. Below create dialogue, I want to define end dialogue, which will need self and the character we have. For now, we are simply going to set self.dialog tree to none. Also, we want to get self.player and unblock the entire class so we can move around again. With that, when we are creating a dialogue, I want to pass in self.endDialog. For that to work, inside of the dialog, we have to add another parameter, end underscore dialog, and then save this one as an attribute. 
Let's do it all the way at the top. Self dot end dialog is end dialog. And then inside of the input, if we are exceeding the number of messages, we want to call self dot end dialog. Also, this method expects one argument, the current character, which we have inside of an attribute. So we simply have to pass in self dot character. So with that, let's try to have a dialogue with this guy. And while I'm talking with him, I cannot walk around. And we get to the next dialogue option. And afterwards, I can move around freely again. So that is looking pretty good. Let's try the other lady, this one. And that is also working pretty well. Cool, so with that, we have a basic dialogue system. There's just one more thing that we do need, and that is if the player is walking in front of any of these characters, I want them to talk to the player. Or a bit more generally, for all of the characters, I want to check their view direction, and if the player crosses it, like we are doing right now, then I want the character to move towards the player and start a dialogue. For that, we have to work inside of the entities. And let me minimize things because we only care about the character at the moment. To get started, we first of all need a bit more information inside of the class. We will need the location of the player. We will need the ability to create a dialogue. And we are going to need the collision sprites. Now, in case you're wondering, we do need collision sprites because if this is the character and this is the player, we might get a line of sight between the two. But this we want to block if there's an obstacle between the two, which we are getting from the collision sprites. Now, first of all, we have to create a few more attributes. Self.player is going to be the player. Self.create dialog will be create dialog. And finally, for self.collision sprites, we don't actually care about the sprites themselves. Instead, we want to have a list of collision rectangles, which we can get via sprite.rect or sprite in collision sprites. Although for this one, we do have to be careful because we do not want to get the character itself. Remember, all of the characters are also collidable objects, meaning they are inside of collision sprites. I.e., we want to have all of the collision sprites if sprite is not self. With that, we have the basic setup. Afterwards, we will need a couple of movement attributes. Self dot has underscore moved. By default, should be false. Self dot can underscore rotate should be true by default, and self.has underscore noticed, which is going to be false. Has moved is going to check if the player has already walked. Can rotate is going to tell us if this character can rotate around to look in different directions. And has noticed is going to tell us if this character has noticed the player or not. On top of that, we will need two more attributes, self.radius, and we will need what I called view directions, which is going to be a list that, for example, contains left and right, meaning this character is going to look left or right at random. The radius we can get from tiled. If you look at that and you click on any of the markers, if they are a character, they always have a radius. Although I think I was a bit lazy for this one because every single marker has a radius of 400. Customize this in your own time. For the game, it's not going to make that much of a difference. Anyway, in our case, we want to get the radius that we put into the class via the parameter, radius. For the view directions, we have to look at game data. In there, for example, for trainer01, we have directions down. So this character can only look down. But for trainer02, this one can look left or down and trainer03 can look in all four directions. This one we can get a bit more easily because we have the character data. I want to get the character data and then get the directions. 
With that, we just have to figure out all of these extra parameters that we do inside of main.py when we are setting up the character down here. We will need a whole bunch more arguments. We will need a player. This one is going to be self dot layer. Then we will need create underscore dialog, I believe I called it, which is self and create dialog. <clears throat> and make sure to not call this method. After that, we will need the collision sprites and the radius. Collision sprites are simply going to be self dot collision sprites. And finally, the radius is going to be obj dot properties. And I think I called this one the radius. Let's run the entire thing and we are not crashing. And if I talk to a character, it's still working just fine. Cool. Good start. But still, the characters don't actually do anything, meaning we have to add just a bit more logic. For that, I have created a method that I have called raycast. Because ultimately, what we are going to do is, well, we're going to cast a ray from the current character in the viewing direction. For example, if this character is looking to the right, we are casting out a ray in this direction. If the player intersects with it, then we want to do some more stuff that for now isn't too important. We have to go through this step by step. For this raycast method, we don't need any custom parameters. And basically what we want to do in there is we want to check our connections once again. The same method we have used inside of main.py when the player wants to talk to a character, this one. Or in other words, the one that we have created inside of support.py. This check connections for which we are going to need a radius, entity, and target. Radius is going to be self.radius. Entity is going to be self. And the target is going to be self.player. If that is the case, for now to test it, let's print layer. Also, we have to make sure that we are calling self.raycast. Oh, and finally, we also have to make sure that we are from so import, import, check connections. After that, inside of main.py, we are getting an error that we cannot do a comparison between a float and a string. That happens inside of entities with raycast and check connections. And there we are getting a problem on this line. And the issue is fairly simple. When we are importing the radius, this one is coming from tiled, in there, the radius, if you look at the data type, it is a string for some reason. That is my mistake and not terribly easy to fix simply because we have a whole bunch of characters. Or rather, I would say it's not easy to fix inside of tiled. Inside of Pygame, we can simply convert all of the radii into integers and then this should be working. So if I now go in front of this bug catcher, we can see player. And if I go to the other lady down here, for all of the sides, nothing is going to happen. But if I am below her, then we are getting player. And finally, if I go to this lady, we can be below, nothing happens. But if I am to her left, then we get more player output. So if that is the case, I want to get self.player and block the player. Also, I want to update the player facing direction, which we do with self.player and then change facing direction. The method that we have created earlier inside of entity, this one. We can reuse that quite easily. All we have to do is change the target, which in this case is going to be self.rect.center. Self in this case is referring to the character. Let's try that one. And if I now walk in front of the bug catcher, the player cannot walk anymore and we are facing the character. Cool. Although the issue is that this is going to work even if there's an obstacle. So even if we are walking here, the player is going to stop and face the opponent. But this shouldn't happen because we have an obstacle in the way that we do have to check for. To incorporate that, I will create another method that I called has underscore LOS, short for line of sight. 
no need for custom parameters in this one. And basically all we want to check. First of all, if the vector of self dot rect dot center, and then distance to self dot layer dot rect dot center, if that value is below self dot radius. I.e. we are only doing stuff if the player is inside of the character radius. If that is the case, we want to check for all of the collisions between these two entities, which should be a list of Boolean values. I.e. we only really care about if there's an object in the way or not. We do not care about the size or the position, we simply care if there's an object in the way. That is all we need to know. I.e. this should be a list of either true or false values. But step by step, first of all, I want to get rect for rect in self dot collision rectangles, the list we created in the dunder init method early on. And on this rectangle, we want to run a method called clip line. This one wants to have two points, a starting point and an end point. Our starting point is self.rect.center and our end point is self.player.rect.center. And clip line is basically going to check if we have a line, if it passes through a rectangle. If that is the case, it will give us the line inside of the rectangle, which we don't really care about. We just want to know if this line exists in the first place, which means we can wrap the return value into a Boolean function. That way, we ever get true or false. And after that, we can return not any and the collisions. Any is going to check if there's any true value inside of the list. If that is the case, it is going to return true overall. And in our case, via this list, we're getting lots of true or false values. If there's even a single obstacle between the player and the character, all of this is going to evaluate to true. Or to be a bit more precise, because of this not, we're getting the very opposite. I.e. If there are no collisions whatsoever, this value is going to be true. However, once we have a single obstacle, this value will become false. That way, we will know if we have line of sight or not. Which we can use inside of Raycast. I want to check the connection and self.hasLOS. If I now try to run the game and walk below this obstacle, we do not get anything, but if I walk on top of it, so there's no obstacle, we once again get the player block and we are facing the character. So we can start working on the next issue. And that is that I want the character to start walking towards the player. For which we're going to need two methods. The first one will be start underscore move with no custom parameters. And in there, we want to set a direction for this character. So in other words, self.direction is going to get a value. Self.direction, by the way, already exists inside of the character because the parent class entity has a direction, this one. Which means all that we have to find is the direction from the character to the player. Let's do that on the line before. I want to get the relation between the character and the player. For that, I want to get the vector with self.player.rect.center and then subtract another vector with self.rect.center. This value we need to normalize. Or in other words, we want to call the normalize method. Now for the direction, I do not want to set the relation right away. Because imagine that this is the character and we have a line of sight going straight down. But there is a bit of tolerance, so the actual line is something like this. And if the player collides with it, like so, our relation would be an arrow that tilts a bit to the right. Which might be okay for the game, but I want the character to only move up or down or left or right. There should not be any diagonal movement. To get that, I want to create a new vector with relation.x and relation.y. And then the trick is to round both values. After that, if the player gets into the raycasting area, we want to start move. 
Now, this is not going to do anything because the direction is not being used. There's no move method inside of the character. So let's create one. No need for custom parameters. We want to self.rect.center plus equal self.direction multiplied with self.speed multiplied with delta time. Oh, and for that, we do need delta time as a parameter. So when we are calling self.move, we can pass in delta time. By default, direction is going to be zero. So there shouldn't be any movement. Let's try main.py. And if I go in front of the character, it is, well, it's doing something. The issue is we never stop moving, but this part at the very least works. Now to fix that issue, while the character is moving, we're going to create another larger rectangle around it. And if this area collides with the player, then we are going to stop moving. Or in other words, we want to check. If not self.hitbox.inflate, and let's go with 10 and 10. If this new hitbox collide rects with self.player.hitbox, then we know we have a collision. So we only want to move if this is not the case. Else, I want to set self.direction back to a vector with default values, i.e. 0 and 0. And also, I want to wrap all of this inside of another if statement. We only want to do all of this if not self dot has moved and if there is a self dot direction. Now, self dot has moved, we haven't touched yet. But basically, after this if statement is correct, we know that the character has moved, i.e. inside of the else statement, we can set has moved to true. After that, the character should not be able to move anymore. All of the characters should only be able to move once. So with all of that, let's try main.py and the bug catcher should only walk to the player. And that didn't work. And I think I know why. When we are updating the rectangle of the bug catcher, we are not updating the hitbox. That is the same issue we had with the player because in there, after moving the rectangle, we also have to update the hitbox, which at the moment we are not doing, but we can fix that quite easily. Self.hitbox.center is going to be self.rect.center. Now this should be working. Let's try. And the bug catcher is walking to the player and then keeps on walking. Nearly done. We just have to fix the animation. The issue we have at the moment is that the character spots the player inside of Raycast and then moves towards the player. And once we have reached the player, we keep on checking the Raycast. And then we are starting to move again and we're calling the move method and this keeps on going forever. We have to break the loop, which we can do with another condition in the if statement and not self dot has moved. Let's try this again now and we should not be getting a walking animation. That looks good. Also what we can do at this point, after the character has reached the player, we want to initialize the dialog with self.createDialog. As an argument, we have to pass in the character itself. Let's try that part. And now we are getting dialog. And I can go to the next option, fight, and then walk around. That is looking pretty good. Let's try another character, this lady, and this part is also working perfectly fine. There's not that much more that we have to do. And I think at this point, we should do an exercise. Number one, make the characters look around using the values inside of self.viewDirections. On top of that, create a timer that changes this direction. I call this one the look around timer, but you could call it whatever you want. After this exercise, you should have characters that look around in random directions and that should make the game feel much better. So pause the video now and see if you can figure this one out. Inside of the character class, I first of all want to create a timer. For that, all the way at the top, we need from timer, import timer. Next up. In the dunder init method of the character, I want to create self.timers. 
This is going to be a dictionary, because in just a bit I want to add a second timer. But for now, I simply want to have the look around timer, which is going to be a timer with a bunch of values. We want to have a duration, auto start, repeat, and a function call once the timer times out. Now the duration is going to be 1500. So the character rotates every 1.5 seconds. Auto start should be set to true. Repeat should also be set to true. And then for the function that we are going to call once this timer times out, I want to get self.randomViewDirection. A method that does not exist right now. So let's create it. I guess we can do it right below. Random view direction without any custom parameters. In there, first of all, we want to check if this character can rotate. So this attribute, if self dot can rotate. If that is the case, we want to update the facing direction, i.e. self dot facing direction is going to be one value of self dot view directions. For that, we can use the choice method that we have to import. All the way at the top, I want from random import choice. And that's more or less all you need to get some rotation. Although you do have to keep in mind that we have to update all of the timers. For that, inside of the update method, before we are doing anything else, we can do for timer in self.timers.values, don't forget to call this one, and then timer.update. That should be it. If I now run main.py and I look at the lady, although I think she can only look left. Ah, no, there you can see she's looking either left or down. So that is working pretty well. Let's have a look at this character. I think she can look in all four directions. And that is working pretty well. Cool. And finally, we have this guy who can only look down. Now, the next question is, is the dialogue thing still working? And yep, that looks good. Although you can see, once the character is starting to talk to us, it is still rotating. That we need to fix. Which is going to happen inside of the raycast method. Once the character has noticed the player, we want to set self.canRotate to false. That way, if I talk to a character again, let's go to the lady at the bottom because she has more rotate options. She's still talking to us, and now she always looks in the player direction. So that is working pretty well. Also, while we are here, I want to incorporate the has noticed attribute. Once the character has noticed the player, self dot has noticed is going to be true. And then we only want to check the raycast if the character hasn't noticed the player yet, i.e., and not self dot has noticed. On occasion I get a bug without this one, where the character kept on looking for the player. But anyway, we are making some pretty good progress. There are just two more things that I want to implement. The first one is, if you look at the game data, you can see that some characters can look around while others cannot look around. For example, character O2 should not be looking around for the player. Or in other words, if the player walks in their line of sight, they shouldn't start to talk to the player. Only the player can talk to them. The way we are going to implement that is we only want to call raycast and move if that condition is true, i.e. if self.characterData and we are looking for look around. Only if that is the case do we want to call these two methods. If I now run all of this, we are getting an error because inside of game data, I call this look underscore around. Let's fix that one really quick. Look underscore around and now main.py. I think this one is character two. And now, even though I'm in her line of sight, we are not getting any kind of dialogue. But if I talk to her, we are still getting the dialogue. But she keeps on rotating. So that we have to fix. I suppose the easiest way of doing that is once we are start talking with the character, this if statement, we want to get the character and then set can underscore rotate to false. 
Or in other words, we are only rotating if this can rotate is true. If I talk to the character, she's pointing at us and she stops the rotation. That looks pretty good. That was the first point. And for the second point, let me run the game again. Imagine that this lady has line of sight and actually wants to talk to the player. If that is the case, I want the player to stop for a little bit, let's say a second, and also have a notice symbol at the top. So the player notices that he was, well, noticed. For that, we have to implement a couple of things. Number one, inside of the entities, I want to work in the player for just a second. And there, I want to create self.noticed, which by default is going to be false. After that, we can work inside of the character. And once the player has been noticed inside of this if statement, I want to get self.player and then set noticed to true. That way we know that the player was noticed. And if that is the case, I want to display an exclamation mark on top of the player. Or rather, if I look at the graphics folder inside of UI, we have a notice graphic. This is what I want to display above the player once the player has been noticed. The easiest way to implement that is inside of the all sprites group. First of all, in there, I want to get self.notice underscore surface, which we get with import image. I want to go up a folder, then I want to go to graphics. In there we have UI, and the graphic I want to import is called notice. After that, basically after we are drawing all of this, I want to add another check. If sprite is equal to player, and player.noticed. In that case, I want to get self.displaySurface and then blit self.noticeSurface. After that, we will need a position. For that, first of all, I want to create a rectangle, which we get with self.noticeSurf and then get underscore F rectangle, where we want to place the mid bottom. The position for this one should be sprite.rect.midtop, which should be the mid top of the player. Remember, the sprite is going to be the player. After that, for the position, I want to get the rectangle, and don't forget, we have to add self.offset for the camera. And with that, we are getting an error. That player is not defined, and that, I believe, happens inside of groups. Ah, there we have the issue. The player at the moment does not exist inside of this draw method. I suppose the easiest way of getting the player is for the one parameter, we don't want the player center, we just want to have the player, i.e. inside of main.py, we are not passing in player.rect.center, we are simply passing in the player itself. And then when we are getting the player center, this would be player.rect.center x. And for player center one, we would simply get player center y. After that, the game does work again. The camera also works, that's a good sign. And now if I walk into the notice radius, we are getting another error. That we are inside of groups, are uh, adding an offset to a rectangle. This should be rect.top left. Next attempt. And there we go. Now we have the exclamation mark, although the character starts walking way too fast, so you can't really see it very well. First of all, I want to create another timer. I call this one notice. It's going to be another timer. The duration for this one is 500, and we want to declare a function, which is going to be self.startMove. The start move we already have. So the idea is, once the raycast triggers, then we want to start the timer. And once the timer triggers out, we are calling start move. Or in other words, we do not want to call start move right away. Instead, we want to get self.timers and notice, and then activate the timer. Also, there should be a comma at the end of this, and that's basically all we have to do. This function is now going to be called after the timer times out, 
And that means if I walk in front of a character, we have to wait half a second for anything to happen. But the rest still works just fine. Although the notice sign doesn't disappear. Not ideal. After the character has walked towards the player, we want to set self.player.noticed back to false. I can walk in front of him again. We have to wait. We are talking. And that looks pretty good. Cool. We can try this again with another character down here. There we go. That looks pretty good. And we are getting dialogue. And with that, we have finished the character dialogue. This was a larger section, but now the game is much more interactive. Another really important part of the game will be a transition system. So for example, we can transition from the overworld to an arena, or we can transition from a dialogue to a battle scene. For that, let's start with a level transition. The basic logic is actually fairly simple. Number one, we are going to fade to a black screen. During this black scene, we are going to delete all of the sprites, and then we are going to rerun self.setup with another tiled map. By the time the player can see the level again, we have a whole new level. Although before we can start with that, we need to get the level transition areas. For that, inside of tiled, let me display all of the objects, and then we have another layer called transition. This one, you have to zoom in a bit, is basically just a layer full of very small areas which are going to be the entrance areas for the doors. For example, this one gets us to the hospital. This one would get us to the house. Or if you look at another one a bit further up, we have the entrance for the arena, this one. All of those transition areas have two custom properties, a position and a target. The target is going to be the tile map we want to load. And the position is the position within the tile map where the player should start. That means inside of main.py, we need to do two things. Number one, inside of the setup method, I want to add another, let's do it below the objects. I want to have my transition objects. Just as before, we will need a for loop with for obj in tmxmap.get layer by name. The layer we want to get is called transition. For this one, we want to have a very specific kind of sprite, one that doesn't exist yet. Which means inside of sprite, I want to collapse all of this and then create a new class, transition sprite, which will inherit from the sprite class. Fundamentally, nothing too complicated is going to happen in here. We want to have self, we want to have a position, we want to have a size, then we will need a target, and we will need groups. Notice for this one, we are not going to load a surface, simply because we don't need to. Those tiles are not going to be visible. We can simply create a surface with pygame.surface right inside of the dunder init method using the size. Next up, we can call super dunder init and pass in the position, the surface, and the groups. On top of that, we want to store the target i.e. the tile map we want to load as an attribute. Self.target is going to be target. That is all we need. Next up, inside of main.py, I want to import the transition sprite as well. With that, inside of the for loop, I want to create a transition sprite for every single one of the objects. Let's copy all of the parameters. We need all of this. Position is fairly simple, obj.x and obj.y. For the size, it's not going to be much more complicated, obj.width and obj.height. Now for the target, we want to have a tuple. That is going to contain both of these properties, i.e. which map we want to load and the starting position of the player. For that, we will need obj properties and we want to get the target and then obj.properties with the position. Nearly done. The last thing we need is the groups and for that I want to have all of those sprites inside of self.transition underscore sprites. This group does not exist yet. So all the way at the top in the dunder init method 
I want to create self.transition sprites, which once again is going to be pygame.sprite.group. Like with collision sprites and character sprites, we are only using this group to identify the transition sprites. That's all it needs to do. Which means, next up, I want to create another method. Although before that, I think we should organize the game class just a bit better. For example, the input along with create dialog and end dialog should all be the dialog system. Under init, import assets and setup is going to be general stuff. After that, I want to have a transition system. I think that organizes the entire thing just a little bit better. Anyway, I first of all want to do a transition underscore check. No need for custom parameters. And really all we want to do in there is first of all check if the player is colliding with any of the transition sprites. Or to be a bit more specific, I want to check if the hitbox of the player collides with any of these areas. I want to store them inside of a sprites variable. And for that, we can use list comprehension. Sprite for sprite in self dot transition sprites if sprite dot rect dot collide rect with self dot player dot hitbox. Or oh, in other words, we are looking at all of the sprites inside of transition sprites and pick the sprites that are colliding with the player hitbox. If there are any sprites, then we want to get the player and block it. Let's check if this is working in the first place, meaning inside of the run method, sometime before we are drawing everything, I want self.transition check. And I think this part could also be a bit better organized. We first of all want to fill the entire surface with a black color, and this could even be all the way at the top. There we have delta time and self.displaySurface.fill. Then we are updating the game. In there, we check input, transition check, and all of the updates. After that, we are doing the drawing, then we're doing the overlays, and then we are updating the screen. That feels much cleaner. Anyway, let's try all of this. And if the player goes to this area, we cannot walk anymore. That is working pretty well. So now we have to work on a transition logic. For that, first of all, we are going to need a few more attributes. I suppose right below the groups, we can add a transition or a screen tint system. First of all, we want to have a transition underscore target, which by default is going to be none. This target we can update right away actually, because once the player is colliding with any of the transition sprites, then we want to set self.transition target to sprite.target. Although we do have to be careful, sprites at the moment is a list and we only want to get the first item of this list, i.e. sprite index zero and then the target. Also, this should be sprites. Next up, we have to work on the tinting logic. First of all, for that, we will need a tint underscore surface, which is simply going to be pygame.surface with the same dimension as the actual window, i.e. the display surface, which means I can copy the window width and window height and paste it in there. I also want to have self.tint mode, which by default is going to be untint. If we are tinting the screen, we're going to black, and if we are untinting it, we're going from black to transparent. After that, we want to have self.tint underscore progress which by default is going to be 255. We want to have self.int underscore direction, which by default will be negative one. And finally, self.int underscore speed, which I have set to 600. That will give us all of the basic attributes that we need. Now we have to implement the system. Although first of all, once the player collides with a transition sprite, we also want to set self.tint mode to tint. With that, we can actually start with the system. I call this method tint underscore screen. This one is going to need self and delta time. We want to check if self.tint mode is equal to tint. 
a value we are setting inside of the transition check. If that is the case, we want to get self.tint progress and increase it by self.tint speed multiplied with delta time. Delta time is really important, so we have the same transition speed regardless of the frame rate. That way, we are increasing the tint progress, although by default it is 255. Let's set it to zero for now. That's going to make debugging a bit easier. I want to use the tint progress to update the transparency of the tint surface. Self.tint surface.set underscore alpha to self.tint progress. In case you haven't used set alpha, all it does is it well sets the alpha value, i.e. the transparency of a surface. And the value goes from zero all the way to 255. At the moment, our tint progress is going to be zero. But because of this line, we are going to increase it. And to actually see it, we will need self.display surface dot blit with self dot tint surface with the starting position being zero and zero. This tint screen we actually have to call, which needs to happen on top of everything else. I did it right below the display update. Self.tint screen. That part is really important because if there's any other element on top of the tinting, it's going to look really weird. Also, don't forget, we need delta time in there. Let's try. And if the player collides with a transition sprite, we are fading out. So this system is more or less working. We just have to add a few more parts to it. Most importantly, we want to check if self.tint progress is greater or equal to 255, i.e. our screen is entirely black. If that is the case, I want to call self.setup again. And remember, for the arguments, we will need a TMX map and a starting position for the player. For the TMX map, I want to get self.tmx maps along with self.transition target. And this one should be zero. For the player starting position, I want to get self.transition target with one. Remember, transition target is simply going to be a tuple. The first value is the map we want to load, and the second value is the player starting position inside of that map. On top of that, we want to set self.tint mode to untint. And also, we want to clear the transition target, i.e. self.transition target is going to be none. Next up, we have to implement the logic for the untinting. I suppose we can do that one all the way at the top. If self.int mode is equal to untint. If that is the case, self.tint progress is going to be minus equal self.int speed multiplied with delta time. Let's try all of that. And now if I get to a door, we are getting a key error. The reason for that is inside of import assets, we only have two TMX maps, world and hospital. Let's try the hospital instead. If I get to this part, we first of all get a huge waiting time and then we're getting a key error. So step by step. The first issue is when we are calling self.untint, the tint progress is actually a really large number. In fact, let me print self.tint progress. If I now run the game, this number becomes increasingly negative. And only once we reach the door, then this number reverses and it becomes larger and larger. But we have to wait for it to become positive for actually something to happen. To fix that, I want to limit self.tint progress to a value between 0 and 255, which we can do by setting self.tint progress. We are using the max function with a floor value. This one would be zero. And the other value would be self.tint progress. With max, we are selecting the larger of the two numbers, i.e. we are never going to go below zero. After that, I want to use the min function for a ceiling. 
via that, we are always going to pick the lower value, which can be 10 progress or 255. With that, we can never go beyond 255 or below zero. Let's try this one. And now we get zero at our lowest value. And if I hit the hospital, we are getting to 255 at the most, not even that. However, then we're getting a key error direction. For that error, we want to look at the character because in there, we are not getting a direction. And that is an error inside of the tile map. If you look at the TMX map that we want to load, for our player starting position, we have a direction and a position. That part is fine. But for the marker 2D for the nurse, we don't have a direction or a radius. Now that we can fix quite easily by adding a property. We need a direction, which should be down by default, and we will need a radius, which can be zero for a nurse. After we have that, I want to run the game again. And now if I go to a hospital, we get, well, we get something. So the issue is we have the hospital, but we also have the arena. And well, that's not ideal. The problem we have is that when we are calling the setup method, we are not getting rid of all of the previous sprites, i.e. we can still see the original overworld, which is going to look incredibly weird. And to fix that, we want to first of all clear the map. All we need to do for that is for group in self dot all sprites, self dot collision sprites, self dot transition sprites, and self dot character sprites. We want to call group dot mt. That way, if I try all of this again, we are only able to see the level, although other than that, we still get collisions. And that is working pretty good. And we can also go back to the overworld. So quite happy with that. Now the issue is if we try to go to another area, we're getting a key error. To fix that, we have to import all of the TMX maps. That is going to happen inside of support.py and let me minimize everything. I want to create a TMX importer, which is going to need a path unpacked. And then we want to create a TMX dictionary, which by default is going to be entirely empty. After that, I want to have the for loop that we have already seen in which I am getting the folder path, the sub folders, and then in this case, the file underscore names. This would be all of the TMX files. In walk with join and the path we are getting from the parameters. After that, we want for file in file names. And I suppose for now, let's simply print what we are getting. That way, inside of main.py, I want to print the return value of TMX importer. For the path, we want to go up a folder, then we want to go to data, and in there we have our maps. If I now run all of this, we are getting all of the TMX maps. Also, we are getting a whole bunch of zeros. That happens because of this print statement that we don't need anymore. So at the moment, we can get all of the names of the TMX maps that we want to import. That we can use to create a new entry inside of the TMX dictionary. I simply want to get the file and then split it wherever we have a dot and then pick the first value. That way we are getting rid of the TMX ending. The value associated is going to be load underscore pygame. The method we have already used inside of the overworld, this one. This we want to reuse and we already have the import statement. I want to create a path via the join method. I want to get the folder path and then the actual file. After that, I can return tmx dictionary. And now if I run main.py again, we are getting a dictionary with all of the tiled maps. That value we want to store inside of the attribute tmx maps. 
I want to cut this part out and then get rid of this entire dictionary and simply use the return value from TMX importer. Feels significantly cleaner. And now that we have that, let's try the game. And if I go into a house, we have a house along with the collisions. And that's kind of all we can do in here. So if I go out again, we are back in the overworld. I can try the hospital again. And this one is also working. We cannot talk to the nurse at the moment, but that we can cover later. Anyway, for now, I think this is looking pretty good. What you can also do at this point is you can take the start position and then drag it, let's say, all the way up here to test the water arena. Don't forget to save. If you now run the code, you can check out the water arena. And there you go. Looks pretty good. We can also leave again. And then we could check out the other arenas. Do that in your own time. And with that, we have finished the entirety of the overworld. Now, in later bits, we have to come back to add some additional parts, like the nurses or the dialogue to battle system. But I think for now, we have a pretty good setup, which means next up, we can actually start working on the monsters. Now that we have the overworld, we can start with the actual monsters. And there are three things we have to cover. The most important part is the actual battle system, and this one will become quite large. Besides that, we have the monster index and we have the evolution system. Now these three systems work kind of independently, so we can approach one at a time. And I think the best way to get started is with the monster index. This one is going to show us what monsters we have and all of their stats, along with their abilities. On top of that, we are also going to create a pretty fancy UI. Although before we can get started with that, there is a bit of groundwork we have to cover. Most importantly, for all of the monsters, there will always be a dedicated monster class that stores the data. In there, we are going to keep the health, the energy, the level, the XP, all of the stats and abilities, and so on. Now, this monster class will never be visible. We are always going to create a dedicated sprite or an animation. For example, in the battle, we have a monster sprite that is connected to the monster class. And inside of the monster index, we simply have to play an animation. Via that system, we can keep all of the stats inside of a class and then simply use them in different parts of the game. Let's start with that part. Here we are in the code, and I do have quite a few tabs open. I don't really need them anymore. We don't need the dialogue. We don't need the timer. We are going to need the game data. We are not going to need the groups, at least for now. We don't need the entities. We are not going to need the sprites, and we are not going to need support. So at the moment, I only have main.py, game data, and settings.py open. Although I do want to create a new Python file, that is going to be monster.py. In there, I want to create a class called monster. No need for inheritance. And also, notice here, we are not using pygame. Since this class is only going to store data, there's nothing we need from pygame for this. I want to create a dunder init method with self, I want to have the name of the monster, and then I want to have the level of the monster. Now the way the system is going to work to get all of the stats and graphics for the monster via the name from game data, we're going to pick one of the monsters. So if you look at monster data, there we have all of the monsters. And if you look at one of those, let's say Charmadillo, there you have all of the stats. For example, this monster has the element fire, and max health, max energy, attack, defense, and so on. There's a bit more data in there. Besides that, we have the abilities. And whenever the monster reaches a level, we're going to unlock an ability. Finally, we have an evolution, although this monster doesn't have one. But if you look at the next one, Finster, there we have an evolution. We're going to get to Gulfin at level 15. So essentially, this is what we are going to import. And then we have the level. That one should be fairly straightforward, and basically what we are going to do later on. Inside of the game data, let's have a look at Chamadillo again, and let's say for now we only care about the health. And this monster has a max health of 27. This is the base health, and that we are going to multiply with the level. For example, if the monster has a level of 10, then we are going to multiply that value with max health, i.e. 27, so the actual health is going to be 270. All of this data we have to store. First of all, I want to have self.name, 
and self.level, which are simply going to be the name and the level. After that, I want to get all of the stats of the monster. First of all, I want to have self.element. This we are going to get from the monster data. So let me import it. All the way at the top, I want from game underscore data import monster data. And then I want to have monster data. I want to use the name of the monster. And then I want to go to stats. And finally, in there, I want to get the element. Besides that, I also want to get all of the base stats, which are going to be gotten in basically the same way. I can copy the last line, and I simply want to get all of the stats. With that, we have a monster with a name, a level, and some stats that we can use right away inside of main.py. First of all, in there, I want from monster import monster. And then inside of the dunder init method, let's do it all the way at the top. I want to create the player monsters, which we can store in a dictionary self.player monsters. We have the first monster, and for that, we need the monster class along with the name of the monster and the level. Let's say the first monster could be Charmadillo at level 30. After that, we have monster number one. This needs to be another monster. For the name for this one, let's go with Triolera and level 29. If I now run the game, we still get the same outcome and I should fix the start position, but at the very least, nothing is breaking. That's a good start. Now, I would recommend to create a few more monsters on your own. If you look at game data, you can find all of the available monster names. In my case, I can simply copy it in where we have a whole bunch more monsters. Also, it's really important to keep an integer as the key. That way we can sort the actual monsters. That will become important very soon. Anyway, at this point, we have a bunch of monsters, so we can start with the actual index. For that, I want to create a new Python file and save it as monster underscore index. Don't forget .py, and in there, we need from settings and import everything. Then we can create a class I call this one monster index. No need for inheritance, but inside of the dunder init method, we will need self, we will need the monsters, and then we are going to need some fonts for now. After that, we want to create self.display underscore surface, which we're getting from pygame.display.get underscore surface. Next up, we have to store the font as an attribute. Self.font is going to be the font. Oh, and actually this should be self.fonts, because we are going to have quite a few different ones. In fact, inside of main.py, when we are importing the assets, we want to import a few more. I suppose we can do all of the ones that we are going to need for the rest of this tutorial. Just duplicate the line. Besides dialog, we want to have a regular font, which is going to have the same file path. The only difference is that the font size is going to be 18. We can duplicate this one more time. Next up, I want to have a small font. And this one, same font again, except now the font size is going to be 14. And finally, I want to have a bold font. And this one is going to get a different font. This one is called Dogica Pixel bold.ttf. And the font size is going to be 20. Let's try to run all of this, and we are getting an error. Probably because I have a typo in there somewhere. Let's double check. Inside of our graphics font folder, we have Dogica Pixel Bold, so I think the spelling is correct. Although the file type is wrong, this one is an open type font file which means the ending is going to be .otf. Let's try this again, and there we go. The game is running again. Now that we have that, we can minimize this method, and then inside of dunder init, all the way at the bottom, I want to create the overlays. So in there, we are going to have the monster index and the battle system, along with the evolution system. In fact, the dialog tree could also be in there, because it's technically an overlay. 
I want to have a self.monster underscore index for which we are going to need the monster index class that we are not importing at the moment. Let's do it below here from monster underscore index. I want to import the monster index. After that, we have to pass in, I believe it was two arguments. We need the monsters and the fonts. Monsters are going to be self.player monsters. And the fonts are going to be self.fonts, the thing we have just imported, those ones. Let's try to run all of this. The game doesn't crash. That's a good start. So with that, we can start drawing the actual monster index. For that, first of all, I want to create an update method with self and delta time. Delta time, in case you're wondering, is what we're going to need for the animation. Inside of this method, there are four things that we want to do. Number one, we want to get input. Number two, we want to tint the main game so that we have a bit more of a separation between the game and the monster index. After that, we want to display the list. And finally, we want to display the main section. Just to explain the last two bits, if this is our window, our monster index is going to look something like this. On the left side, we are going to have a list of all of the monsters. And this one is scrollable. So if the player presses up or down, we can select one of the monsters. And then on the right side, we have the actual information with the monster on top, all of the stats, and then all of the abilities. And when I say tinting the game, I am talking about tinting the entire rest of the screen. And input is, well, input. And I think the easiest thing to get started is with the tint screen. That we can do in the Dunder init method. I want to create a tint surface section, and in there, I want to have self.tint underscore surface. This is going to be just another surface, so pygame.surface, with the same size as the original display surface i.e. from settings, I can copy the window width and the window height and then add them in there as a tuple. The color of the surface we don't have to change because we want this thing to be black, but we do want to change the tint surface alpha. That we do with set underscore alpha and for the value in here, I went with 200. Once we have that, all we need to do inside of the update method is call self.displaySurface. Blit. We want to blit the tint surface at position 0 and 0. That way we cover the entirety of the window. After that, inside of main.py, in the run method, let me get rid of the white space. Inside of the overlays, we want to add another section if self.monster index. Then we want to run self.monster index update with delta time. If I now run the game, we can see we are tinting the entire screen. So this is definitely working. Now, obviously we don't want to display the monster index all the time. For that, we have to work with the input method inside of main.py. At the moment, we are only checking if the player is talking to another character. Besides that, I also want to check if keys and pygame.k underscore return. That is the enter key. If that one is pressed, we want to display the monster index. And there are basically two ways of approaching this. Either inside of the Dunder init method, you could set none for the monster index. And then as soon as the player presses this button, we are creating a new monster index. Very similar compared to what we have done with the dialogue. Although that's a bit overkill. Since the monster index doesn't have to change that much, we can approach this in another way that is a bit easier. I want to create another attribute self.index underscore open, which by default is going to be false. And then inside of the run method, instead of checking if the monster index class exists, I want to check if self.index open, and only if that is the case, I want to run the update method on this monster index. 
After that, whenever we are pressing k return, I want to toggle self dot index open, which you can do by setting it to what it is not, i.e. not self dot index open. With a boolean value, we are always going to get the opposite value, i.e. true becomes false and false becomes true. And if I now press enter, we can toggle the overlay. That is working pretty well. Now the issue is, while the monster index is open, we can still walk around, which is going to look really weird. To fix that, all we have to do is get our self.player.locked and set it to what it currently is not, i.e. not self.player.locked. That way, in the overworld, I can run around. If I press enter, we get the overlay. I cannot walk around anymore. And if I press enter again, we can walk around once more. Cool, this part is working. That covers the first part. Now we have a background tinting. Now we can work on the actual monster index. And first of all, I want to set the dimensions. That we are going to do via self.main underscore rectangle which is simply going to be pygame.f rectangle, where we are setting a left side, a top side, a width, and a height. Now, the left and top doesn't actually matter, so I can set those to zero and zero. For the width, I want to get window width and then multiply this with 0 0.6, i.e. we're getting 60% of the window width. For the height, I want to get the window and then multiply this with 0 0.8. Or in other words, we're getting 80% of the available window height. Now this rectangle has to be moved to the center. And at the moment, we are always placing the top left. And I am too lazy to calculate the proper position for the top left to center this rectangle. But fortunately, I don't have to do that. I can simply use the move underscore to method and then set center to window width over two and window height over two. Although all of this needs to be a tuple. With that, we're getting the main rectangle in the center of the window. Let's try that part actually. I want to run pygame.draw.rectangle on self.display surface. The color doesn't really matter. Let's go with black. And then we want to draw self.main rectangle. Inside of main.py, if I press enter, we can see the available area for the monster index, and that looks pretty good. And if you want to have different dimensions, go with it. You can choose whatever you like in here. Next up, I want to work on the actual list, i.e. we're going to start by displaying the list of all of the available monsters. For that, actually, we're going to need all of the monsters as an attribute. Let's do that at the top. Self.monsters is going to be monsters. After that, we can work on the list. And there are quite a few attributes that we need to get. I want to get self.visible underscore items, which I have set to six, i.e. how many monsters do we want to display at any point in time? Besides that, we want to have self.list underscore width. This number we're going to get from self.mainrectangle.width and I want this thing to be one third of the entire available width of the main rectangle. Although once again, these numbers can be subjective, so just choose later on what you think looks best. After that, I want to get another attribute, self.item underscore height, which is going to be self.mainrect.height divided by self.visible items. The way you want to think about that is if this is our entire monster index, the thing we are setting with main rectangle. On this thing, we want to create a list roughly on the left side. The width of this thing we are setting with list width. And then the item height is going to be the item height of all of the items in there. And I think that's all we need for now. So next up, we can work on, let's call this method display underscore list. No need for custom parameters. And in there, we want to get for index and monster in self.monsters.items. Remember, 
monsters is a dictionary that we have created earlier, this one. I.e. the index is going to be zero and then the monster is going to be all of this for the first for loop. And that continues until we get all of the monsters. Most importantly in there, we want to create an item rectangle, which we create with pygame.frect, where we have to set a left, a top, a width, and a height, like we have done for the main rectangle. Width is going to be self.list width, and the height is going to be self.item height. Left is also going to be super easy. This is simply going to be self dot main rectangle dot left. The only thing that gets a bit more complicated will be the top argument. Because of that, I want to store this in a separate variable. Imagine we have our list and on this thing, we want to have a whole bunch of entries. For each of those, we have specified one rectangle, which means we get a height, we get a width, we are getting a starting position, that's the left side, and the only thing that's left to cover is the top side. Now, we always want to start at the top of the main rectangle, the one we have to find earlier. But then for each individual item, we want to go a bit further down to actually get a list, which essentially means we do want to start at self.mainrect.top. But to that, we want to add the index that we are getting from the for loop, and this we want to multiply with self dot item height. That way on the first for loop, index is going to be zero, i.e. we stick to this top side. However, if the index goes to one, then we are adding one times the item height, i.e. we are moving down by the height of one item, and we are getting the top of the next item. That's basically all that's happening in here. After we have that, we want to draw the result. Pygame.draw.rectangle, self.displaySurface, the color should be red so we can see something, and then the item rectangle. After that, inside of update, I can get rid of the display list comment and instead self.displayList. If I now try main.py, I can press enter, and we are getting something. Now this is very difficult to see because all of the items have the same background color, but essentially we get one of those items here, we get another item there, another item down there, and so on. In total, we are going to see six items that cover the height of the main rectangle. But after that, we are continuing because the player has more than six monsters. In fact, at least for now, if we keep the monster size to six, this should actually work perfectly. And there we go. This is looking a bit cleaner. Now, later on, we're going to account for more monsters. So I do want to keep them in there. But at least at the moment, we know this is working on the basic level. And I suppose to make sure we can see things just a bit better, I want to create a text surface, which is going to be for the name of the monster. For that, I want to get self.fonts and I want to get the regular font. This I want to render with monster.name. Anti-alias should be false and for the text color, for now I want to use colors and the white color. So inside of settings, then we have a white color. For this text surface, we are also going to need a text rectangle text surface dot get underscore f rectangle. I want to place the mid left. And this point should be the item rectangle dot mid left as well. If this is the entire list, we have currently one item rectangle. This one here. And the text should be, let's say roughly here. For that, I want to place the mid left of the text to the mid left of the entire item rectangle. And in just a bit, we can add a bit of an offset to the right. First of all, though, I want self.displaySurface.lit with the text surface and the text rectangle. Let's try all of that. If I now press enter, we are getting all of the monster names, and that is looking much better. 
And to add just a bit of offset, I want to add a vector with 90 and zero. That way, if I remain that pi again, we are moving quite a bit further to the right. And later on to the left of the name, we have a monster icon for every single monster. In fact, if you look at the graphics folder, there we have icons, and this is going to contain all of the monster icons we want to display next to the name. That is a part we could do right now, actually. This could be an exercise. I want you guys to import all of the monster icons and then display the appropriate one next to the monster name. Pause the video now and see if you can figure this one out. <clears throat> to get started, we have to work inside of import assets because we have to import all of the monster icons. And to keep all of that a bit better organized, I want to create another dictionary. I call this one the monster underscore frames, which is going to be another dictionary that works basically like the overworld frames. First of all, in there, I want to have all of the icons. And to import those, we need our support file again, meaning I want to open support.py, and in there, we want to use one of those functions to import all of the icon surfaces. And what is really important is that we want to keep the name of all of these graphics. And for that, import folder dictionary is the best one, because this one imports all of the graphics and then keeps the name. So we are going to get a dictionary with the name and the graphic. I want to import a folder dictionary and the folder path is going to be a folder up. I want to go to graphics, then I want to go to icons and that's the folder I want to import. Then I can print self.monster frames and icons to see what we get. If I now run all of this, we are getting a dictionary with the name of the file along with a surface. That means next up, when we are creating the monster index, I also want to pass in self.monster frames. We don't need support.py anymore. And inside of monster index, I want to have the monster frames. From that, let me add another section with the frames. For now, I simply want to get self.icon underscore frames, which is going to be the monster frames. And I want to get the icons. After that, inside of display list, I want to create an icon surface which is going to be self.iconframes with the monster name. Next up, I want to create an item rectangle, which is going to be icon surface and then get f rectangle. For this one, I want to place the center. Once again, I want to get the item rectangle dot mid left. And to that, I want to add a vector with 45 and zero to give it just a bit of an offset. Since the offset for the text is 90, this 45 is going to be right in the middle between the left side of the main container and the left side of the text. The last thing we have to do is self.displaySurface.blit with icon surface and icon rectangle. Let's try main.py and there we go. We can see all of the monsters and if we had a better background color, this wouldn't look entirely terrible. So instead of using the red color, I want to get the colors and the color that I actually want to use is going to be gray. Next attempt. And that is already feeling significantly better. And while we are here, we should also get rid of the overlap, i.e. monsters that are not inside of the main rectangle should not be displayed. Which is actually fairly simple. We only want to draw an item if it is inside of the main rectangle, which we can check with if item rectangle dot collide rect with self dot main rectangle. Only if that is the case, do we want to do all of that? Let's try this again. And there we go. Now we can only see six of the monsters. Although the issue at the moment is that none of this is interactive. For that, we have to get some input i.e. define input. No need for custom parameters. And then there, as usual, we want to get all of the keys with pygame.key and get underscore just underscore 
rest. At the moment, there are only two keys that I care about. pygame.k underscore up. And I care about pygame.k underscore down. So what do we actually want to do inside of them? And well, we want to get an index and either increase it or decrease it. If we are pressing up, we want to decrease it by one. And if we are pressing down, we want to increase it by one. Now this index doesn't exist right now. I suppose let's create it in the list section. Self dot index is going to be zero by default. And with that, we can update an index and increase it or decrease it. Although first of all, for that, we have to call self dot input. And just to make sure that this is working, let me print self dot index. If I now run main.py, I open the index and we are getting a number that's increasing or decreasing. So that's pretty good. That's a good start with that. We don't need a print statement anymore. And next up, there's one more thing that I really have to do inside of input. And that is self dot index is going to be self dot index modulus and the length of self dot monsters. Very soon, we are going to change the color of one of these rectangles depending on their index. And for that purpose, the index from the input cannot be greater than that number. But that's all we need from input. So next up, we have to figure out, and let me draw this. Imagine we have a list with, at the moment, a random number of entries. Let's say three for now. They would all have the index that we are getting from the index in the for loop, i.e. we would have zero, one, and two. Besides that, we also have the index that we are getting from the input. If those two numbers are the same, i.e. the input index and the rectangle index are the same, then we want to change the color of this current rectangle. That way it looks like it's selected. For that, I want to add a section that I called colors. We want to have a custom BG color and later on, we also want to have a text color. I suppose the text color we can keep white for now. Let me paste it in there. And then when we are rendering the text, we want to have the text color. For the BG color though, right now we are using the gray color. So let me copy it in there and then use the BG color when we are drawing the rectangle. However, this color we only want to get if the current index is different from the input index, i.e. we want to get gray if self.index is different from index. And the name here might not be perfect, but just to make sure you understand, this index refers to the for loop index, while the self.index refers to the input index that's part of the class. However, if that is not the case, so else, then we can get a different color. And I want to copy this one. The color I want to use is called light. And that should already do something. If I now open the menu and there we go, we can see that we have at least some basic ability to select a monster. Now this isn't perfect yet. And if I go too far down, the thing disappears. That happens because further down there, we have a few more monsters, but those we cannot see. That's gonna be the next issue we will fix. But for now, this is working reasonably well. So next up then, imagine this is the entire index or in other words, this is the main rectangle, the one we have been using throughout. On the left side of this thing, we have a list and this list contains a whole bunch of entries. On top of that, we have a few more entries at the bottom. At the moment, I believe there are two extra ones. As a consequence, when we are trying to get the color and we exceed this point, we are highlighting either this or this monster. But since those aren't visible, it doesn't really do anything. Now to fix that issue, basically, if the index goes too far down, we want to lift up the entire list, or rather we want to lift up every single rectangle. And for that, we are going to create a V offset that by default is going to be zero. 
However, when we are getting the top side of each of the rectangles, we want to add this V offset. So at the moment, this is not going to do anything. If I run all of this, no change. However, if I set the V offset to, let's say, 200, and I run all of this again, we are now drawing every element 200 pixels further down. However, if I make this number negative, let's say negative 100, and I run this again, we are now able to see a few more elements at the bottom. Which means we have to make this V offset relative to the index. I.e. if we go too far down, we want to make this offset negative. Or in other words, by default, this value should be zero. But only if self.index is smaller than self.visibleItems. If that is not the case, else, let's say for now, negative 100, just to see what happens. So if I now run main.py again in the menu, I can move around just as before. But if I go a bit further down, we are now moving the entire list up. And that's a good start, and we can also reset it, but this needs to be a bit more fine-tuned. The way you want to approach this problem, we once again have the list at the moment with six entries. On top of that, we are also checking if our V offset is below that point. So our index would be further down here. If that is the case, we want to move the entire thing up by the height of one of those rectangles. Which means, first of all, we have to understand how many indexes we are below that list. That number we can get, and I want to put this in parentheses right away, self.index minus self.visibleItems. And also, this number needs to be negative. All of that, we want to multiply with self.item height. Let's try that. And now, if I go a bit further down, this is almost working. So we have to go two steps further down for this to work. Which means all we really have to do is to this number, add a plus one, and then this should be working. And that is looking pretty good. Now we have a nice drop-down menu that works just fine. That covers the basic part of the list, but there's one really important functionality that I also want to cover. And that is that the player can rearrange all of the monsters. When a battle starts, we are always going to select the first three monsters. And the player should be able to choose what those are. To implement that, we want to look at the input. First of all, we want to check for another input. If keys and pygame.k underscore space, then we want to select one of the monsters. For that, I want to create another attribute that we can put right below the index. I want to have self.selected index, which by default is going to be none. Basically, as soon as we are selecting a monster, we are selecting the index of that monster. And by default, this value shouldn't exist. That value we can use because first of all, we want to check if not self.selected index, i.e. at the moment, we have not selected anything. If that is the case, self.selected index should simply be self.index. That value, by the way, we can use right away because when we are displaying the list, if a monster is selected, we want to highlight it, which we can do by changing the text color. So by default, the text color should be white, but only if self.selected index is different from the index of the monster. If that is not the case, so else, then I want to get colors and get the gold color. Let's try all of that. If I open the index and select the first monster by pressing space, we get a gold color. So that is working really well. That means we can check the else statement. And I should explain. The basic system is going, or in other words, we have a selected index. Then we want to switch those two monsters. However, if we are pressing space and a monster has been selected, for that, we first of all want to get the selected monster, which is going to be self.monsters with self.selected index. And notice here, we are getting the actual monster. 
on top of that, we want to get the current monster, which is going to be self.monsters with self.index. Once we have those two monsters, we can assign them to the new index, i.e. self.monsters self.index is going to be the selected monster. Then I can duplicate all of this because self.selectedIndex should be the current monster. And finally, self.selectedIndex should go back to being none. So inside of the game, I can select a monster and then select another monster. And this didn't work. Although if I now click on the first monster again, they do switch. So logic does work, but something else has gone wrong. And I think I know why. The issue is this if statement. This one is going to trigger as soon as we have one selected monster, but that's not exactly what I want. Instead, I want to have if selected index is different from none. If that is the case, I want to get all of this with the else statement covering the monster being selected for the first time. Let's try this one now. And if I select a monster and another monster, they switch places. So this system is working much better. And I suppose I should go through all of this one more time. Imagine we have a list with a few entries. They all have an index 0, 1, 2, and 3. If the player presses space on one of them, we are getting a selected index. Let's say this one could be 0. That way we are selecting the first monster. After that, if the player presses space again, we are triggering this if statement. And let's say this happens on index 2. If that is the case, we are first getting the monsters we have selected, i.e. the selected monster and then the monster we currently have targeted. After we have that, we are simply switching them around. Or in other words, we are simply overwriting the indexes. And after that, we are getting rid of selected index and then we are done. That covers the input. There's just one more thing that I really want to do for the list. Actually, two things I want to do for the list. The first one is going to be rounded corners. If you look at this thing again, it doesn't look amazing. And the big reason for that are the really sharp corners, which usually do not look great. Those we can fix inside of the drawing logic. Let me add another comment. Check for nurse. So what we want to check in here is if this is the entire main rectangle, we have to check if an item rectangle is in the top left or in the bottom left. If either of those is the case, we want to have one rounded corner, either here or here. Which means we want to check if item rectangle.collide point. And the point we want to check is self.mainrectangle.topLeft. Or in other words, if the top left of the main rectangle collides with our current rectangle, we know we are in the top left. If that is the case, we want pygame.draw.rectangle self.displaySurface BG color item rectangle. So all the stuff we have done already. But then we want to set a corner radius that is going to be 0, 0, and 12. And the logic for the drawing of the other rectangles, we can put it in an else statement. Although the text and the icon need to be always visible. So let's add a bit of white space. If I now run main.py, we are getting a rounded corner in the top left. Now, this isn't perfect because we are also drawing the entire background main rectangle which we don't actually have to do. So let's try this again. And that is looking much better. So next up, I want to have an L if statement that checks if item rectangle dot collide point with self dot main rectangle bottom left. Although to this one, I want to add a very minor offset of one and negative one i.e. we're going one pixel to the right and one pixel up. Sometimes the bottom left wouldn't be properly detected by collide point. I don't know exactly why, but it happened fairly consistently. And if we add a minor vector offset, this problem disappears entirely. So once we have that, we want to draw a rectangle with a different corner radius. This one is going to get four 
zeros, then a 12, and then another zero. So let's try this one again. And there we go. If you now look at the bottom left, we are getting a rounded corner, and this one always seems to be working just fine. Now, in case you're wondering what arguments you need for all of this, if you look at the documentation for Pygame and you look at draw.rectangle, you can see that we have a whole bunch of border radii where you can, for example, set the top right radius, the bottom left radius, the bottom right radius, and so on. These numbers can be a bit confusing, especially early on. It even took me a few minutes to get this one right. With that, we have rounded corners. There's just one more thing that I would like to add, and that is, let me run all of this again, actually. In just a bit, we're going to draw a whole extra thing to the right. Something like this. And to separate these two areas, I want to add a very minor shadow down here. So it looks like that all of these elements are a bit in the background. Now in practice, all that we are going to do is we are going to draw a semi-transparent surface down here, and then we can call it a day. Which means all the way at the end. And this one should be outside of this for loop. Let me minimize the for loop actually. We want to draw a shadow, for which we're going to need a shadow surface, first of all, pygame.surface. Then we will need a width and a height. For the width, I simply went with four pixels, and the height is going to be self.mainRectangle.height. And then we want to get self.displaySurface.lit, where we are blitting the shadow surface in a certain position for which we are going to need an X and a Y point. Now Y is pretty simple, self.mainRect.top. For X, we are going to get self.mainRect.left, and to that, we want to add self.listWidth. Also, don't forget to subtract 4 to actually show the shadow surface. Actually, let me run the entire thing without it. If I now run main.py, we have a thing to the right of the list. And to get it to the right border of the list, we want to subtract four or the width of the surface, and there we go. Now it's on top of all of the other items. That, however, isn't terribly visible because this shadow surface doesn't have a transparency, which we can change with shadow surface and set alpha, and then set some kind of value. Let's go with 100. And if I now run main.py, that is looking quite nice. Later on, once we have the other part of the index, you can customize this, but I think for now, this is working reasonably well. Cool, that covers the first part of the index. Although there's one thing that I forgot. If you run main.py again, there should be a whole bunch of lines separating all of these monsters, stuff like this. And that part could actually be a fairly interesting exercise. Or in other words, try to draw lines between the monster entries. The colors for now don't really matter. Simply choose something that works. What is really important is that you understand the positioning. So pause the video now and see how far you get. <clears throat> to get started, I want to minimize the for loop and then add another section for the lines. First of all, we are going to need another for loop. Let's call it for i in range. And this one is going to be self.visibleItems. Inside of there, we want to go with pygame.draw.line, for which we're going to need a surface, self.displaySurface. And then we are going to need a color, which we can get from colors. And the one I want to choose is called light gray. Finally, we need a start point and an endpoint. To get those points, we essentially need three numbers, the Y position, the left side, and the right side. Now the left side is going to be really simple, self.mainRect.left. And the right side is going to be self.mainRect.left plus self.listWidth. That way we are defining the left and the right side. Now, we just have to figure out the actual Y position. Now, this one also isn't terribly difficult. Self.mainRect.top plus self.item height 
multiplied by i, the value we're getting from the for loop. And with that, we have the three points that we need. So for the start value, I need x and y. The start point is always going to be the left side, and y is going to be the value we have just created. Then for the end point, we want to get the right side and keep the same y. The line we are going to draw is going to be horizontal, so one point here is totally fine. Let's try all of this, and there we go. We have a line separating all of the monsters. And this one also updates with the movement, so this is looking pretty good. However, there's one thing that is going to mess this one up a bit. If we don't have enough monsters to fill the entire list, let's say we only have three monsters in total. If I now run this again, we are drawing way too many lines, which is going to look really weird. To fix that, inside of the for loop, we want to look for the smaller number between the visible items and the length of self dot monsters. If we are doing that, we are only drawing two lines. So that is working pretty well. Now we are still drawing the entirety of the shadow and I think that part is fine. I suppose once we have the other elements, we can look at this one again, but I think it's not going to be an issue. Anyway, with that, I can uncomment the other monsters and we have the list part of the index. Next up, we have to work on the monster display. So for that one, we don't need display list anymore. Instead, I want to define display underscore main. In there, we are going to need delta time because we will have a monster animation in just a bit. First of all, we want to create the main background. For that, we will need another rectangle, which is going to be pygame.f rectangle with the usual arguments, left, top, width, and height. Left is going to be self.mainrect.left plus self.list width. If this is the entire main rectangle, we want to have a list on the side with the list width being defined by the attribute. This is the part we already have. And what we want to do now is to create or rather cover the entire rest of the main rectangle. At the moment, we have the left side, which is going to be this line. For the top, we want to have this line and then all of this for the width and all of this for the height. Should be fairly straightforward. Top is simply going to be self.mainrect.top. The width is going to be self.mainrect.width minus self.listwidth and the height is going to be self.mainrect.height. Now I am running a little bit out of space, but this is still doable. It's not terribly complicated, or at least I hope it isn't. Let's actually draw this with pygame.draw.rectangle where we want to draw on the display surface. The color is going to be from colors and we want to get the dark color. And we want to draw the rectangle. After that, inside of update, self.display main with delta time. Let's try main.py. And if I open this, we have something that looks not too bad. Although we are going to need a corner radius up here and down here. For that, we have to add a few more arguments. It's going to be 0, 12, 0, 12, and 0. With that, inside of main.py, we are getting rounded corners. That is looking pretty good. Next up, we can work on the monster display. I suppose to give a bit more context, I want to separate this area broadly into two bits. At the top, we want to have one rectangle that displays the monster in the middle. That's the part we are going to work on for now. After that, we have all of the stats down here. And at the end, we're going to add the abilities in the bottom right. For all of this, I want to create another rectangle. I call this one the top rectangle, which once again is going to be pygame.f rectangle. For this one, we have to specify as always left, top, width, and height. Or to keep this a bit more concise, we want to specify a position and a size. This is a bit easier because I want to get the rect.top left for the top left of this rectangle. If this is the entire main rectangle, we are currently working inside of this part that we defined via the rectangle. In there, 
we want to create a top rectangle that is covering roughly this area. At the moment, we have specified the starting position, the top left, which can be the same as the rectangle. After that, we need the size, which needs to have the same width as the rectangle and some fraction of the height. In either case, this has to be a tuple. Width for the, well, width. And then for the height, I want to get rect.height and multiply it with 0 0.4. This we want to draw right away, pygame.draw.rect. On self.display surface, let's say for now with a red color, and then we want to get the top rectangle. Keep in mind though, we are still going to need the corner radius. For that, we need 0, 0, 0, and 12. Let's run main.py. And then we can see we have a top rectangle and everything else still works just fine. That's a good start, but we need a bit more information. Basically, for every monster element, I want to have an appropriate color. In other words, if you look at settings, there we have, for example, a color for plant, a color for water, and a color for fire. And this we want to use for the background of the monster. For that, we first of all need an actual monster, and that I want to do all the way at the top of display main. Let's call this part data. All I really care about in here is the monster itself, which we are getting from self.monsters and then self.index. Self.monsters, as a reminder, is simply going to be this. And our index is a number in there. Meaning via this, we are getting our currently selected monster. After we have that, we can use the colors and then get monster.element. That is the element we have created earlier that is simply going to be fire, water, or plant, which is going to be the same key that we are using in the colors dictionary. So this should already be working. If I open the thing, then we are getting the different elements. So that is working pretty well. Now after that, we have to display an actual monster animation, which at the moment we cannot do because we have not imported the monster surfaces themselves. So inside of the project folder, we want to go to graphics and in there we have all of the monsters. This is what we want to import. And just to open one of them, let's go with this one. We always have a tile set with eight parts, where the top bit is an idle animation, with the bottom one being the attack animation. And to import all of that, we want to reopen our support.py file. Support.py. And there, we want to create another function. Let's put it just above the game functions. I want to have a monster importer which is going to need the amount of columns, the amount of rows, and then a path that we are unpacking. After that, I want to create a monster dictionary that is going to be empty for now. For the setup of this dictionary, I want to have key value pairs where a key would be a monster. The associated value is going to be another dictionary in which we have the attack key along with a list of surfaces. And then we also have an idle entry with another list of surfaces. That's what we want to create, although by default, this thing should be empty. Now, just as before, we want to have for folder path, subfolders, and image names in walk join and the path unpacked. In there, we want to look at all of the images, i.e. for image in image names. And for now, let's simply print what we get. I want to print the image. After that, inside of main.py, when we are importing all of the assets inside of monster frames, I want to create another entry for all of the actual monsters. For this one, we want to have the monster importer. The folder path is going to be one folder up, then we are going to graphics, and in there we have the monsters. Let's run the entire game and we cannot see anything. And I believe the issue is that when we are creating monster importer, we have columns, rows, and then a path. But when I'm calling the function, we are only specifying a path. To fix that, we have four columns and two rows, and then we have the path. Let's try this again. And now we are getting all of the file names, and those are all of our monsters.
that feels much better. First of all, then, we want to have an image underscore name, which is simply going to be image dot split. We want to split this wherever we have a dot, and then pick the first item. That we can use right away inside of the monster dictionary to create a new key value pair, where the key is the image name, and the associated value is an empty dictionary. After that, we need the actual import, and we want to separate all of the images, which we have already done by using import tile map, which means for every single one of the monsters, we want to create a new frame dictionary, which we get from import tile map, where we are passing through the columns and the rows, along with a file path that we are getting from the path along with the image name. And just to make sure that you are still following along, I want to print the monster dictionary and I want to print the frame dictionary. If we now run main.py, nothing crashes, good start. And then we are getting a whole bunch of data. First of all, we are always getting the monster along with an empty dictionary, that part's easy. After that, we're getting the return value from import tile map. The way this one is going to work is we have a column and a row or X and Y along with a surface for this part, which means we simply have to go through all of the keys and then sort all of these surfaces by their rows. And as a reminder, the first row is going to be the idle animation and the second row is going to be the attack animation. Or in other words, I want for key and row in enumerate for the list idle, and attack. That way, for all of the monsters, I'm going to get a key along with a row. Just to make sure you see what we are getting, we are always getting zero for idle and one for attack. Once we have that, I simply want to get the monster dictionary, then the image name, and then create a new key. The associated value for this key is going to be a list of values that we are getting via list comprehension. Since we already have the row, we have to get the column, i.e. call for call in range false. That would give us a number from zero to three or whatever our columns is. That we can use with the frame dictionary, the one we have just created. This one we can access via list comprehension with a tuple that has X and Y or column and row to be a bit more specific which are the values we are already getting either via list comprehension or via the for loop. And that's basically all we had to do. If I now go back to main.py and after we are doing the import, I want to print self.monster frames with the monsters. Let's run main.py and after a second of loading, we are getting an error that we cannot find a certain key. And you can see what the issue here is at the moment. We have a frame dictionary and we try to get one value. The value Python currently sees is zero and idle, which does not exist inside of this dictionary. Now the issue here is that I simply switched around these two values. The row is what we're getting from enumerate, so this one should be zero or one. And then the actual name for the dictionary is going to be the D, the one that we're getting from the tuple. If we are now trying all of this again, it should work and we are getting none. That's a very easy thing to fix. It simply happens because we are not returning anything from the monster importer, meaning we want to return the monster dictionary and next attempt, now we are getting something. And once again, massive amount of data, but first of all, we have the monster, then we have a dictionary with idle, there we have a bunch of surfaces, and then we have an attack animation, which once again is another bunch of surfaces. That looks pretty good. So now we don't need the print statement anymore. Instead, we have to work inside of monster index. Also, we don't need support.py anymore. Next up, I want to do the monster animation. For this one, first of all, we're going to need a monster underscore surface, for which we have to do a bit more inside of the dunder init method. At the moment, we only really have the icon frames. Besides that, I want to have self.monster underscore frames, which we can get from monster frames, although from this thing, we only want to get the monsters, the key we have specified here. 
After that, to get the actual monster surface, we want to get monster brains and then pick a key. Now that key is going to be a name, which we have inside of the monster, there we have a name. Which means we want to get our current monster and then a name. Although at the moment the return value for this one would be another dictionary, where we have the attack or the idle frames. Now in my case, I only want to get the idle frames and just for now to test things, I want to get the first item. That way we have one surface. And just to print that this is working, let's print the monster surface. If I now try made of pie, we have to wait a second and I can run this and I always have one surface printed out. Next up, I want to create a monster rectangle, which is simply going to be the monster surface and then get f rectangle, where we want to place the center and the target position should be the top rect dot center. Finally, all we have to do is self dot display surface dot blit with the monster surface and the monster rectangle. Let's try made of pi. And in the menu, we can now see all of the monsters. That's coming together quite well. Although it could look better by animating all of this. For that, first of all, we are going to need a frame index. I suppose we could put that one all the way at the top, self.frame underscore index, which by default is going to be zero. After that, we don't need a dunder init method anymore. We want to increase self.frame index, i.e. plus equals some kind of animation speed. Ideally the one we are getting from settings. So plus equal animation speed multiplied with delta time. Using this frame index, we then want to pick one of the surfaces from the idle frames. I.e. in there, we want to get integer self.frame index. That way we would get different frames, although we would run out of frames really quickly. To fix that, we want to get modulus, the length of self monster frames. We want to look at monster.name and then at the idle frames. Arguably this line is getting a bit long, but the ultimate logic isn't too difficult. We have seen all of this for the entities already, so I hope it's not too confusing. But anyway, let's try main.py. And we are getting an animation. Not an amazing one, but it definitely makes the entire thing feel much better. That means next up, we can add some text to all of this. First of all, I want to display the monster name for which we are going to need a name surface, which we get with self.fonts. We want to have the bold font and this we want to render. The text we want to display is going to be monster.name and the alias should be false and colors should be colors and the white color. Then we are going to need name.rectangle, which will be the name surface get f rectangle. I want to place the top left to the top rect top left, i.e. we are placing the name all the way in the top left of the top rectangle. And for that, we are also not going to need a tuple, but I do want to add a vector for an offset. I want to move the name 10 pixels to the right and 10 pixels down. After that, self dot display surface dot lit name surface and name rectangle. Let's try main.py and then we are getting the name of the monster. That's looking pretty good. After that, we can work on the level, for which we can do something fairly similar compared to the name. I.e., let me copy all of this, but I do want to change the name to level, like so. After that, for the font, I want to have the regular font and the thing we want to render will be an F string into which we are entering monster.level. And the alias and colors can stay the same though. For the positioning, we want to get the bottom left and then place it in the top rect dot bottom left plus the vector 10 and negative 10. If I now run main.py, you can see that we have the level in the bottom left. Although that is a bit sparse, so I think what we could be adding is something like level and 
then this should be a bit more explanatory. That feels nice. There's one more really easy thing that we can add. For that, I want to copy all of this text one more time because I want to display the element. And this element should be in the bottom right of the top rec container. Once again, I want to replace the level in all of these lines with element. For the font, we can stick with regular. For the text that we want to display, we simply want to get monster.element. Color can stay white, this one is totally fine. After that, for the position, since we want to be in the bottom right, the point that we want to place will be the bottom right. Then we want to get the top rect and the bottom right and give this thing an offset of vector negative 10 and negative 10. Let's try all of that. And the game doesn't crash and we get the element. So with that, we are displaying a whole bunch of text. But there's one more thing that I want to do for the level. And that should be an XP bar. Or in other words, let's do this in the game right away actually. If you look at the monsters, below the level, I want to display a bar that is going to show us how close we are to a level up. And this bar should have a white part to show how much we have, and then a darker bit to show how much is left. Meaning we have to figure out how to draw a bar. And also this should be reusable, because later on for the stats, we want to draw a whole bunch of those. All of that we can put in a function that I want to keep inside of support.py. All the way at the bottom, I want to have define draw bar, for which we are going to need a whole bunch of parameters. First of all, we want to have a surface to draw on. Then we will need a rectangle for the position. We want to have a value, a max value. Then we need a color, a BG color. And finally, a radius, although for this one, we can set a default value of one. Now, for the logic of drawing a bar, there's only really one complicated thing. And that is, via the rectangle, we're going to set the size of this thing. So let's say we could have something like this. Where the width of the rectangle is 100 pixels and the height could be 20 pixels. The specific numbers here really do not matter. The actual issue is, for the value, we might have something like 150. So we have to figure out how to put 150 health points into 100 pixels. Or in other words, if we have 150, we want to fill the entire 100 pixels. And if we were at 75, then we would only want to cover 50% of the width. Something like this. To get started with that, we first of all need a ratio between the value and the width of the rectangle. Or in other words, rect.width divided by max value. That is going to tell us how much value we get per pixel. After that, I want to create the BG rectangle, which is simply going to be a copy of the rectangle that we are passing in via the argument. On top of that, we want to create a progress rectangle which is going to be pygame.frectangle with a position and a size. The position is super easy. We can simply get rect.top left. We want this progress rectangle to be in the same position as the background rectangle or the rectangle we are passing in as an argument. For the size, we are going to need a width and a height. The height is super easy. We simply want to get the rect and the height of that one. Although for the width, we want to get the value and multiply this with the ratio. And that's basically all we need. After that, we can get pygame.draw.rectangle. We want to draw on the surface. We want to draw with the background color and then BG rectangle. We do not want to have any border width, but we do want to include the radius, the one that we have specified in the parameters as well. That we can now duplicate. Next up, I want to draw the progress rectangle. I want to draw the progress rectangle with the color and the progress rectangle. And that is actually all we need. Let's use it. Inside of monster.py, first of all, we will need from support import draw bar. And then 
for the XP bar, I want to call draw bar with all of the arguments that we have specified. The surface is going to be self.display surface. For the rectangle, we have to create a whole new rectangle. And I believe it would be a bit cleaner to use named arguments over multiple lines. And then for the rectangle, we want to create pygame.frect. For the top left of this rectangle, we want to get the level rectangle dot bottom left. In other words, the bottom left of this level rectangle. And for the size, we can go with 104. Numbers that I thought just looked good. Next up, we have the value. And for that, ideally, we want to have something like monster.xp. Something that doesn't exist at the moment, because in monster, we only have the name, the level, the element, and the stats. Which means we want to add another section, let's call it experience. And there, we will need self.xp, which by default can be zero. Then we want to have self.level underscore up, which is going to be self.level times 150. Level up is going to be the amount of XP we need to get to the next level. For level one, it's going to be 150. For level two, it's going to be 300 and then so on. Meaning with that, we have monster.xp for the value and for the max value, we want to have monster.level underscore up. After that, we are just going to need the colors and in there for the foreground color, I want to get colors and white. The same color we are using for the text and for the background color, I want to have colors and dark. Also, I am happy with a default radius of one so we can get rid of this part and now run main.py. The game doesn't crash. And there we go. We can see an XP bar that at the moment doesn't really show anything. So what we could be doing after we are creating all of the monsters, I want to give every single one of them a random amount of XP. That we can do inside of monster.py by importing from random import rand int. And then XP is going to be a random integer between zero and a thousand. For some monsters, this is going to look a bit weird, but if I now run all of this, we can see that we have bars for all of the monsters that actually display something. The problem is that some bars have way too much XP. These monsters should have leveled up, especially this one. That is an issue we can fix later on when we have the evolution mechanic. I suppose for now, what we could be doing inside of the draw bar function, we could set a minimum and a maximum value. Or in other words, we want to make sure that this value times ratio never gets wider than this rectangle. I want to create another local variable. Let's call it progress. For that, first of all, we want to make sure that we never go below zero. Max, zero, and then the value we have gotten from value times ratio. Let me cut it out actually, and then fix my typo, and then use progress in there for the width of the progress rectangle. That way, the rectangle can never go in the other direction, which would happen if it was to become negative. After that, we have to set a maximum value, which we do via the min function. We want to have either our value times ratio, or we want to have the rect.wift. Rect.wift would be the background rectangle, and this should be our maximum width. So now I can run main.py again, and now we are never exceeding the bar. So I think that looks pretty good. This might have been a bad example. Let's try this again. And there we go. So this monster has a lot of XP, this one as well, and this one as well. But we never exceed the length of the bar itself. So quite happy with that. That means we can work inside of the monster index again, although there's one more minor change that I want to do. At the moment, this draw bar is a little bit below the element, which I don't think looks good. Or in other words, if I open the menu again, if you look at the elements, we have fire on this line and then the level is a bit below that. Ideally, I want those to be on the same line. It should be a bit high up. 
For that, first of all, I want to display the level just a little bit higher, which we can do by setting the offset to 10 and negative 16. That should already help quite a bit. And yeah, I think that looks better. I suppose you could work with these numbers a bit more to get the perfect value, but I am going to leave it as it is. This is fine. So with that, we can start on the main part. There are a couple of elements that we have to cover. So once again, this is our entire index and we already covered the list on the left side. We are also covering the monster all the way on top. After that, I want to have a health bar and an energy bar, roughly here. And below those, I want to have all of the stats and all of the abilities. And to go through it step by step, let's start with the health and the energy bar. Now I guess main part isn't ideal in terms of naming, let's call this health and energy. For that, I first of all want to create a dictionary with a few data points. I call this one bar data, and for this thing, we want to get, for example, the width, which would be the rectangle, so our rectangle for the entire thing, the main background. I want to get the width of this and then multiply it with 0 0.45. And I want to have a height, which would simply be 30 pixels. With those two numbers, we get the width and the height of the two bars. On top of that, I want to get the top for them as well, which is going to be the top rectangle dot bottom plus, let's say for now, 50 pixels. One more key value pair that we need for now, and that is going to be the left side, which will be rect.left plus rect.width divided by four. So just to contextualize these numbers, once again, we have the entire index, we have the list, and we have the top rectangle. And at the moment, we want to create the health bar. For that, we will need the width, the height, we will need a top position, and we will need a left position. The things that we have covered inside of this dictionary. And later on, those we want to reuse for the energy bar rectangle. But step by step. First of all, I want to create a health bar rectangle, which is going to be pygame.f rectangle, where we have to specify a position and a size. Position we're going to change in just a second. For now, this could be zero and zero. For the size, we also want to have a tuple with x and y, or rather width and height, but same thing. And there, we want to get bar data with the width, and I can copy all of this because for the height, we want to have bar data and height. To cover the position, I want to use move to, simply because I want to place the mid top, which is going to get the xy tuple position of bar data. We want to have the left side for x, and we want to have the bar data top for y. And just to make sure that this is working, let's run pygame.draw.rectangle self.display surface. We can go with a red color and then the health bar rectangle. Main.py. And there we go. We have a health bar. Although it is quite far down. That's not ideal. In other words, we want to change the top argument. And in my case, the number that I went with is the top rect.bottom plus rect.width multiplied by 0.03. If I now run main.py, that feels much cleaner. And I suppose the important thing for this bar is that we have the same distance to the top and to the left. Because of that, we are multiplying the top offset with the width. Cool. With that, we have the position and the size of the health bar rectangle. Which means next up, we can call draw bar again. And for that, we're going to need all of these parameters. We want to draw on self.display surface. The rectangle will be the health bar rectangle. After that, we will need a value and a max value. I suppose for now we can go with 25 and the max value could be 100. 
for the main color, I want to go to colors and then there we have a red color. For the BG color, I want to get colors and in there get black. For the radius, I want to have a corner radius of two. Let's try that. And there we go. This is definitely coming together. The major thing missing is that we have to get the health and the maximum health of the monster. At the moment, this doesn't really exist. We only have the max health via the base stats, but that doesn't really help us. There isn't a good way right now to track the health of the monster. To create that, for now, I want to create another attribute, self.health, which is going to be self.base stats. And then we want to get max underscore health. And that we want to multiply with self.level. That means by default, the health of the monster is the same as the maximum health. Although for this part, we do have to be careful. Inside of base stats, max health could be something like, let's say, 25. And this value, really importantly, we are not multiplying with self.level at the moment. That is because inside of base stats, we only want to have the base stats of the monster. But for health, we have to multiply it with the level right away, because this value later on can change, and we have to make sure we always have the correct amount of HP. But that is a problem at the moment, because if we simply went back to the monster index, and for the value, we could get monster.health, and for the max value, we could get monster.base underscore stats with max underscore health. The game wouldn't crash, but we would always have the full amount of health simply because the actual health is a way larger number than the max health. To fix this issue, I want to create a method inside of the monster that I called getStat. For this one, we will need self and the stat that we want to get. The only thing that this method is going to do, it will return self.baseStats with the stat we are currently looking at, and then it's going to multiply all of this with self.level. That way, we get the correct amount, which means instead of doing all of this, I want to run the function monster.getStat with max health. Now, this is still going to look the same inside of the game. Since at the moment our health and our max health are the same value, this isn't going to do very much. Since inside of the monster, the maximum health and the health are the same, this is, well, not going to be particularly useful. But what we could be doing is do self.health minus equal a random amount. Let's say rand int between 0 and 200. If I now run main.py, we are getting some health bars. So that's looking pretty good. Now, some monsters don't have enough health for this to really work. Those monsters would have been defeated. But once again, that's an issue for later. For now, I just want to have some random numbers. Although on top of that, I also want to draw the HP text on top of this bar. For that, we will need self.fonts and the regular font and then render the output. I want to render the f string that says HP with first of all the integer value of monster.health and then a forward slash. After that, we want to insert the integer of the maximum health, which we have gotten up here. I can just copy it and there we go. With that, we have the text. We need to specify anti-alias, which should be false, and then a text color. Which in this case is going to be colors and white. We are also going to need an HP rectangle, which is going to be the HP texts.getf rectangle, in which we want to place the mid-left point, which is going to be the health bar rectangle.midleft. Although I do want to add an offset of vector and 10 pixels and 0 pixels. Finally, we can run self.displaySurface.lit with the HP text and HP rectangle. Let's try all of that. And there we go. We are now getting the proper values. 
And you can see some monsters have negative values that we can fix later on. For now, it's not too much of an issue. Righty, with that, we have the health bar rectangle. After that, we want to have the energy rectangle, which is going to be fairly similar compared to what we have done here. So we can reuse a couple of numbers. Width, height, and top can stay the same. Although for the X position, we will need a right side, which is going to be rect.left plus rect.width multiplied with 3 over 4. That way we are getting 75% of the width. Next up, I guess we could copy all of this, although I do want to change this to the energy bar rectangle. We need pygame.frect and the size is still good. Although for the mid top, I want to have bar data and the right side. Top can stay the same though. Next up, when we are drawing the bar, I want to use the energy bar rectangle and then monster health and monster max health we can leave for now. Although for the color, I want to use a blue color. And also for now, we can get rid of the text and let's see if this is working in the first place. And that is looking like a pretty solid start. Now at the moment we are copying the health amount, but at the very least we have a bar. The issue is we are using the same attributes of the monster for both bars, which isn't ideal. Instead, this should be monster.energy and monster gets stat max energy. Max energy does exist, but energy does not, which means inside of the monster, we have to create self.energy, which is going to work in a very similar way compared to the health. I simply want to get the max stat and energy and multiply it with the level. Also, while we are here, I want to change the value of self.energy and subtract the value from zero to, let's say, 100. After that, I can run all of this, and now we are getting different bar sizes. That is looking pretty solid. So after that, we can work on the, I called this one, the energy points text and energy point rectangle. For the text itself, we still want to render the regular font, although now this should be EP and monster energy along with monster get stat max energy. Anti-aliasing and color stay the same. Next up for the rectangle, I want to get energy points, text.get rectangle, and the mid left should be the energy bar rectangle dot mid left. That looks good. Finally, I want to display surface split, the EP text and EP rectangle. After that, we are getting proper numbers for all of this. So that is looking very good. Next up, I want to work on the monster info. I.e. in there, we have the monster stats and we have the monster abilities. For both of those, first of all, we're going to need a bit of information. Number one is going to be the left side for either of them, which can be a dictionary, where we have the left side and we have a right side. The left side is simply going to be the health bar rectangle dot left and the right side is going to be the energy bar rectangle dot left. If this is the energy bar rectangle, I basically want to draw a vertical line and then have all of the abilities somewhere here. With all of the elements being aligned to the left side. On top of that, I also want to know what our available height is, which I have called info height. Or in other words, I want to know rect.bottom minus health bar rect.bottom. That would be the distance between the health bar and the bottom of the entire index. Or in other words, our entire available space. Next up, we can display all of the stats. And the way this is going to work, we already have a container that starts at the bottom of the health bar and ends at the bottom of the main rectangle. The stuff we have to find here. We also have a left side that's simply the left side of the health bar. And then we can define some kind of width to get the entire available width. Inside of this space, we want to display some text 
This could be attack or defense or speed or stuff like that. And then below this text, we want to have a bar that shows how good this value actually is. For that, first of all, I want to create a stats rectangle. Just as before, pygame.f rectangle with left, top, width, and height. Left being sides and left. The top being the health bar rectangle.bottom. Width would be health bar rectangle dot width, and the height would be the info height. That way we are getting a rectangle, although we want to inflate this thing just a bit, or rather we want to deflate it. Which basically just means that we want to change the size while keeping the center point. On the horizontal axis, this could be zero. On the vertical one, it should be negative 60. And just to make sure that this is working, let's run pygame.draw.rectangle with self.display surface, a red color, and this stats rectangle. Inside of main.py, that looks pretty solid. So essentially at the moment, we have created a rectangle that covers this entire area. And then via the inflate method, we have taken out this bit and this bit just to have a bit of padding. That we don't want to draw though, but I do want to get a stats text surface, which is going to be self.fonts and regular that we want to render. The word I want to render is called stats, then faults and colors with white. This part is just going to be a title that we want to place on top of all of the stats to give a bit more context. To place it, we want to create a stats text rectangle via stats text surface dot get f rectangle, where the bottom left is going to be stats rect dot top left. Finally, self dot display surface dot blit stats text surface and stats text rectangle. All that this is going to give us is inside of the game, we now have stats. So that looks a bit better. After we have that, we can come to actually displaying all of the stats. And for that, first of all, we need a bit of data. Most importantly, we want to get the monster stats, which ideally I want to get from a method called monster.get underscore stats. Or in other words, earlier, we created a method to get one of the stat of the monster, but now we want to get all of them. Which means inside of the monster, I want to create define get stats. No need for custom parameters for this one. And basically all that we want to return is a dictionary with the values that we want to display. And for that, I want to have quite a bit of control because the text is going to be visible meaning I want to display the health and then self.get stat with max underscore health. I hope the system here makes sense. When we are organizing the monster, we have health and max health, and those two are separate attributes. However, when we are displaying all of the stats of the monster, we only want to display the max health. Because of that, we can rename it to health. And the same we can also do to the energy meaning instead of max.energy, I simply want to get the energy. The other attributes I want to display, there are four more. I want to have the attack, the defense, the speed, and the recovery. In case you're wondering, recovery is how fast the monster regenerates energy points. To get those attributes, we want to have get stat attack, defense, speed, and recovery. That way we have control over what attributes we want to display, which we're using inside of the index. So now we know what we want to display. On top of that, we also want to know the stat height, which would be the available space for every element that we can get with stats rect dot height, i.e. the entire available space divided by the length of the stats that we have, monster stats. Once we have that, we can create a for loop to draw all of the elements. 
And for that, we want to have the data and the index, which means we want to have index and data in enumerate monster stats dot items. Just to make sure that this is working, let's print index and data. Running main.py and opening the index, you can see in the bottom, we get the information for all of the monsters. It's a bit hard to see, but if I extend this, you get a pretty good idea that we have the right bits of information available. We just have to display them. Oh, and also this we can make a bit more elegant instead of data. I want to have a tuple with the stat and the value. To get started inside of this for loop, I want to create a rectangle for the positioning of every individual stat. Let's call it single stat rectangle. For that, we're going to need pygame.f rectangle with left, top, width, and height. Most of these numbers are going to be fairly simple. The left side, for example, is the stats rectangle.left. The top gets a bit more complex that we can cover in a second. The width is simply going to be the stats rect dot width, and the height is going to be the stat height. Now for the top, we want to get the stats rectangle dot top. That way we would always be on top of this container. Although from there, we want to go down depending on the index that we have, i.e. plus index times stat height. This will be fairly comparable to the list we created earlier. After we have that, there are three elements that we want to display. I want to have an icon for every single stat. I want to have some text. And then I want to have the actual bar. The easiest part is going to be the text. Let's start there. For the name, I'm going to go with text surface so I don't have to type too much. And we want to get self.fonts, the regular font that we want to render, and the information that we want to render is simply going to be the stat, the one that we are getting from the for loop. After that, we need faults, and for the colors, we want to get white. Next up, I want to have a text rectangle, which we get from text surface get f rectangle, where we are placing the mid left to single stat rectangle dot mid left. Just to make sure that all of this is working, let's display that. Self.display surface dot lit text surface and text rectangle. So inside of main.py, we are now getting all of the stats. This isn't perfect yet, but at the very least, we can see something. We basically have to update the positioning of the text to make all of this look better. But for that to work properly, we need the icon first of all. Or in other words, in the project folder, we have graphics and then UI. And there, for example, we have an attack icon, a defense icon, and an energy icon, and those we want to display next to the stat. Which means we have to do another import inside of the monster frames. I have a key called UI, which is just going to import all of the stuff you have just seen, which is just going to import all of the UI icons which we can do with import folder dictionary. For the path, we want to go upper folder, then we want to go to graphics, and in there we have the UI folder. After that, inside of monster index, I want to have another attribute, self.ui underscore frames. Monster frames and UI. That way we have a bit easier access to it. So now when we are drawing all of the stats inside of icons, we can draw the appropriate icon. For that, first of all, I want to get the icon surface, which we get from self.ui frames and then the stat. And just to explain how this is going to work inside of the graphics UI folder, the icon we, for example, want to use is called attack which mirrors the attack stat name. That way, all of this is going to work fairly seamlessly. After that, we want to create an icon rectangle via icon surface.get f rectangle. I want to place the mid left 
and the target position is going to be the single stat rectangle dot mid left plus an offset. Let's say vector with five and zero. Or in other words, we're moving five pixels to the right. To display that, we need the usual self dot display surface dot blit with icon surface and icon rectangle. Let's try that. And we are getting all of the icons, although they are on top of the text at the moment. For that, when we are placing the text, I want to update the rectangle positioning. I want to place the top left to icon rect dot top left plus a vector of 30 and negative 10. Let's try this again. And that is looking much cleaner. Cool, with that, we can work on the bar. For which we first of all going to need a bar rectangle. Pygame.f rectangle, one more time, with a position and a size. The position is going to be for x, the text rectangle dot left. And for y, it's going to be text rectangle dot bottom plus two pixels, just for a bit of padding. Then for the size, we want to have a width and a height. The height can simply be four pixels and the width is going to be single stat rect dot width multiplied with 0 0.9, just for a bit of extra padding to the right. With that, finally, we can draw the bar. And as always, we have to get all of these parameters. Surface is going to be self dot display surface. Rectangle is going to be the bar rectangle. Value is going to be the value that we get from the for loop. That we don't have to change. Then we are also going to need a max value that we are going to ignore for now. Let's first cover the color. This one is easy. We simply want to get colors and white. For the background color, we want to have colors and black and the radius we can simply ignore. After that, we have to figure out the max value. And that part is going to be a bit more complex simply because from game data, and let's only look at the monsters. Here we have all of the monsters. And for example, for max health, we want to get the highest possible value out of all of the monsters. The same thing we want to do for max energy, attack, defense, recovery, and speed. Which means inside of the init method of monster index, I want to create another section for max values, which we are going to store in the dictionary self.maxstats. By default, this one can be empty. And later on, what I want to have in there is, for example, the health, and then we are getting some amount here, let's say 50. By default, this one should be empty because these values we want to generate dynamically. To get that, we first of all need to have all of the monsters, which means for data in monster underscore data dot values. And I don't believe we have monster data available. We do not from game data import monster data. With these values, we are getting all of this, or rather all of this, and this, and this, and so on. Although we only care about the stats, which means we want to write a for loop with for stat and value in data stats. And on this, we want to get all of the items. And just to make sure that you see what we are getting, let's print stat and value if I run main.py. We are getting things like max health, max energy, attack, defense, recovery, and speed. Or in other words, in game data, we are getting all of this. Now, since we don't care about the element, in fact, we actively want to avoid that part. We want to run if stat is different from element. This we have to do because in just a bit, we're going to compare the values, which we cannot do for the element because that's not a number. But essentially, first of all, I want to check if stat not in self dot max stats. If that is the case, we can simply create a new key self dot max stats with the stat is going to be the value. 
That part is easy, the next part is a bit more complex. So at the moment, we are looping through all of the stats of every single monster. And then we are encountering an element that already exists inside of max stats. If that is the case, we want to compare the current stat value with the value inside of max stats and then pick the larger one, which means self.maxstats with the stat is going to be value if value is greater than self.maxstats and the stat. If that is not the case, else we simply want to keep the same thing, i.e. the value we have started with. That should actually be all. If I now print self.maxstats and run main.py, we are getting a dictionary that should always have the largest attribute value. Let's check. For example, for max health, this value should be 29. And that I believe is Charmadillo, but we have a max health of 29. And every other value is smaller than that. So that looks good. Let's do another one for attack. The largest value is six. So there should be no other value larger than that. So we have Pluma with attack being six and every other value is smaller than that. So that seems to be working just fine. However, there is an issue and let me run main.py again. When we are using these max stats, which happens in the for loop down here, the stat for max health and max energy is simply called health or energy, which means inside of max stats, we have to get rid of max health and max energy. Or to be a bit more specific, we have to remove the max in there. Now the easiest way to rename a key inside of a dictionary is to get the dictionary and then the new key. The value for this one is going to be self.maxstats and then you pop the previous key, which in our case is going to be max underscore health. The same thing we want to do for energy. So energy is going to be max energy. After that, I can print self dot max stats run main.py and there we go now we are getting all of the max values with health and energy having the right name the order changed but that doesn't matter now we don't need the print statement anymore and we can collapse the init method after that all the way down here we can get the max value for every single stat what we want is self dot max stats along with the current stat that we are looking at. And really important, this we have to multiply with monster.level. And that should be all. If I now run main.py, we get a whole bunch of bars. And that I think is looking pretty good. No complaints, although I think we could move the entire thing just a bit further down. For that, inside of monster index, when we are creating the stats rectangle, after inflate, we also want to move it. Zero pixels left and right, but 15 pixels down. If I now run main.py, this thing is a bit more centered, which looks a lot better. With that, we have covered the stats. After that, we will need the abilities. Or oh, in other words, inside of game data, we want to display all of these abilities. Now for some monsters, I was a bit lazy and they don't have very many like those, but if you go a bit further down, for example, for this one, we have four attack moves, then we have a few more for this one, then we have all of those, and this is what we want to display. For all of that, first of all, I want to create an ability rectangle which is basically going to be the same size as the stats rectangle, so we can copy that one, although we do want to move it to a different position. Or in other words, I want to move the left side to sides and right. The sides that we have to find earlier, that happens up here. On top of that, what will also be similar to the stats rectangle is the title, which we have done with these lines, so I can copy them. Basically, we want to create an Ability, text surface and text rectangle. Now for that, I do have to rename a few more things like this one and this one. 
Although we do have to change a couple of other things, but let's go through it step by step. First of all, self.fonts.regular.render can stay the same, although the text we want to render is ability. Next up for the rectangle, we want to get the text surface and then place the bottom left in the ability rectangle dot top left. And I think that's going to be it. If I now run main.py, we're getting ability to the right of it. That looks pretty good. Which means afterwards, we can create another for loop with index and ability in enumerate. And then I basically want to get the monster and get underscore abilities. A method that does not exist at the moment. To create that one, we have to work inside of the monster where we want to create get abilities. Inside of this method, we want to return all of the abilities that are available to the monster at the moment. If you look at game data, we can look at, let's say, Syndrel, and in there, we have an abilities dictionary. The key defines when this ability is available. Or in other words, on level 26, this monster gets the explosion ability. So what we want to return is going to be a list with all of the abilities. Now, first of all, for all of that, below the stats, I want to store all of the abilities. Self dot abilities is going to be monster data with the name. And then we want to get the abilities, i.e. we are getting this dictionary. And from that dictionary, we want to get all of the available moves. That part is actually fairly simple. We want to get the ability for level and ability in self.abilities.items. Remember, abilities is a dictionary where we have a level and the ability, or all of this stuff. And we only want to store an ability if self.level is greater or equal to the level required. That way, let me print the ability and let's have a look at the monsters. So the first monster that we have is Chamadillo, and this one is level 30 at the moment. Inside of game data, if we find Chamadillo, we should have all of these abilities, but we should not have Annihilate. Let's try. If I run main.py, open the index, we can see all of the basic abilities. I think they start here. We can go up to explosion, but we do not get annihilate. I think that's looking good. To display all of that, I want to create a text surface, which we do with self.fonts and regular. I want to render the ability faults, and the color is going to be black. Oh, and there's one thing I did forgot to mention. If this is the rectangle for all of the abilities, the one we have to find up here, I want to have a two column layout, i.e. this is one ability, then we have another ability, then we have another ability and another one here. Essentially, I want to avoid that we always have a list that displays all of the elements in a single dimension. It simply starts to look boring at some point. Now the way each individual ability will be displayed is we have the text itself with a black color. And around that, we're going to draw a rectangle. For that, we're going to need an X and a Y position. I suppose for X, we can start with ability rectangle dot left. Although that we do have to change in just a bit. For the top, I want to have a top offset of let's say 20 pixels. Then I want to add the ability rectangle dot top and then add the index multiplied with text surface and get underscore height. Once we have that, we can create a rectangle where we want to get the text surface and call get f rectangle, where we are placing the top left at position x and y. Finally, we can call pygame.draw.rectangle on self.display surface. For the color, I want to have colors and white along with the rectangle. Let's try all of that. If I now run main.py, we are getting, well, we are getting something. I suppose what I should be doing is also display the text. Then all of this is going to make a lot more sense. Self.display surface.blit the text 
surface along with the rectangle. Let's have a look again. And there we go. We are getting all of the attack moves, except this one doesn't look ideal. Now, an easy thing that we could be doing here is rect.inflate, let's say by 10 and 10 pixels. Then we can set a border width of zero and a corner radius. Let's try this one. And there we go. This is already feeling quite a bit nicer. Although we are wasting a huge amount of space on the right side. To fix that, I want to move Spark to this position, roughly here. To get those numbers, I have to update the x value. The way we are getting that is index, modulus, and 2. And that value we want to multiply with ability rectangle dot width divided by 2. What we're getting from that, if we run all of this, we are staggering the entire thing. And the main thing that might cause you confusion is this index modulus 2. And let me actually print what we are getting. If I now run all of this and open the thing, we are getting a whole bunch of zeros and ones. Basically, we are checking if index is even or odd. And then we are getting zero or one returned, which we are then multiplying with half of the width of the container. That way, an item is either on the left side or in the middle which is a good start, but we still have the vertical positioning that we also have to update. Without that, we would get this weird offset at the top, which I do not like. For that, I want to work inside of the Y position and then divide index by two and get the integer from the result. If I now run main.py, that is feeling quite a bit better. Although we do need a bit more padding between the elements. Or in other words, at the moment, our height separation is simply the text surface height. This we want to increase by, let's say, 20 pixels. Let's try this again. And there we go. This is feeling much cleaner. And with that, we basically have the entirety of the index. Although there's one thing that I don't like, and that is when we are displaying the attack, we are only showing the name of the attack, which is a good start, but I also want to display the element of the attack. For that, we have to look at game data and come to the third dictionary, attack data. This one gives us all of the available attacks and then a whole bunch of information. For example, what we can target, the amount of damage or healing, the cost of this move. Then we have the element and we have an animation. For now, we only care about the element. There we have fire, plant, normal, and water. So when we are displaying the ability, the background color should have the proper element color. For that, first of all, we need to know what element we are working with, which we get from attack data. And currently we don't have that one available. So we want to import monster data and attack data. That way we are getting this dictionary. Next up then, all the way at the bottom, attack data, we have the ability along with the element, which is going to be this entry in the dictionary. Let's try all of this. And the game doesn't crash, so I assume it's going to work. After that, we have to link this element to a color, which we can do via settings, because for every element, we have an associated color. Although with one exception, because I forgot to add the normal color, which is simply going to be a pure white color. After that, when we are drawing the rectangle, I do not want to get the white color. Instead, I want to get the element. And with that, if I now run main.py, we are getting a whole bunch more color, which is feeling significantly better. Now that was a larger section, but we have made a whole bunch of progress. So next up, we can start working on the battle system. While editing this part of the video, I realized I have forgotten two things. Or rather, I forgot one thing and I made a mistake. Inside of the game, the first thing that I got wrong is the length of the stat bars. All of those. Because those are too long. I basically want them to end with the health bar. All of this stuff here should disappear. It just doesn't look good. Besides that, the thing that I forgot to add is if we don't have enough monsters, let's say we only have the first three. 
If we then run the game, we can only see part of the index, which is going to look really weird. And let's start with the background. For that, inside of monster index, we want to go to display list. Before we are drawing anything, I want to have a BG rectangle. As always, pygame.f rectangle with left, top, width, and height. Left and top we can put together as position because for this one we want to get self.mainrect.top left. This BG rectangle is going to be the background for the entire list. For the width and height, we want to have a tuple. The width is going to be self.list width and the height is going to be self.mainrect.height. This BG rectangle we then want to draw with pygame.draw.rectangle self.display surface. Let's say for now a red color and then the BG rectangle. Inside of main.py, if I now open the index, we are getting an error. This should be called pygame draw rectangle. And now inside of main.py, we now have the background. Although we have to fix two things. Number one is the background color and number two is the corner radius. For the background color, I simply want to get the gray color. So that part's fairly easy. Let's try and that's already looking a lot better. For the corner radius, we want to go with zero for the border width. Then a general border radius is going to be zero. Then we have the top left border. This one should be 12. Next up is the top right border, that one is zero. Then we have the bottom left border, this one should be 12, and then we have zero again. Let's try all of that. And there we go. I think this is looking pretty good. Although while doing this, I have realized another minor issue, and that is we have this line all the way at the top, which shouldn't be there, it looks a bit weird. That part happens because of those lines down here. For this one, we have to make sure that we do not draw something on index zero, or rather that index zero doesn't exist, which we can insert by simply adding a one up to whatever we are getting from all of this. Let's try that part. And now we don't have the weird line all the way at the top anymore. The rest still works just fine. So we can re-enable all the monsters and it's still looking pretty good. Very happy with that. And that is making a noticeable difference. After that, we have to work inside of display main. And more specifically, we want to work inside of the for loop for the stats. For the bar rectangles, we are getting a single stat rectangle and then 90% of the width, which turns out is a bit too far. If we change this to 75, so 75%, then. This is looking a bit better, but still not ideal. Or in other words, I want this bar to extend to the length of the health bar, something like this. I think the best way to think about it is if this is the entire stats rectangle. We have an icon, then we have some text, and then we have the bar. And at the moment, the bar is a bit too wide. So this part we have to remove, which means essentially we want the length of the bar to be the width of the entire rectangle minus this part, which we can get with the entire rect of the single stat rectangle width. But from that, we want to subtract text rectangle dot left, i.e. the left side of the text rectangle minus the single stat rectangle dot left. That would give us the distance from the left side of the main rectangle to the text. So with that, we have the properly sized bar, and that is making the entire thing feel much better. So I am quite happy with that. Cool, with that we have actually finished the index, so next up we can work on the battle system. Righty then, the battle system. Now this thing is going to become fairly complex. We have a ton of animations, we have lots of timers, we have to capture input. There are just a bunch of things that we have to do. So let's go through it step by step and start by setting up the entire thing. First of all, we are going to need some opponents, which we can create right below the player monsters, self dot, let's call it dummy monsters. 
This is going to be a dictionary very similar compared to the player. And let me literally copy a couple of entries. I want all of those monsters. Although we do have to fix the indexes. This should always be a list that starts from zero and then goes in a sequence. Also, let me change the levels to something that is a bit more noticeable. So with that, we have a couple of opponents that we could fight. Which means next up, we have to figure out the actual battle system. And essentially what we are going to do, if I minimize everything and then look at the run loop. We already have a dialogue tree and an index for the overlays. In there, I want to add one more. If self dot battle exists, then we want to run self dot battle dot update with delta time. Also, let me align all of this. That's going to look a fair bit better. There we go. So basically for the battle system, we are just creating a whole bunch of sprites on top of the entire level while also making sure that the player cannot move. That way our transitions are going to be a bit simpler. But anyway, first of all, for all of this, we want to create inside of overlays another attribute self.battle, which by default is going to be none. Meaning if we are running the game now, nothing is going to change. However, what we can do is create a new Python file, which I want to save as battle.py. And then we need the usual stuff from settings, import, everything. On top of that, we want to have class battle without any inheritance. For the dunder init method, self, the player monsters, along with the opponent monsters, we are going to need all of the monster underscore frames, i.e. all of the graphics, and we want to have a BG surface. Also, we want to have a whole bunch of fonts, i.e. fonts. First of all, in there then, we want to get self.display underscore surface, which we get with pygame.display.get underscore surface. We want to store self.bg surface as an attribute. The same we want to do with self.monster frames, because we're going to use them quite a bit. Also, the fonts we need to store. So self.fonts is fonts. After that, I want to have all of the monsters inside of a dictionary, i.e. monster underscore data is going to be a dictionary where we have the player with the player monsters. Then we have the opponent with the opponent monsters. This part is necessary because sometimes we want to update all of the monsters in the battle. And having all of them in a single dictionary is going to make that a bit easier. So with that, we have the setup. Next up, the most important thing in this class is going to be an update method with self and delta time. And for now, just to make sure that this is working, I want to get self.displaySurface and then split self.bg surface at position zero and zero. Inside of the project folder, in graphics, we have backgrounds. Those are the battle backgrounds. Those we first of all need to import, which once again happens inside of main.py in import assets. I wasn't really sure where to put them. So I have simply created a separate attribute self.bg underscore frames, which we get with import folder dictionary. For the path, we want to go up a folder, then to graphics in which we have the back rounds. Let's run out of this and we are not getting an error. So the imports seem to work just fine. So with that, we can all the way at the top import from battle, the battle class. And then when we are initializing the entire game, instead of setting battle to none, I want to create an instance of the battle class for which we are going to need a whole bunch of arguments. Let me copy the parameters. Player monsters is going to be self dot player monsters. The opponent monsters are the ones we have just created, the dummy monsters. For monster frames, we want to have self dot monster frames. For the BG surface, we want to pick one item from these BG frames. 
i.e. if you look at them, we at the moment have a dictionary with the keys for forest, ice, and sand. So the one that we could be using is self.bg frames with the forest. Finally, the last thing we need is self.fonts for the fonts. If I now run the game, we have the background for the battle. So that's looking pretty good. Now, the problem is that, well, the player behind all of this can still walk around, which we cannot really see, but if this was the case in the game, it might cause some issues, or at the very least, it would be super weird. One thing we could do already about that, inside of input, we are already checking if we do have a dialog tree, or rather, if we don't have a dialog tree. Only then should the player be able to do all of this. This system we can extend right away. We also want to check and not self dot battle. That way, if we are in a battle, we cannot talk to anyone and we cannot open the index. Although the player can still walk around, which isn't ideal and for now it's not really easily fixable. Simply keep it in mind later on, once we have a monster encounter, we want to block the player movement. Like we have done for the dialogue system, but for now I think this is alright. Anyway, with that, we have a battle system, or at the very least, we have the background for the battle. Which means, next up, I want to run a setup method. No need for custom parameters for this one. And basically what we want to do, for entity and monster in self.monsterdata.items i.e. we are going through this dictionary, then we are getting the entity, do we have a player or an opponent, and then we are getting all of the monsters. Or rather, we get the monster data. And that is a really important thing to understand for this battle system. We have the monster data, which is going to be all the stuff we are getting from the monster. This stores the actual monster information. But to display the monster, we have to create a sprite. This one is actually going to be visible. But step by step, first of all, I want to get the first three monsters from the player and from the opponent. Or in other words, I want to pick these three monsters or these three monsters. That we can get with for index and monster in, I want to create a new dictionary via dictionary comprehension, where I have a key and a value for K and V in monster dot items and with that we would duplicate the dictionary that we already have for the player or the opponent i.e all of this but this we only want to do if the key is smaller or equal to two and from this new dictionary we want to get all of the items if i print the result we have index and monster and also i want to run self dot setup if I run main.py, we are getting 0, 1, and 2 for the player monsters and 0, 1, and 2 for the opponent monsters. A bit hard to see, but you get the idea. I suppose what we could be doing at this point, which is generally good practice, inside of the monster class, I want to create another Dunder method. Define Dunder wrapper. This is going to define what we are doing when this class is being printed. No need for custom parameters, and basically we have to return some kind of string. If this one is monster, and I run main.py again, instead of seeing the object in memory, we get the string monster. Not a bad start, but not exactly helpful, so instead I want to have a monster with self.name, along with, let's say, the level which is self.level. If I now run main.py, we are getting the index and then the monster along with the level. And there you can see, we have the first three player monsters along with the first three dummy monsters. Using that information, we want to create a monster, or rather we want to create a whole bunch of monsters, which I'm going to do inside of a method called create monster which is going to need a bunch of parameters. Let's create the method right away. Create monster. After self, we will need the monster data. 
Then we want to have the index. On top of that, we want to have a position index. And finally, we need the entity, i.e. player or opponent. And I should explain, index is to identify the monster. So for example, we could have two monsters with the same name and the same level. It is totally possible to have something like Charmadillo twice with the same level, which would be inconvenient for us because they would be really hard to separate. Hence, we are going to use the index of the monster to make sure that we always have a unique monster ID. That is the purpose of this index. Besides that, we have a position index. To understand this one, you want to look at settings because in there, we have the battle positions. If this is the window, for the left side, we have a position roughly here, here, and here. And then for the right side, we have another set of positions for here, here, and here, or something like that. Those positions have indexes, i.e. top would be zero, center would be one, and bottom would be two. Zero, one, and two. Keeping track of these numbers is going to be really important because that way we can ensure that we always have the monster in the right place. Although for now, I simply want to add pass in there because before we can work on this method, we have to add all of the arguments. Monster is simply going to be the monster. The index is going to be the index and the position index will also be the index. And finally for the entity, we want to get the entity, all of the stuff we are getting from the four loops basically. Also, I am using index here twice because the first index is to keep track of the monster. The second index is then for the positioning. And for this number, I'm expecting a number that is either zero, one, or two, which I am getting from these indexes as well. I.e. the first monster will always be on the top position or index zero. The second monster will be in the middle, index one and the third monster will be on index two or the bottom. Also, let me get back the original monster. That makes a lot more sense. Cool, with that, we can create a monster. First of all, we want to have the frames for this monster, which we get from self.monsterframes. We want to get the actual monsters from this thing, and then we want to pick one of the items, which we are getting from monster.name. That information we then want to use to create a monster sprite, which is going to need a whole bunch of arguments. We want to have a position, we want the frames, we want a couple of groups, then we want to have the monster for data, we want to have the index along with the position index, and we need to know what entity it belongs to, i.e. is it a player or an opponent monster. This monster sprite does not exist at the moment. For that, we have to look at sprites, which I do not have open right now. And also we don't need the monster index at the moment. Instead, I want to have the sprites. We don't need any of the stuff we have already created. I want to create the battle sprites. All of those are going to be the overworld sprites. For the battle sprites, I want to create a class called monster sprite. The parent is going to be pygame.sprite.sprite, .sprite, and then we're going to need a dunder init method, for which we're going to need a parameter for all of these arguments. On top of that, we're going to need self. After that, I want to call super with dunder init with all of the groups, along with self.index being the index, self position index is going to be the position index, self dot entity is going to be the entity, and self dot monster is going to be the monster. That covers the basic data. After that, we need the sprite setup. We want to be a bit better with comments. Actually, we can put the super init in there, and this part is going to be data. For the sprite itself, we are going to need self.image and self.rectangle. At the moment, we don't really have a single image. We only have a whole bunch of frames, which means inside of data, we need a few more attributes, self.frameIndex, self.frames, and I also want to have self.state, which is going to be zero, frames, and a string idle. 
that information we can then use for the image. We are going to get self dot frames with self dot state. And then we are going to use indexing one more time with self dot frame index. That should give us a single surface. For the rectangle, we want to have self dot image dot get f rectangle, where we are setting the center to a position. That should be a pretty good setup. Next up then, inside of battle, we first of all have to, from sprites, import the monster sprite. Also, since we are working with sprites, we have to create a bunch of groups before we are calling the setup method. Once again, I want to have a couple of comments. This is groups and this part is general. For the groups, I want to have self.battle underscore sprites, which for now can be pygame.sprite.group. This I want to duplicate two times because I want to have a sprite group for the player sprites and another one for the opponent sprites. And I want to align all of this up so it looks nicer. And with that, we can finally create a monster sprite. Now for that, we're going to need a whole bunch of arguments and most of them we already have. Frames we are getting from what we have just done before. Groups we can set in just a second. And the remaining arguments are coming from the parameters. So that's quite simple. All we really have to figure out is the position and the groups. Which means I want to have two more variables, position and groups. And those are going to change depending on the side. Which means I want an if statement if entity is equal to the player. Then I want to create one set of variables and if that is not the case, else. Then I want to do the same thing. Although for now, let's comment it out so we're not getting an error. For the position. I want to create a list with all the available positions and then use the monster position index to pick one of them. In other words, inside of settings, I want to get this position, this position, and this position, put it in the list, and then select one of those via the index. For that, we will need the battle underscore positions that we're getting from settings, so this entire dictionary. We currently want to look on the left side of this thing because the monster should always be on the left side. And from that, we want to get all of the values. That way, we only get the actual position while ignoring the key. Then for the groups, I want to have self.battle sprites and self.player sprites. And with that, we should have a setup which means inside of the update method, I need self.battlesprites.raw on self.display surface. If I now run main.py, we are getting an unbound local error inside of the setup method that happens here. And the issue is we are only creating a position if the entity is on the player side. If we are on the opponent side, we do not have a position. So this position doesn't exist when we are trying to create a monster sprite. To avoid that issue for now, I want to indent the monster sprite so we are only creating a sprite if we are on the player side, for which we always have a position and groups, or in other words, all of these arguments are available. Let's try off this again. And there we go. We have a couple of monsters. Now this isn't ideal. They are not animated, they are facing the wrong direction, and we do not have the opponents. So loads of things to work on. That part is going to be an exercise. I want you guys to do three things. Number one, flip the player monsters on the horizontal axes so they are facing to the right. After that, add the opponent monsters, and finally, animate all of the monsters. Should be doable, but you do have to write a couple of lines of code. Pause the video now and see how far you get. I think the easiest thing to get started with are the opponent monsters. Meaning I want to uncomment the else statement and then remove one indentation from the monster sprite. Next up, we have to get the position 
which is going to work fairly similar compared to what we have done for the player. The only difference is that now we want to get the right side. For the groups, we want to have self.battle sprites and self.opponent sprites. With that, inside of main.py, we are getting a whole bunch more monsters. That's already feeling better. Although we have to flip all of the frames for the player. And the thing you really have to understand, when you are looking at all of the monster sprites, all of them are facing to the left, which means if one of them is on the left side of the screen, we have to flip them to always face to the right. Or in other words, when we have the player entities, we want to create frames that are flipped, which has to be a new dictionary where we have a state along with a couple of frames. And at the moment, we can go for state and frames in frames.items. That would simply duplicate this list. So, so far, not particularly useful. But with that, we have access to all of the frames, which means in there, we can run a list comprehension in which we want to go through all of the frames i.e. frame for frame in frames. So now we have access to every individual frame, and this we want to flip on the horizontal axis, which we can do with pygame.transform.flip. We want to have a frame. We want to flip it on the horizontal axis, but not on the vertical one. If I now run main.py, we have all of the monster frames facing in the right direction. So that's looking really good. Finally then, inside of Monster Sprite, we want to animate all of this. For that, I want to create an animate method with self and delta time. We want to get self.frameIndex plus equal animation speed multiplied with delta time. And then self.image is going to be self.frames along with self.state. And then we can pick the integer of self.frame index with modulus of the length of self.frames with the current self.state. This animate method we have to call inside of an update method, which needs self and delta time there, self.animate. Also, don't forget delta time in there. Next up, inside of battle.py, before we are drawing all of the battle sprites, we want to call self.battlesprites.update and pass delta time in there. Now, inside of main.py, we have animations. This isn't terrible, but also not ideal, because at the moment, all of the monsters animate at the exact same frame rate, which can look a bit weird. To make that a bit more interesting, I want to create in the dunder init method a self.animation underscore speed which is going to be the animation speed plus a random amount that we're getting from uniform, which I believe we don't have at the moment. We want from random import uniform. Uniform is basically the float equivalent of a random integer, i.e. we have to set a start and end point, and then Python is going to give us a random floating point value between those two. In my case, I want to go from negative 1 to 1, and then let me print the result. If I now run main.py, we get a bit more variation. And if you look at the print statements, now our animation speed has a bit more diversity. Not a lot, but enough to make the game feel a bit more random and organic. Righty, with that, we have the monster, but we are also going to need the UI. And there are three classes that I want to create. We want to have a monster name, sprite. We want to have a monster level, sprite. And a monster stats, sprite. To understand these classes, in the right, you can see the end result. Monster name, sprite is going to be the name. It's going to be a rectangle up there. Monster level, sprite is right below. This one shows the level of the monster. And it's not in this image, but in the bottom of this sprite, we're going to have the level progress, i.e. how far we are from the next level up. Both of these are fairly straightforward. The slightly more complex one is the monster stats sprite. That's the stuff at the bottom 
that shows the health of the monster, the energy of the monster, and the readiness of the monster. That's the black bar at the bottom. That's going to show you how far the monster is away from being able to attack or defend or do basically anything. Those three classes we have to create, and let's do it step by step. Starting with the monster name Sprite, for this class, we're going to need a couple of arguments. We want to have a position, we want to have the monster sprite, we will need the groups, and finally, we will need a font. These numbers we can get fairly easily, although before that, inside of sprites, we have to create a class first of all. I want to have a class monster name sprite, with the parent being pygame.sprite.sprite. For this one, in the dunder init method, we want to have a position, the monster underscore sprite, the groups, and the font. Most importantly, we have to call super dunder init with the groups, that part is easy. After that, we want to have self.image and self.rectangle. The rectangle is fairly easy, we simply want to get self.image.getfrectangle, where we are placing the mid top to the position. The image is going to be a bit more complicated because essentially we want to render some text and this is going to be the size of this sprite. Kind of similar compared to what we have done with the dialog sprite. First of all, we want to create a text underscore surface, which is going to be font dot render. The text that we want to render would be the monster sprite dot monster dot name. And this brings us to something that we are going to see a lot. Monster Sprite is going to be the monster class we have created up here. Inside of that thing, we have the actual monster data. And only in there do we have the name. What you always have to remember is that this monster class contains the actual information. The monster sprite at the moment is basically just there to display a sprite and animate it. That's all it does. Also, I don't want to print the animation speed anymore. That's not needed. Righty. For anti-alias, we want to set false. And for the text color, I want to have the colors and the black one. On top of that, I want to set some padding of 20 pixels. For self.image, we can create pygame.surface, for which we are going to need a width and a height. For the width, I want to get the text surface and get underscore width plus two times the padding. One for the left side and one for the right side. For the height, we are doing basically the same thing. I want to have the text surface, get underscore height. Don't forget to call this one. And to that, we want to add two times the padding. With that, at the very least, we should be able to see something. Although for that, first of all, inside of battle.py, we have to import the monster name sprite. Then we can create all of this, but first of all, we will need a position, the monster sprite, groups, and font. Font is the easiest part, although for that, we need to get all of the fonts, those we already have, and then we want to call self.fonts. The font name that I want to use is going to be regular. For the groups, we can simply go with self.battlesprites. The monster sprite is going to be the monster sprite we have just created. To get this one, we first of all want to create a local variable, monster sprite. That way, we can get the monster sprite in there. Finally, we're going to need a position. Let's rename this actually to name position to make it a bit more understandable. Now for that, I want to create a local variable with the same name. And basically what I want to do is I want to get the monster sprite, then rect, and then mid left. Although to that, I want to add a vector of 16 and negative 17. That is going to cover all of the arguments. Let's try to run main.py and we are getting something. So that's not a bad start. The thing is entirely black though, that's not ideal and we cannot see the text. Also for the opponents, the box should be on the right instead of the left. Let's work on that first of all. 
we only want to get this position if entity is equal to player and if that is not the case, so else. Then I want to get the monster sprite dot rect dot mid right along with a vector offset of negative 40 and negative 70. And by the way, those are numbers I simply got from playing around. There's no real science behind it. It just looked good. Cool, but that I'm quite happy with. After that, inside of the sprites, we first of all want to fill the entire surface, i.e. self.image.fill colors and a white color. That is already looking much better, although I think the box is a bit large. Let's change padding to 10 pixels. I think that's going to be better. Yeah, that looks much more reasonable. Finally, we have to add the actual name of the monster. That currently we have inside of the text surface. To display it, self.image.blit, we want to display the text surface. And then we have to get a position, which in our case is going to be padding and padding. If I now run all of this again, we get the name of the monster in the center of the text box. So that is looking pretty good. Now, in case you're wondering about these two paddings, the way you want to think about it is that this is the entire self.image. And on there, we have a whole bunch of paddings. So it's always 10 pixels there, 10 pixels there, 10 pixels there, and 10 pixels there. When we are blitting the text surface, we are looking for the top left, which in our case is going to be this point here, because all of this is what we have gotten from the width and the height of the actual text, which means via this top left point, we are centering the text perfectly. And that is all we need from monster name sprite. We can now minimize it and create another class with monster level sprite, which is also going to be a pygame.sprite.sprite. .sprite. For this one, let me uncomment the class name because now we have to figure out the arguments. I want to get the entity and an anchor. I'll explain this one in just a second. Besides that, we want to have the monster sprite. We want to have the groups, which we can change right away to self.battle sprites. And finally, we want to have self.fonts and the small font to display some text. The last three arguments are fairly straightforward. I don't think I have to explain them. Entity is also fairly simple. Do we have a monster on the player side or on the opponent side? The only complication is the anchor. So what is up with this one? If we have a monster on the player side, then we want to have the monster name sprite on the top left, roughly here. The monster level sprite, I want to be right below here. Those two should have the same left side and also the level sprite should be right below the name. That way it looks like we have one connected sprite, but we do have to be careful. This is only for the player side. For the opponent monsters, we want to have the entire thing mirrored. It should look something like this, where we have the name on the top. This we already have, but on the bottom, we want to have the level. So now they share the same right side. For that, we have to define an anchor. That part is slightly more complex. So let's create another local variable. I want to get either the bottom left or the bottom right of this monster name sprite which means we need to store this in a variable as well. Let's call it name sprite. And then the anchor is going to be name.rect.bottom left, but only if the entity is the layer. If that is not the case, we want to get name.rect.bottom right. That is going to give us all of the arguments. Next up, we have to make sure that we are importing monster level sprite, and then we have to create the class, which we start with by creating a dunder init method. Let me copy in all of the arguments, like so. Self.battlesprites is going to be the groups, and self.fontsmall is going to be the font. 
As always, do not forget to call Super Dunder init with the groups and also self.monster sprite is going to be the monster sprite. We always want to connect this monster level sprite to the monster sprite itself, because if the monster dies, we want to get rid of this sprite as well. And I believe this I haven't done for the monster name sprite. In there, we are only using the monster sprite for the monster name. We also want to have a self.monster sprite attribute, which is going to be the monster sprite. Anyway, with that, we have the monster sprite. Next up, we will need self.font, which is going to be the font. After that, we're going to need self.image and self.rectangle. For this monster level sprite, you do have to be careful, because during the fight, the level of the monster could update, meaning we couldn't simply create the image once with the text and then call it a day. We have to create an update method with self and delta time, although delta time we're not going to use, so an underscore instead. Inside of this update method, we are displaying the text. That way, if the monster level increases during a battle, we are still displaying the right information. Although I suppose for now, we can simply get self.image and fill the entire thing with colors and white. So now we have to figure out an image and a rectangle. Now for the image, I was a little bit lazy and simply went with pygame.surface and then added 60 and 26. We always have a static size for the image and this number simply looked good and fit right in. Although if you're using a different dimension, then this might have to change. Next up for the rectangle, we want to get self.image.getfrectangle, where we are placing the top left to the position, but only if the entity is equal to the player. If that is not the case, then we want to get self.image.getfrectangle, where we are placing the top right. Although the position is still going to be the same. And just to explain what this line means, from the monster name sprite, we are getting a rectangle like this. And if we are on the player side, we want to create the new sprite right below with the same left side, and the bottom of the name is the top of the level. However, if we are on the other side, i.e. the opponent, then I want this level sprite to be on the right side, so here, where we are sharing the right side, although the vertical position is still going to be the same. Anyway, let's try all of this. If I run main.py, we are getting an error. The name is not defined. This happens inside of this line because we are getting name.rec.bottom left. This should be name underscore sprite. Next attempt and another error. We expect five arguments, but we are giving six. That usually happens because you have forgotten self in the dunder init method, like I have just done. Next attempt and we are getting another name error that the position is not defined. And that is because the position is going to be the anchor. So instead of position, I want to use the anchor. Although I guess name here would be a better argument. But anyway, now we are getting the right sprite. That looks pretty good. And anchor here really isn't a good name. Let's call this one the level underscore position. And then instead of sprites, instead of anchor, it's going to be a position for all of them. Let's try it again. And that's much better. Sorry about that. Now we have to display the level of the monster inside of the update method. First of all, for that, I want to create a text surface local variable with self.font.render. An f string with level and then self.monstersprite.monster.level. I already talked about this, but make sure to include the monster. Only in there do we have the actual monster information. After that, anti-alias should be false, and for the colors, I want to have the black color. Next up, we need a text rectangle, which is going to be the text surface.getf rectangle. I want to place the center to the center point of this surface. 
or in other words, self.rect.width divided by two and self.rect.height divided by two. And finally, self.image.lit with the text surface and the text rectangle. Let's try out of that. And there we go. Now we have the level for all of the monsters. There's just one more thing that I do want. If this is the monster level sprite, at the bottom, I want to have a level progress bar that shows us how far away we are from a level up. Now we already have a way to create a bar inside of support.py. We have a draw bar method. This we can reuse. Let me copy all of the parameters and then inside of sprites, don't forget from support import draw underscore bar. Inside of monster level sprite, I want to draw a bar with all of these arguments. Surface is going to be self.image. Rectangle, we can ignore for now. That's going to come in a second. For the current value, we want to get self.monstersprite.monster.xp. Max value is going to be also from the monster class inside of the monster sprite, although this one will be level underscore up. For the main color, I want to go with black, i.e. colors and black. And BG color should be a white color. So it looks like there's no background, i.e. background and white. And the radius should be zero. Nearly done. The last thing we need to get is the rectangle. This I want to create in a separate variable, XP rectangle, which is going to be a Pygame F rectangle with left, top, width, and height. The height can simply be two pixels. The width is going to be self.rect.width. The left is going to be zero, and top is going to be self.rect.height minus two. And also this XP rectangle, we only have to create once, i.e. we can do it inside of the dunder init method and then call it self.xp rectangle. This we can now insert into draw bar. And if I run main.py again, we can see a couple of XP bars. Now for the third monster, Lavia, we have a full XP bar. This monster should have leveled up. That mechanic we do not have at the moment, but we can work on that later. First of all though, I want to display all of the monster stats. That part is more important for now. For all of that, we want to work inside of sprites, a monster stats sprite. As a parent, we need pygame.sprite.sprite, .sprite, just as before. For this one in the dunder init method, we will need a position, the monster sprite, the size that we want to use, the groups, and the font. Then the usual super dunder init with the group. And we want to store self.monster sprite as an attribute. Monster sprite. After that, I want to create self.image and self.rectangle. So we actually have to stuff for the sprite. For self.image, I simply want to create a Pygame surface with the size that we are getting from the parameter. Once we have that, the rec we are getting with self.image.get f rectangle. And I want to place the mid bottom to the position. Finally, while we are here, self.font is going to be the font. That's a good start. With that, we can inside of battle create the monster stats sprite. Although first of all, all the way at the top, we need to import the class. And also let me minimize things so it's a bit easier to see what's going on. So to create an instance of this class, we need these arguments. The position will be the monster sprite dot rect dot mid bottom, i.e. the bottom of all of the monsters. To do that, I want to add an offset of zero pixels on the horizontal axis and 20 pixels on the vertical one. We're going 20 pixels down. The monster sprite remains the monster sprite. For the size, I want to have a static number. I went with 150 and 48. Once again, a number that simply looked good. If you like something else, just go with that. 
For the groups, I want to have self dot battle sprites, and for the font, it's going to be self dot fonts, from which we want to pick this small font. With that, I can run main.py, and we get a bottom bar below all of the monsters. That's looking pretty good. It doesn't do very much at the moment though. For that, we have to work inside of monster stats sprite. Specifically, we will need an update method with self and delta time. Although delta time we're not going to use, so I will add an underscore. First of all, we want to fill the entire image with colors and white. After that, we basically want to draw three bars. One for the health, one for the energy, and one for the readiness. Or in other words, if this is the entire image or rectangle, either of those, we want to have some health text here, and then a health bar. Below that, we want to have the energy text along with the energy bar. And finally, all the way at the bottom, so this line here, I want to have a readiness bar. So how far away the monster is from being ready to attack. Now, two of these attributes we already have. All of the monsters have health and energy, but there's no attribute to track how ready the monster is. For that, below the energy, I want self. I call this one the initiative, which by default is going to be zero. And later on, we will increase this number. Once it reaches 100, then the monster is ready to attack. The speed by which that happens is defined for each monster by the speed, i.e. if you look at all of the monsters, there we have a speed attribute. But that's going to come later, for now initiative can always be zero. After that, inside of the update method, we want to look for three attributes, which we are going to do via a for loop. I want for data in self dot monster sprite dot monster and then get the info that I need, which is a method that doesn't exist right now, which means we have to work inside of the monster and then create a method called get info. No need for custom parameters on this one and basically what we want to get. And let me return the value right away. We want to get a tuple that consists of three other tuples in which we first of all have self.health and then self.get stat with the max health. The next entry is going to be another tuple that is going to be very similar. In fact, I can copy it. We want to have self.energy and self.max energy. Finally, for the readiness or the initiative, we want to get self.initiative and the max value for this one is going to be 100. Or in other words, since we want to display a bar, for this info, we always need the current value and the max value, which is what we are getting from this get info. On top of that, I want to know what index we are on, for which I can use enumerate, after which I'm getting an index along with the data. The data here we can separate right away into a value and a max value, just to keep all of this a bit more readable. After that, I want to get the color for each of the bars, for which first of all, I want to create a list where the first entry is colors and red, then colors and blue, finally colors and gray. This is simply going to give us three of the colors that we have to find inside of settings, one of those colors. From that, I want to pick one item via the index. Now we know from get info, the first item that we are getting is going to be the health, i.e. via the color here, we're getting the first element, which is a red color. After that, I want to have two separate pieces of logic for the bars. The health bar and the energy bar, or in other words, the first two bars are going to be drawn with text in the center-ish of the sprite, which means we first of all want to check if index is smaller than two, in which case we would get health and energy. For now, let's add pass in here, 
and then we can add else for the initiative. Although this one also gets passed for now. Inside all of this, for the health and energy bar, we will need a text surface, a text rectangle, and a bar rectangle. Whereas for the initiative, we will only need, a, let's call it the init rectangle, and that we can then use to draw a bar using draw bar from support. So all the way at the bottom there, we want to use draw bar again, which means we have to get a few numbers. This part could actually be a good exercise. I want you guys to display the stats for each monster. The end result should look something like this for all of the monsters. Pause the video now and see if you can figure this one out. For the text surface, we want to get self.font and then render all of that. For the text we want to display, I want to have an F string with the integer of the current value, after which we are getting the max value. And the alias should be false. And for the colors, I want colors and black. Next up, we need the rectangle. And for that, I want the text surface get f rectangle, in which I want to place the top left. For that, I will need a tuple with an x and a y position. For x, I basically want the text to be on the left side with a bit of padding, which in my case, I have set to self.rect.wift multiplied with 0.05, i.e. we have 5% of width to the left side. For y, I want to get the index and multiply it with self.rect.height divided by 2. Now for the first item where index is 0, this value is going to be 0, i.e. this text rectangle will be in the top left. For the second item, index is going to be 1, which would put this number in the middle of the sprite. Finally, for the bar rectangle, I want to have pygame.frect with text rectangle dot bottom left plus a vector of zero and minus two, i.e. the top left of this f rectangle starts in the bottom left with a bit of an offset. Then we need another tuple with the width and the height. For the height, I simply went with four pixels because it looked good. For the width, I went with self dot rect dot width, but I only want to get 0.9 of that, i.e. 90%. After we have all of that, we can get self.image.blit with the text surface and the text rectangle. Also, we can draw the bar for which we are going to need a whole bunch of arguments. Let me copy the parameters. Surface is going to be self image, rectangle will be the bar rectangle that we have just created, value is going to be the value, and so will be the max value. Also for the color, I want to have the color we created up here, and for BG color, I want to get colors and black. For the radius, I want to go with two. And that should be all we need, although I already spotted one mistake, this shouldn't be gray with an E, this should be gray with an A. Other than that, if I now run main.py, we're getting a name error that initrect is not defined. Let's have a look. We have to comment out this part and then add a pass in there. That part we can cover in a second. Next attempt, and there we go. We have health along with a bar. That is looking pretty good. Next up then, for the init rectangle. We don't need pass anymore, and now we have to create the init rectangle, which once again is going to be a pygame f rectangle, for which we have a position and a size. The size is actually the easier part. Let's start there. The width is simply going to be self.rect.width, and the height is going to be two pixels, i.e. we are covering the entire width of the rectangle, and then for the height we have a number that looks good. For the position then, the left side has to be zero. And for the top, I want to have an offset of two pixels from the bottom of the sprite. In other words, self.rect.height minus two. That is all we need for this part. After that, we can draw the bar. 
for which we are going to need a whole bunch of arguments once again. Let me copy them. We still want to draw on self.image, although the rectangle is now going to be the init rectangle. We are still getting a value and a max value along with a color. Although for the background color, I want to have colors and white. Also for this one, the corner radius should be zero. So let's try all of that. And we cannot see anything. That is because inside of monster, the initiative is zero. But once again, we can define a random integer between zero and a hundred. And then we can see some amount of readiness for all of the monsters, which is a really good start. That means we are nearly done with the setup for the entire thing. There's just one more thing that I want to do. And for that, let me run the game again. I want to work a bit more with the drawing order. Or in other words, the sprite for the name and the level, I want to have behind the monsters. It just looks better. Later on, this will become very important. And generally for a game, you always want to have control of what is being drawn on top and what is being drawn in the background. For that, like we have done for the overworld, the main sprite group at the moment is battle sprites, and this is just a regular sprite group that I want to customize. So instead of a generic group, I want to have a battle sprites class, which we have to create inside of groups. We already have all sprites in there, but that we can collapse because next up, I want to have a class called battle sprites, which has a parent class of pygame.sprite.group. We, as always, will need a dunder init method with self, and that's about it. And in there, we have to initialize the parent class. And then I also want to get self.displaySurface, which we get with pygame.display.get underscore surface. That's all we need in there. Next up, I want to have a custom draw method. Inside of this draw method, we will need a for loop with for sprite in self. And just to reestablish the basic mechanic, we want to get self.displaySurface.blit with sprite.image and sprite.rect. With that, inside of battle.py, we can from groups import battle sprites. After that, the game should still work just fine, except now, when we are calling the draw method, we don't need to add in the surface we want to draw on i.e. down here, we don't want to display surface anymore. After that, things should be working and they don't. We get the issue that the battle sprite object has no attribute display surface. That happens inside of group, so we do not have this display surface. And I see the issue. The init method has too many underscores. But now, there we go. Everything works just as before. That is a good start. So now we can work on the drawing logic, i.e. we can sort all of the sprites, which we are going to do once again by using a sorted method, for which we already have a list that can remain self. After that, we will need a key, which is going to be a lambda function with a sprite. And then for every single sprite, we want to get a sprite.z attribute, and via that, we are sorting all of the sprites. Now, at the moment, the sprites do not have a z attribute. That part we do have to add, which means at the moment we have four sprites inside of this class. And also inside of settings, we have battle layers, which is going to work kind of like the world layers in the sense that we're going to give every monster a number and then the higher the number is, the later the monster will be rendered, i.e. the further it is going to be on top. You use that inside of sprites. The monster sprite is going to get self.z, which we get from battle underscore layers. And monsters should always be on the monster layer. After that, we can copy the entire line. Next up, inside of monster name sprite, in the done init method, I want to put this sprite on the name layer, which is going to be below the monsters. Next up, the monster level sprite is also going to get a z attribute. And we are going to keep this on the name layer. Finally, for monster stats sprites, we will need the Z attribute again. Although this one, we always want to have on top of the monster, i.e. on the overlay layer, which is going to be on top of everything else. That way we can always see the stats of the monster, which is probably a good idea. 
So with that, if I now run main.py, we can see that the name and the level are behind the monster. Also with that, we have more control, which is going to become important later on. But anyway, this is some pretty good progress. Next up, we can work on making all of this interactive. All right, so at this point, we have set up the entire thing. How can we make it interactive? And that is going to involve quite a few different things. Most importantly for now, we have to make sure that the monsters update their initiative. And then once they are ready, we can select different options. There's going to be an attack, defense, switching a monster, or catching a monster. And if we select attack or switch, then we should get another menu with all of the available attacks or all of the available monsters. That's what we are going to work on for now. It's going to be quite a bit. Let's jump right in. Inside of the code, we want to look at our monster because in there we have the initiative and this number we have to update. Also, let's set it to zero by default. To update this number, I want to create an update method all the way at the bottom, define update, for which we are going to need self and delta time. In there, we want to check if not self dot paused, i.e. later on, we want to have control if the monster is updating or not, which we're doing via an attribute, which does not exist at the moment. Let's create it in the dunder init method self dot paused is by default going to be false. Although I guess this pause should be all the way in the top, that feels a bit better organized. Anyway, after we have that, if the monster is not paused, we want to update self.initiative and increase it by self.getStat and the speed multiplied with delta time. This method we now have to call, which is going to happen inside of the sprite that contains it, i.e. monster sprite. This thing already has an update method, which we can use. Self.monster.update with delta time. That should already be it to see something in the game. And there we go. Now all of the monsters are getting ready, with some getting ready faster than others, and Lavia especially takes forever, but that's okay. With that in place, I want to add a comment inside of the battle class. Let's call this one the actual battle system. And the first important part that we have to work on is a method called check underscore active. No need for custom parameters. And in there, we basically want to look at all of the monsters and then check if they are active. For that, first of all, we want to get all of the monster underscore sprites, which we get from self dot player sprites dot sprites plus self dot opponent sprites dot sprites. Sprites you have to add so you can add two of these groups together. Without that, it wouldn't work. Next up, for all of the monsters, we want to check if monster sprite dot monster dot initiative is greater or equal to a hundred. If that is the case, we want to do something. And during that time, all of the monsters should be paused. For which we first of all want to self dot update all monsters and then put them in a pause state. This update all monsters doesn't exist at the moment, which means define update all monsters with self and the option that we want to go for. This one can only really be pause or resume. That's all we are doing in here. For that, once again, I want to get all of the sprites, which I have already done. So let me copy the line. I want to get the monster sprite dot monster and in there update the paused attribute. It will be true if the option is equal to pause. If that is not the case, we only have two options. It's going to be false. This method we now have to call inside of update and let's organize this method just a bit better. I first of all want to do all of the updates and then I'm gonna draw things. So to add some comments, we have the updates and we have the drawing logic. After we are updating all of the sprites, we want to self.check active. With that, if I run main.py, we are getting an error that happens inside of check active because this should be monster sprite. Next attempt. And there we go. The first monster has reached the ready state. So all of the other monsters are pausing. That is looking pretty good. That means we don't need update all monsters anymore. 
And next up, I want to do a bit more inside of Check Active. First of all, monster sprite dot monster dot initiative should go back to zero. After that, I want to do two things. First of all, I want to get the monster sprite and then highlight it, which I'm doing via a method set underscore highlight. And this one should be true. On top of that, I want to get a self dot current underscore monster and set the monster sprite to it. This is going to become important in just a bit because that way we are controlling the current monster. For that, inside of Dunder init, I want to create another section. Let's call it control. In there, at the moment, we only want to have self dot current monster, which by default is going to be none. But later on, once the monster is ready, it's going to be inside of this attribute. And that way we have a bit more control over it. So for example, we can get the attack moves from it, we can switch it, we can kill it, things like that. That's going to come later. For now though, we want to highlight the current monster once it gets ready. Which means we will need a set highlight method. That doesn't exist inside of the sprite right now, so we have to create it. Although it's not a terribly difficult method. Set underscore highlight with self and a value. And ultimately, all that we are doing is self dot highlight is going to be the value. For that, we will need self dot highlight as an attribute. By default, it's going to be false. Let's run main.py to make sure things aren't crashing, and that is still looking pretty good. But obviously, we can't see anything. So once the monster is ready, I want to give it a white outline. To highlight the monster, I want to have something like this, where we have a white outline for every single one of the monsters once they get active. Now creating this isn't the easiest thing in the world. Let's cover the theory first. We will start by getting all of the sprites of the monster. And then we are filling every visible pixel with a white color. And then finally, we are going to move that new sprite in all eight directions, i.e. if this is the original monster. We are moving it by some pixels to the top left, and then we are getting a new monster image that is something like this. After that, we are going to the top, and then we have another monster that is somewhere here. And this we are going to do for all of the eight possible directions. The end result of that is going to be that we have an expanded sprite that is going to look something like this, i.e. For all of the sides, we have a few extra pixels, which is going to give us this outline if we have the new sprite behind the monster. That's all that we are doing in here. To create all of that, I want to work inside of import assets, specifically in the monster frames. And I want to add an entry after we have created all of the monster frames, i.e. monster frames. And then I want to have the outlines for which we are going to create an outline creator. Which is going to need two arguments, the frames we want to get and then the width, i.e. the width of the white line around it. The frames are going to be self.monster frames and we want to get all of the monsters. For the width, I went with four pixels, but that you can customize on your own. I want to work on the outline creator, which I have put inside of support all the way at the bottom of the import functions, define outline creator, which has a frame dictionary parameter and then the width. Just as before, we want to start by creating a new dictionary. I call this one the outline frame dictionary. By default, this one is going to be empty. And then for monster and the monster underscore frames in frame dictionary dot items. Just to make sure you see what we are getting, let me print the monster and the monster frames. If I now run all of this, we get a pretty substantial dictionary. But in there, we first of all have the monster itself. The associated key is then going to be a dictionary with an idle animation and with an attack animation. And basically we want to go through every single one of these surfaces 
and then fill them with a white color and expand them. First of all though, I want to get the outline frame dictionary, create a new entry with the monster and the associated value is for now going to be an empty dictionary. After that, we can go with another for loop for state and frames in monster frames dot items. I.e. we're getting all of the states and the associated frames from the monster frames. Once we have that, we want to get the outline frame dictionary again along with the monster. Inside of this new dictionary, we can create a state key along with an empty list. In this list, we are going to store all of the frames. For that, first of all though, we have to work with all of the frames, which we do with for frame in frames. And then we want to create a new surface, which we do with pygame.surface. For this thing, we will need a tuple with width and height. And essentially, we want to have the same size as the frame in the original animation. But since we are going to expand it, it should be slightly larger. As a consequence, I want to create a vector of frame.get underscore size. And do not forget to call this one. To that number, I want to add a vector with width divided by two. That way, we are getting the size of the original surface via get size. And to all of the sizes, we are adding a width, i.e. we have a width up there, 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 and there. After that, we want to get a white, I call this the white frame, because we are basically taking all of the frames and then making every visible pixel white, which we can do via a mask, i.e. pygame.mask.from underscore surface. The surface we want to use is the frame and this we want to straight away convert to a surface. Now using a mask in Pygame is slightly more advanced and I have made a whole tutorial on it. If you want to know all of the details, check that one out. But essentially a mask is simply going to be a silhouette of a surface. I.e. if we have a visible pixel, we have a white color and if we don't, then we're getting a black color. Most of the time you're using this for collision detection. But you can also turn it back into a surface and then you have a black and white image, which is what we have gotten from the white frame. Although we want to get rid of all of the black pixels, which means white frame dot set underscore color key. And we want to get rid of all of the black pixels. After we have that, I want to get the new surface and then split the white frame in a certain position. The first one would be zero and zero. That would be the top left. And I really want to draw what we are doing here. So we have a new surface that is a bit larger than the original frame. I.e. we have something like this. In there at the moment, we are taking the white frame and pasting it all the way in the top left. This would look something like this. So if the original monster was right in the middle, then this offset would give us an outline in the top left, something like this. In fact, I believe the best way to demonstrate how this is working is by first of all, returning the outline frame dictionary. That way we have one part of the outline inside of the monster frames that we can use in the battle class. We don't need check active anymore, but when we are creating a monster, I want to create one more class, which is going to contain all of the outlines. So right below the monster sprite, I want to create a monster outline sprite, which is going to need the monster sprite. It will be in self dot battle sprites. For the frames, I want to have the outline underscore frames. That's all we need in there. Although first of all, we will need the outline frames. Those we are going to get like we have gotten the frames for all of the monsters in the first place. I.e. in there, I want to have the outline frames, which we first of all get with self dot monster frames. And there we have out lines from which we want to pick monster dot name. Also really important, if we are on the monster side, we want to flip all of that, which means we want to overwrite the outline frames 
with basically the same thing we have done for the original frames. In fact, I can copy all of this. The only difference is that we now want to look at the outline frames.items. So with that, we have all of the arguments for the monster outline sprite. That means inside of sprites, right below the monster sprite, I want to have another class, monster outline sprite, which once again is pygame.sprite.sprite. .sprite. For the dunder init method, I want to have self, a monster sprite, the groups and the frames we want to display. Next up, I want to have super dunder init with the groups and we're also going to need self.z which we are getting from the battle layers and this one should be on the outline layer. We want to store self.monster sprite as monster sprite and then self.frames is going to be frames. Once we have that, we can actually create the sprite. We want to have self.image and self.rectangle. For the image, we want to have self.frames. Now for the state, I want to look at the monster sprite. Basically, for this monster outline sprite, I always want to have the same state and the same frame index from the monster sprite. That way we are linking the animations. Which means for frames, we will need self.monstersprite.state. And basically, we are getting this state. Next up, we will need the frame index. And for that, we have to change a few more things. Although that we can do inside of the animation. First of all, for the indexing, I want self.monstersprite.frameindex. After that, for the rectangle, self.image.getfrectangle. I want to place the center to wherever self.monstersprite.rect.center is. Now we just have to figure out inside of battle.py. Once a monster is ready, we want to display the outline. That we are going to do inside of the groups. Basically, we want to check for all of the sprites. If sprite.z is on battle underscore layers and the outline, i.e. we are only looking at the outline layers. And if it is not the case, we are simply drawing all of the sprites. However, if that is the case, we want to get the sprite and then look at the monster underscore sprite. Remember, sprite is the outline sprite, the one we have just created, which we don't really care about. We want to know if the monster sprite is selected. If this one is equal to the current monster sprite, then we want to self.displaySurface.blit with sprite.image and sprite.rectangle. Now, current monster sprite we do not have available, although that we can get via the parameter, i.e. inside of battle.py. When we are drawing everything, we want to pass in self.currentMonster. After that, we should be good to go, although I did realize that we are not importing the monster outline sprite. But once we have that inside of main.py, we are getting list index out of range. That happens inside of this line, where we are trying to assign a surface to the image. To diagnose what's going wrong here, let's print self.frames. If I now run main.py and scroll up a bit, we can see that we have a dictionary for the frames, but there are no surfaces inside of the list. That is an issue that happens inside of the outline creator function. To fix that, all we have to do is get the outline frame dictionary, then the monster along with the state, and append the new surface. The one with the outline and the white monster. Let's try off this again. And now there we can see something. So this is definitely making progress. And also when we are printing the dictionary, we are getting a whole bunch of surfaces. That is definitely making progress. And let me run all of this again. Once the first monster gets ready, 
We get a whole bunch of black stuff around it that we can get rid of in just a second. The really important part for now though is that we have a surface with a minor offset. That is what we actually want. And I think this part is getting a bit confusing, so let me go over it once again. We start with an outline creator. In there, inside of support, we are looking at all of the monster frames, and for all of those, we are basically expanding the original surface and filling it with a white color. These new surfaces we are then passing into another class, Monster Outline Sprite, which in turn is linked to Monster Sprite. Also, we don't need the print statement anymore. So this Monster Outline Sprite has basically the same frames as the Monster Sprite, i.e. the frames inside of this class are the same as the Monster Sprite, except they're white and a bit expanded. After that, once a monster is ready, we are setting it to the current monster, and then when we are drawing all of the sprites inside of groups, we are checking if a monster is currently selected, and then we are displaying the outline sprite behind it. For the logic, you might have to go over it a couple of times. It does get a bit more complex. Anyway, the first thing that I want to do is get rid of the black background. That doesn't look good. For that, inside of the new surface, I want to add another argument, Pygame.src alpha. After that, new surface dot fill with a tuple of 0, 0, 0, and 0. I.e., this new surface is entirely invisible. If I now run main.py again, we only get the white color. And that's already looking pretty good. We just have to get all of the other sides as well. So inside of support, I want to duplicate this line and then cover another side, which I can, for example, get with width and zero. If I now remain at pi again, we are getting two sides. And well, this we basically want to do for all of the other sides. And let me get rid of the comment. Besides width, I also want to get width times two. That way we are getting to the top right. Next up, width times two and width, that would be the center right. And after that, width times two for both arguments, this would be the bottom right. Next up, we want to have the bottom, this would be width and width times two. After that, I want to have zero and width times two. And finally zero and width. This would be the left side. Those are going to be all of the eight sides. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Looks good. If I now run main.py and the monster is ready, we get a white outline that isn't animated yet. So we do have a start, but we need just a bit more. Inside of the monster outline sprite, we want to add an update method. So define update, self, and delta time. Although delta time, we don't actually need. Let me add an underscore instead. After that, we want to get self.image, which we're getting from self.frames. Then I want to have self.monster sprite.state. And you might also be tempted to use self.monster sprite.frame index. Although for all of that to work, we will also have to cover the integer and the modulus. I.e., let me copy actually all of this and then paste it in there. Now this we have to update. We want to get the frame index from self.monster underscore sprite dot frame index. After that, let me copy this self.monster sprite dot frames and then also self.monster sprite dot state. With all of that, we are already getting a really long line, which isn't ideal, but inside of main.py, we are getting an animation. So this is kind of working, but not exactly something I like because this just feels a bit clunky. Instead, inside of the monster sprite, when we are animating all of that, I want to get a frame index that we can use inside of the outline sprite. All we really need in there is self dot, I call this one the adjusted frame index, which is going to be the integer of self dot frame index with modulus of the length of self dot frames 
with self.state. This is basically the same that we are doing on the next line. In fact, we can simply pass self.adjustedFrameIndex in there. And now that we have that, we can get this self.adjustedFrameIndex and pass it into this indexing operation via self.monstersprite.adjustedFrameIndex. The result should be the same. And that is looking pretty good. And now the logic inside of the monster outline sprite is also much more readable. Cool, with that, we know if a monster is selected. However, there's one more thing that I do want to do, and that's gonna happen inside of the monster sprite. You might actually be wondering, why did we set set highlight? Because inside of the group, when we are highlighting the monster, we are checking if the monster sprite is the current monster sprite. Why don't we just check if the monster is highlighted or not? The reason for that is that later on, we are going to have quite a few more conditions in there. And this is going to be the most efficient way of doing things. We are, however, still going to use the highlight value, although only for a short bit. Once the monster is selected, I want to always display the outline and then make the entire monster flash for a short bit, let's say around half a second. For that, I want to work inside of animate. If the monster is highlighted, i.e. if self dot highlight, then I want to get a mask again, i.e. I want to have, let's call this one a white surface, which we are once again getting from pygame.mask dot from underscore surface. The surface that we want to convert is self dot image. And after we have all of that, I want to go straight back to surface. That way we are getting the silhouette. From this silhouette, we want to remove all of the black pixels, i.e. set underscore color key, and I want to remove black. Finally, self.image is going to be the white surface. With that, if I now run main.py, we still have the battle, and now the selected monster becomes pure white. That is looking decent. After we have that, Inside of the monster sprite, I want to create a bunch of timers. Timers, and in there, I want to have self.timers, which is going to be a dictionary, in which for now, we have one timer to remove the highlight. This is going to be a timer that I don't think we have at the moment. All the way at the top, from timer, import timer. For the duration, let's say half a second. For the function, we essentially want to call set highlight and then pass in the Boolean false value, which we can do via a lambda function, in which we want to call self.setHighlight with a false value. That way we can insert arguments without calling them. After that, inside of set highlight, I want to check if value is truthy, i.e. if we are activating the highlight. If that is the case, I want to get self.timers with the remove highlight timer and then activate all of that. Also, what's really important inside of the update method, we have to go for timer in self.timers.values and then timer.update. With that, inside of main.py, we are getting a white flash for a short amount of time, and this might even be a bit too long. Let's change the duration to 300 milliseconds. And now, yeah, I think that looks a bit better. But once again, play around with the numbers and just see what looks good. Anyway, with that, we can work inside of the battle class, and I want to keep on working inside of check active. I want to check if the currently ready monster is one of the players. That I can do with if self dot player sprites in monster sprite dot groups. This means we are looking at the monster sprite, the one we are getting from the for loop, and we are checking all of the groups. And if the player sprites are inside of that group, then we know that a monster sprite of the player is currently ready. Just to test if this is working, let's print player monster ready. 
I can run main.py, and now we get player monster ready. That looks good. So inside of this if statement, we want to get some kind of option to display a menu, which I have done via another attribute, self.selection underscore mode, which I have called general. Now for that to work, we have to work a bit more inside of Dunder init under control, because in there we will need a few attributes. The one we have already seen is self.selection mode, which by default is going to be none. And later on, this one could also be attack, it could be switching a monster, things like that. After that, I want to have self.selection underscore side, which by default is going to be player. It could also be opponent. If that's the case, we can select the opponent monsters. Should be straightforward. And finally, I want to create self.indexes which is going to be a dictionary with a bunch of values. We have general with zero, then I can duplicate this a few times because besides that, we want to have a monster index, we want to have an attacks index, along with a switch index, and finally a target index. All of this is going to make sense in just a bit. But just to explain the outlines, imagine for selection mode, we have general, the one we are setting a bit further down. If that is the case, we have the monster, and then we want to display a couple of icons like so. Those would be for the attacks, defense, switching a monster, and catching a monster. The indexes we are then going to use to select one of these options. Or in other words, if selection mode is general and the general index is zero, we want to be up here. In fact, now that we have that, I want to add another section. I call this one the UI. And there I want to define draw general. Not only for custom parameters, in there we want to draw all of the general options. And just for some extra context, this is the end result where we have the four icons right next to the active monster. For that, we want to create a for loop that covers every individual item. And those we are getting from settings, because in there we have battle choices. We are getting the full choice if we are fighting a random monster, and we're getting a limited choice if we are fighting a trainer. The reason for that is if we are fighting a trainer, there shouldn't be a catch option. That one is only available for random monsters. We want to get the battle choices. For now, let's call this data in battle choices and print what we get. Although to actually see the output, we have to figure out when to call this method. And for that, I want to have another method, define draw UI. Basically in there, I want to check if self.currentMonster exists, and if that is the case, I want to check if self.selectionMode is equal to general. If that is the case, I want to call self.drawGeneral. This drawUI method we are then going to call inside of the update method on top of everything else, self.drawUI. For well, now, if I run the code and the monster gets ready, we are getting the different keys inside of the dictionary. So at the very least, we get something, but this isn't ideal. I suppose for a bit more detail, we could add items and then we get a little bit more information. Where we have the other dictionary with all of the positions along with an icon. At the moment, I always want to get the full amount. On top of that, I want to get the index via enumerate. That way I will get the index and then inside of a tuple, the option and a data dictionary. And just to visualize all of that, I have the index, I have an option and I have a data dictionary. Oh, and also don't forget, after the full dictionary, we want to get the items. If I now run main.py, we are getting all of the options. So in there, we have zero fight, one defend, two switch, and three catch, along with a position and an icon we want to display. That is all the information we need. So now we can draw a bunch of surfaces. 
And those surfaces we actually already have because inside of main.py we have imported all of the UI icons. If you look at the project folder under graphics and UI, we already imported this folder. And in there we, for example, have the hand, we have a hand highlight, we have a shield, a shield highlight, and a sword and a sword highlight. Oh, and also the arrows for switching a monster. Those are the icons that we want to use. Which means I want to get a surface and this I get via self.monsterframes and then I want to get the UI. The key I want to pick is what I'm getting from data dictionary and the icon. So if you look at settings, there we have a dictionary with a position and an icon. After that, we can create a rectangle which is going to be surface.get underscore f rectangle, where we are placing the center. And essentially, I want to get self.currentmonster.rect.mid right plus data dictionary and then the key position. The position here might not be the best name, it's more of an offset, where we are getting the right side of the monster and then adding these numbers. Anyway, once we have all of that, we can call self.displaySurface.lit with the surface and the rectangle. If I now run main.py and the monster gets ready, we get the options. They don't do anything at the moment, but at the very least, we can see something. Now, before we cover the input, there are two more things that I want to do. Number one, the currently selected icon should have an outline. And then every other icon should be grayed out. So the player has an idea of what is being selected. Now, this is going to be much easier compared to what we have done with the monsters. Because if you look at the UI folder, there we have, for example, the shield and then a shield highlight. Or in other words, if the current index is equal to the selected index, then we want to display the icon with the outline and then gray out everything else. For that, we have to work a bit more with the surface for which I want to add an if statement. If the index is equal to self.indexes and the general index, which at the moment is this one, so we're getting a zero, i.e. the first item should be selected, which means the surface should be the data icon. This would give us a value like sword or shield. But to that, we want to add an underscore. I think the easiest way of doing that is to turn all of this into an F string and then select the icon along with underscore highlight. And if that is not the case, else the surface should be simply the icon for now. And then we also are not going to need the F string. Let's see if this one is working. And this is a bit hard to see, but now around the sword, we have a white outline. I suppose we could change the general index to a two. And now we are getting a white outline around the switch symbol. So that's working pretty well. Although this value should be zero by default. Next up, for this surface that is not selected, I want to wrap all of this into pygame.transform.grayscale. That way, if I run main.py again, any icon that's not selected will be grayed out. That's looking pretty good. So now we can draw the general options, but they don't do anything. For that, we will need an input method, which I have put a bit further up. I want to have define input. And I guess I should add another comment for all of this. The first four methods would be the main methods. For input, I want to have self and no other parameters. And then we want to get all of the keys as always, which we are getting with pygame.key.get underscore just underscore pressed, which we can then use with keys. And for example, pygame.k underscore down. For now, let's add pass in here, because first of all, I want to outline all of the keys that we need. There aren't very many. We have key down, key up, and pygame.key space. These are the only input options. And the space key we can ignore for now. 
essentially, if the player presses K down, then I want to get self dot indexes along with self dot selection mode. I.e., at the moment, our selection mode is general. That means we are working with this number, which we want to increase by one. If we are pressing up, we are doing the same thing, except this number should get minus equal one. Although we do have to be careful here, if we don't have a selection mode, which is the case by default, this would give us an error. So we want to only check all of this if self.selectionMode, and just to be sure, self.currentMonster. There should only be an input if both of these are true. So all of this gets indented one more time, and then we have to make sure that we are actually calling the input method. Let's do it before we are doing anything else, self.input. If I now run main.py, we're getting the options, and if I press down or up, we are selecting a different icon. That works reasonably well, but I can go outside of this selection, which shouldn't be the case. So if you press up too much or down too much, nothing is being selected. To cover that part, we will need a limiter, which is going to happen inside of input. Basically, what I want to check is via a match case statement. I want to know what our current self.selection mode is, if there is the case general. Then I want to create a limiter, which will be the length of battle choices with the full amount. So at the moment, this number would be a four, which is a good sign because I want to limit this number to a four. So if we go to a five, we want to go back to a one. The way we are going to achieve that is we want to assign a new value, which is going to be self.indexes and the general index. And this we want to increase by one. But on all of this, we want to use modulus with the limiter. This we want to do for down and up, except for up, it should become a minus one. That should actually cover everything. Although I realize I have a typo, there shouldn't be a white space before general. Let's run main.py and then I can go down. And if I go to index five, we are starting from the beginning again. So that is working really well. Now the UI is working significantly better. Once we have that, we can check for the space key. First of all, in there, we want to check what kind of selection mode we currently have, which we do with if self dot selection mode is equal to general. If that is the case, we can add a few more if statements to check what the current index is. For example, if self dot indexes and general is equal to zero, then we want to print a tag. If this number is a one, then we want to print defense. If the number is a two, then we want to print switch. And finally, if the number is a three, then we want to print catch. Let's try that one. And if I print space on zero, we get attack, then defense, then switch and catch. So we can select one of the options and that works fairly reliable. What we can already work on is the defense. So the index being one. If that is the case, I want to self dot update all monsters and then resume things. On top of that, self dot current monster and self dot selection mode should be none. Finally, self dot indexes and general is going to be zero. That way we are resetting everything. And now if I run main.py, I can select defense and the game continues. And then we are selecting an opponent that's not ideal for testing purposes. That we can change inside of main.py for all of the opponent monsters. I want to have a lower level. Let's say we can go with five, three, and two. That way our monsters should always be faster. And then I get the other monster and this can also defend and we get our first monster again. 
So this part is already working quite well. We are making some decent progress. So next up, we can work on the attack and the switch logic. If the player selects the first option, we want to set self.selectionMode to attack. And then if the player selects number two, we want to go with switch. Although I think the selection mode for attack is actually called attacks, the one I have outlined up here. So with that, we can pick one selection mode, which means we have to draw a few more UI elements. We want to have define draw attacks with pass for now. And we want to have define draw switch with self and pass as well. To select one of those, we have to work inside of draw UI. If self dot selection mode is equal to a text, then we want to call self dot draw a text. And if self dot selection mode is equal to switch, then we want to call self dot draw switch. And let's get started with the attacks. For that, we have to start by getting the abilities in the first place. For which we want to get the current monster, then monster, and get abilities. The method that we already have inside of the monster, we have used that for the index. After that, I want to set a height for the box, which is going to be 200. I want to set the amount of visible attacks, which I want to keep at 4. Next up, I want to set an item height, which is simply going to be the height divided by visible attacks. Also, we are going to need a V offset, which for now is going to be zero. And by the way, the system that we are going to create will be very similar compared to the list that we have made for the index. So first of all, we need the data. After that, I want to create the background, for which we are going to need a BG rectangle, which is going to be a pi game F rect with a position and a size. The position we are going to ignore for now, so zero and zero. For the size, I want to have width and height, with the height being the height, and I realized I didn't set a width. Let's do it in the data part, width and height, and this should be 150 and 200. That way we can set width and height in there right away. This rectangle, we then want to move to a position. The point I want to place is the mid left, which is going to be self dot current monster dot rect dot mid right plus an offset that I have set to vector of 20 and zero. I.e. we are placing the mid left of this option to the right side of the monster plus 20 pixels. Once we have that, we can call pygame.draw.rectangle. We want to draw on self.displaySurface. The color we are getting from colors and white. Then we want to draw the BG rectangle. We want to have zero for the border width and then five for border radius. With that, if I run main.py and I select attack, we are getting an area that we can use for the attacks. Very good start. Next up, we want to display the actual attack options. For that, we will need for index and ability in enumerate abilities. For this one, we want to have a text. We want to have a rectangle, and then we want to draw all of this. First of all, though, we want to know if the current item is selected, which we are getting via index is equal to self dot indexes and a text. And for the text, I want to have a text color and a text underscore surface. For now, for the text color, let's simply go with colors, and the one that I want to choose is called light. Then for the text surface, I want to get self.fonts with the regular font and render it with the ability. 
then false and the text color. That way, we are getting some text that we can display. Next up, we will need to position that text, which we're doing with text rectangle. I want to get the text surface and then get a rectangle in which I'm placing the center. I want to get BG rectangle, i.e. the background rectangle for the entire bit, and the mid top of this point plus a vector that goes zero pixels left and right. And to that, I want to add the item height divided by two plus the index multiplied with the item height. Also to all of this, we want to add the V offset, although this one is zero at the moment. And just to explain the numbers, if this is the background rectangle, we want to place the attack options, let's say one here, one here, one here, and one here, and they should distribute the area equally so that we always have the same distance between them. The way I have approached that is I first of all set a starting position, which is this distance. And then to that, we are adding index multiplied by the item height, i.e. if this is zero, we are staying here. If this is one, we are going there. If this is two, we are going down here and so on. With that, we have a text surface and a text rectangle. So now we can self dot display surface dot blit with the text surface and the text rectangle. Let's try main.py. And if I select the options, we can see something. Although we already have the issue that there's an extra option at the bottom. Also, nothing is selected. And if I press down, the game crashes because we do not have the limiter variable. So let's go through all of this step by step. First of all, we have to re-enable the input. At the moment, this limiter does not exist because inside of match case, we are not checking for attacks. That we can fix fairly easily, case attacks. The limiter that we want to create is the length of self.currentmonster.monster.getAbilities. That way, if I run main.py, I can at the very least press up and down, although it doesn't do anything at the moment. But at least the game doesn't crash anymore. Inside of draw attacks, there are two things that I want to do to highlight the currently selected attack. I want to change the text color and then add a background. For that, we want to check if selected, then we want to get a specific color. However, if that is not the case, else, then we have the basic text color. For a more specific color, I want to get colors and then use the element of the attack. Let's store that one in a separate variable, element. This one we can get from the attack data that's currently not available. For that, all the way at the top, I want from game underscore data, import attack data we are importing this dictionary that we can use. And let me minimize everything inside of draw attacks. We have the attack data and then we have the ability. From that, we want to get the string element. And that element we can now use inside of the colors to create a text underscore color or rather a more specific text color for the text surface. Let's try main.py. And now inside of attack, we are getting something, but the selection doesn't really work. Something has gone wrong. And I believe I know what the issue is. Inside of input, when we are assigning a new index, this shouldn't be general. Instead, this should be self.selection mode. That way we can use different kinds of selection modes or rather different selection indexes. For draw attacks, we are using the attack index. So with all of that, let's try it again. And now I can kind of select all of the attacks. There's just one issue and that is the color for the normal attack just doesn't work well. That is because the element color for the normal attack is a pure white, which I don't really like. To fix that, I only want to get the element color if the element is different from 
normal. If that is not the case, else I want to get colors and black. And with that, if I now run main.py, we are getting a black color, which feels much better. Although I also want to have a background color. Below the text rectangle, I want to create a text BG rectangle. Pygame.f rect, for which we will need a position and a size. Position doesn't really matter, so we can go with zero and zero. For the size, I want to have the width of the entire thing and then the item height. After we have all of that, I want to call move2 to move the center to the text rectangle center. This rectangle we then want to draw, which we do with pygame.draw.rectangle self.display surface. For now, let's go with a red color and then text bg rectangle. After that, we have a bit too much red. The issue here is that we are drawing this rectangle for every single element, which is incorrect. We only want to draw it if selected. Let's try that one again. And now, there we go. This looks much more noticeable. It doesn't look great, but well, we have something. The most notable issue is that the red color just doesn't fit well. To get a better one, I want to access the colors dictionary. I want to use the light color for this one. And now inside of main.py, we are getting a color. Although I think this one is quite dark, so maybe not ideal. Instead, inside of settings, I want to add another entry that you are already going to have. I call this one dark white with a hex code of F0, F0, and F0. You should already have this entry. I simply forgot to add it. Let's try it now, and that is looking much better. There are two more things that we have to cover. Number one is this last item at the bottom shouldn't be visible, and if we go further down, there should be a scroll effect, like we have done for the list inside of the index. First of all, when we are drawing all of the elements, we only want to draw things that are inside of the BG rectangle. Which means I want to check if bg rectangle dot collide point with text rectangle dot center. On top of that, we want to check and select it. Inside of this if statement, we still want to check if an item is selected. And in there, we also want to do the blit operation. That should already do a bit. If I now run this again, we cannot see the last element anymore. So progress, but not ideal. To fix all of that, we have to work with the V offset. This one should only be zero if self dot indexes and attacks is smaller than the visible attacks. If that is not the case, else it should be negative self dot indexes and attacks minus the visible attacks plus one. All of that, we want to multiply with the item height. The very same thing we have done for the index. Let's try this one. And now if I scroll down, we are getting all of the elements. So that is looking really good. Perfect. The last thing that is a bit weird is the corner radius. That we have to fix inside of the drawing when we are drawing the text BG rectangle. Inside of selected, we want to check if text bg rectangle dot collide point with bg rect dot top left, i.e., we know we are at the top. If that is the case, we want to draw the entire thing with a border width of zero, a general corner radius of zero as well, then five and five for the top left and top right. Next up, we have an L if statement where we are checking. If the text BG rectangle collides with the BG rectangle mid bottom, although to that I want to add a vector of zero and negative one. If that is the case, I want to draw another rectangle. We want to have zero for the border width. The top left and top right should be zero and zero, but the bottom border radii should be five and five. 
after we have all of that, else we simply want to draw the general text BG rectangle. And with that, I can run all of this again. And that is feeling pretty good. So with that, we're getting all of the attacks and we get the attack type. That is making a lot of progress. There's just one more thing that I do want to cover. And that is that all of these attacks have a cost. And we should only display the attacks that are available. Or in other words, if you look at game data, you can see that all of the attacks have a cost. And if this cost is greater than monster.energy, then this attack should not be displayed. To implement that mechanic, we want to look at get abilities. I want to add another parameter, all that by default is going to be true. And then if all is the case, then I want to return what we are already returning. However, if that is not the case, so else, then I want to return all of the abilities that are available for this level. But then I'm going to add a second condition and attack underscore data, something that we currently don't have available. So all the way at the top from game data, import monster data and attack data. We want to check the one ability and then the cost. Only if that value is below self dot energy, then we want to return it. Which means inside of the battle, when we are getting all of the abilities, that happens all the way down here. I want to set all to false. The same thing we have to do inside of input. When we are getting the abilities there, all should also be false. Now inside of the game, this is going to be a bit hard to see, simply because this monster has a huge amount of energy and all of these attacks don't take very much. But for example, for heal, we could increase the amount by a lot. So that to heal cost could be 600, more than the monster even has. So now if we run main.py, this one shouldn't be visible. And it is not. So this one is working. And also with that, we have finished the draw attacks method. It doesn't actually do anything at the moment, but that we're gonna cover in the next part. Before that, I want to cover draw switch. That part is going to be your exercise. I want you to create the switch menu. You only have to display it like we have done for the attack menu. The actual functionality is going to come later and the end result should look something like this. So pause the video now and try this one on your own. To get started, we want to declare some data. I want to set a height and a width. Those numbers can be fairly subjective, but I went with 300 and 320. Then we want to have the amount of visible monsters, which I have set to four. After that, once again, we want to have an item height, which is the height of the entire menu divided by the visible monsters. Next up, we will need a V offset that we have done a couple of times by now so I can implement the entire thing straight away. Zero if self dot indexes, and now we are working inside of the switch index. And we only want to get zero if this number is below the visible, not attacks, but monsters. Else we want to get negative self dot indexes and switch minus the visible monsters plus one which we want to multiply with the item height. After that, we can create a BG rectangle, which is a Pygame F rectangle. For the position, we can as always go with zero and zero. And for the size, I want to have the width along with the height. Then I want to move this thing to a certain position, which in this case will be the mid left is self dot current monster dot rect dot bit right plus a vector of 20 and zero. That is going to give us a BG rectangle. 
let's draw it right away. Pygame.draw.rectangle self dot display surface. The color is going to be colors and white. And finally, we want to draw the BG rectangle. Let's try main.py. And now if I select switch, we are getting an error because of a typo. This should be pygame.f rectangle. Next attempt. And there we go. That looks pretty all right. I suppose the one thing that we do want to add is zero for border width and then five for corner radius. After that, we want to get all of the available monsters. The way I have approached that, first of all, I want to get all of the active monsters inside of a list. Or in other words, I want to have the monster sprite for monster sprite in self dot player sprites. Although I don't actually care about the sprite itself. That I want to have monster sprite dot index and monster sprite dot monster. That way we get the index of the monster and the actual monster data. Basically the same thing that we are getting up here. Or rather, we're getting something like this, where we have a monster along with an index to identify it. That is really important because later on we want to switch the monsters, so we have to know exactly what kind of monster we are working with. Although if you didn't include it for this part in the exercise, don't worry too much about it. That wasn't really part of the exercise. After that, I want to get self.available underscore monsters which has to be an attribute later on inside of the input that will become important. We want to create a dictionary with an index and a monster for index monster in self dot monster data of the layer. With that, we are copying all of the monster data. But that we only want to do if a certain condition is true. Oh, and also from the player monsters, we want to get the items. But we only want to get all of that if the index and the monster are not in active monsters. And I suppose also why we are here and monster.elf is greater than zero. If the monster has been defeated, there's no point showing it. But that's not too important for now. Anyway, with that, we are getting all of the available monsters, which we can then use inside of a for loop for index and monster in a numerate self dot available monsters dot values. To get started, we want to know what item is selected, which we're getting with index equals self dot indexes and switch. Next up, we will need an item bg rectangle. This is the equivalent of the text bg rectangle of the last part, i.e. I want to have an f rectangle. The position is going to be zero and zero and the size is going to be width and the item height. This we want to move to a specific point. Or in other words, I want to place the mid left of this rectangle. The X position is always going to be the left side of the background, i.e. BG rectangle dot left. For the Y position, I want to have the BG rectangle dot top plus item height divided by two to set a start point. And to that, I want to add the index multiplied by the item height. And don't forget to all of that, we want to add the V of set. Quite a long line, but I hope at this point you understand the logic. After that, I want to create an icon surface, an icon rectangle, a text underscore surface, and a text underscore rectangle. We want to display the icon of the monster and then its name. For the icon surface, I want to get self dot monster frames with the icons, the data we have imported earlier and then get monster.name. For the icon rectangle, I want to get the icon surface, get f rectangle, and place the mid left point. 
for the target position, I want to have a BG rectangle dot top left plus a vector of 10 for X. For Y, I want to get basically all of the stuff that we have done here, except BG rect dot top. So let me copy it in there. That way we're always getting to the vertical center for each increment. Next up, we have the text surface. That one's a bit easier. We simply want to get a font, self dot fonts, and I want to use the regular one and then render an F string with the monster dot name. And then in parentheses, monster dot level. For anti-alias, we want to have false. And for the color, I want to get colors red, but only if selected and else it should be colors black. Or in other words, we are simply picking one of two colors depending on the monster being selected or not. Finally, we have a text rectangle, which we're getting from the text surface dot get f rect. We want to place the top left to bg rect dot left plus 90. And for the vertical point, I can rect dot top. Now for the drawing logic, I want to have a for loop with surface and rectangle in the tuple that contains two tuples. I can surface and I can rectangle. After that, we have the text surface and the text rectangle. Inside of this for loop, we can then run self.displaySurface.blit with the surface and the rectangle. Quite a bit of stuff. Let's run main.py and let's see what crashes first. If I go to switch, we can see the monsters. But if I press down, the limiter doesn't exist. So not ideal. For that, we have to work inside of input and then add another case for switch. For the limiter, I want to get the length of self dot available monsters. Let's try all of this again. If I now go to switch, we can see all of the monsters that are available. That's looking pretty good. Also, the selection works just fine. Quite happy with that. I suppose the one minor thing that doesn't look terribly good is when we are getting the monster name, X surface. I want to have a space between the monster name and the level. A super minor point. I suppose there are two more major points that I want to cover. First of all, I want to have a selection background. So it's a bit more visible what is being selected. For that, if selected is the case, then I want to check if the item bg rectangle dot collide point with bg rectangle dot top left or any point at the top to be honest. If that is the case, I want to run pygame dot draw dot rectangle self dot display surface for the color. I want to have colors and dark white. Finally, then we want to have the item bg rectangle and there's one dot too much of zero and negative one. If that is the case, I want to draw another rectangle, although now zero for top left and zero for top right. That way only the bottom has a corner radius. Finally, if neither of those conditions are true, then I want to draw the item background rectangle without any corner radius. Let's try all of that and there we go. So with that, we can see a bit better what item is being selected. Next up then. I first of all want to make sure that we don't see more than four monsters, which at the moment isn't really the case because we only have four more monsters and most of them don't have any health. I suppose I could add a few more with a high level like so. And if I now run all of this again, when we are selecting the monsters, we can see too much. So this isn't great. To fix that, we want to have another if statement. If bg 
rectangle.collide point item bg rectangle dot center or in other words only if the center of the bg rectangle is inside of the main rectangle do we want to draw anything with that i can only see the monsters inside of the rectangle so that's working pretty well finally the last thing i want to do in here is i want to display the health rectangle and the energy rectangle for which we are going to need two rectangles health rectangle and energy rectangle. For both of those, I want to have a pygame.f rectangle. For the position of the health rectangle, I want to have the text rectangle dot bottom left. And to that, I want to add a vector of zero and four, simply to add a bit more padding. And then for the size, I want to have a hundred and four. Once again, numbers that simply look good. For the energy rectangle, the position is going to be the health rectangle dot bottom left with a vector offset of zero and two. The size of this one is going to be a bit less, let's say 80 and four. Finally, we can call draw underscore bar again, which I don't think we have at the moment which means I want from support import draw bar. And this class is already getting quite massive. But anyway, for draw bar, we are going to need a whole bunch of arguments. So let me do both at the same time. We want to draw on self dot display surface. The rectangle is going to be either the health rectangle or the energy rectangle. The two rectangles we have just created. For the value, we will need monster.health and monster.energy. Then we will need the max value, which is going to be monster.getStat with the max underscore health. For energy, we want to get the same thing, except it should be max energy. And then we need the color for the value, which is going to be colors with something that we'll cover in a second. And then the background color for both of those is going to be black. Now for the health bar rectangle, I want to have a red color. And for the energy one, I want to have a blue color. That should be it if I now run main.py. And I select switch, we are getting all of the monsters uh, along with the health and their energy. So that is looking pretty good, quite happy with that. We are nearly done. The last thing that I want to cover is going to be inside of input. The issue that I want to fix is if the player is inside of the attack mode or the switch mode and then wants to go back, then, well, there's no way of doing that. To fix that, we want to add one more input statement, which is to be on the same indentation level as the space key. I want to check if keys and pygame.k underscore escape. And in there, I want to check if self.selection mode is in a text switch or target. This one we haven't seen yet, but it's basically for targeting an opponent or one of your own monsters for healing. If this if statement triggers, then we want to set self.selection mode back to general. So with that, I can run the entire thing. I can click on attack. We still get the same options, but if I press escape, we go back to the selection menu. And then we can select other things like defend, and this still works really well. Cool, with that, we are done with this part. And for the next bit, we can start implementing actual functionality. In this section, we are going to finish up the outlines of the battle system, i.e. we are actually able to attack the opponents. The opponents can also attack us, we can switch monsters, we can catch an opponent monster, we can defend, and all the basic parts of the battle system. So by the end of this part, we basically have a game. To get started, I want to keep on working inside of battle, specifically inside of the input method. At the moment, we can go from the general selection to the attack mode, but then inside of attack, we can't really do anything. 
which means I want to add another if statement. And this one has to come before this if statement for the general mode. I'll explain in a second why. In there, I want to check if self.selectionMode is equal to it tags. If that is the case, there are three things that we want to do. We want to set the selection mode, and this we can do right away in code. Self.selectionMode should now be target, i.e. we are targeting either an opponent or one of our own monsters. Besides that, we want to have a self.selected underscore attack. This one doesn't exist yet. And we want to have self.selection site. This one we have created earlier inside of Dunder init. Selection site. By default, this one is player. And just to add the one additional attribute, self.selected attack. By default, this one is none. So we don't need Dunder init. And then we have to figure out the selected attack and the selected site. To get this selected attack, we want to get self.currentMonster, monster get abilities. And for this one, we only want to have the available ones, i.e. all should be false. This is going to give us the same list for the attack moves that we have seen in the menu, which means if we are using indexing with self.indexes and a attacks, then we are going to get the same attack. Let me comment out selection site and simply print self.selected attack. If I now run main.py, the game doesn't crash, that's a good start. And if I now press space, we get scratch and then things disappear and we are getting a limiter problem because now we have switched to the selection mode target. Let's comment this one out for now actually and run all of this again. Now I can select different attack moves and they line up with what we are seeing in the menu. So this part is working quite well. Let's try another monster. We get scratch, fire, battle cry, and explosion. So that is working well. With that, we can get the selection mode for target again, remove the print statement, and then I want to select a selection side i.e. are we targeting the opponents or our own monsters. That we can get via attack data and then self.selected attack. If you look at attack data, there we have a target, which can either be opponent or the player. And well, the only two attacks that we have that target the player are heal and battle cry. Everything else targets the opponent. Either way, we want to get the target. And if that selection mode is selected, then we don't want to have a UI element. We simply want to pick one of the opponent monsters. But first of all, for that, we will need another case for a new limiter. The case I want to target is called, well, target. And then we need to create a limiter, which will be the length of self.opponent sprites, but only if self.selection not mode, but side is equal to opponent. If that is not the case, else we want to get the length of self.player sprites. Or in other words, we want to know how many opponent monsters there are or how many player monsters there are. That is all we need in here. There's just one more thing that I do want to cover. And that is that we will need this selection mode for attacks before the selection mode for general. Let's go through this thing step by step. First of all, we are pressing space while having some kind of index. Via this index inside of selection mode, we know what option we want to pick. For example, if the index is zero, we want to go to attacks. And let's stick with that case. So at the moment, once we get to this point, we are continuing the code and nothing is going to happen. But on the next for loop of the game, we are getting to the attack mode and none of the selection mode general is being triggered. However, if that was flipped around, if we did all of this first, and then this part second, we would still check for pygame.space along with an index. Then we would trigger the attack, but then we are going straight to the attacks because those come right after. And because of that, we would trigger an attack right away. 
And having the right order of the if statements is, I think, the easiest way to solve that. You could also work with L if statements, but that could cause some other issues down the line. Anyway, for now, we want to target some opponent monsters. We don't have to worry about attacks anymore, and in general, we also don't need. Next up, I want to have if self.selection mode is equal to target. For that, first of all, we want to know what sprite group we are targeting, i.e., sprite group should be a local variable that we're going to get from self.opponent sprites if self.selection site is equal to the opponent. If that is not the case, else we want to have self.layer rights. So now we have a couple of sprites that we are looking at. But then we have to be careful. So imagine we have three opponent monsters. One, two, and three. And we want to select them via their index. So this would be index zero, one, and two. At this point, you might be tempted to take this sprite group, turn it into a list, and then use indexing. So if our target index is zero, we get this one. If the target index is one, we get this one, and so on. That would not be a good approach, simply because later on, it is totally possible to defeat one of the monsters. So this one wouldn't exist anymore. And if we then had an index one, we would get really confused. So essentially, we have to take this sprite group and then create a custom list from that. That has to be dynamic. I call this one the sprites, and that is going to be a dictionary where we get sprite and then the position underscore index as a key and the associated value is the sprite itself for sprite in sprite group, the thing we have just created. After that, we can get an actual monster underscore sprite, which we can get via the sprites and indexing. I want to have the list of sprites.keys. And on that, use indexing by ourself dot indexes along with the target. And just to make sure that this is working, let me print it, and then I will explain it in a bit more detail. But let's try main.py. If I have a monster ready, I can attack. And if I press space, we get a monster, another monster, and another monster sprite, although we can't really see the difference. I suppose what we should rather print is monster sprite dot monster. That's gonna make much more sense. If I now attack, we get monster, monster, and monster, along with the right name. So that is looking pretty good. That begs the question, what happened here? Especially the last line I think is going to be confusing. Let's do a few examples. The most important thing to understand is this sprites, which is going to be a dictionary where we have the position index and then the monster sprite. For example, we could have a dictionary with 0, 1, and 2 for the indexes, and then each of those have a monster attached. That is essentially what we have at the moment in our game. The keys of this dictionary we are then going to turn into a list, which means we have a list with 0, 1, and 2. After that, we are going to pick one of those keys via indexes from our target index. Let's imagine our target index is 1, that way, we would get a 1. If our target index was 2, we would get a 2. So that way, we're not really changing the number. However, let's do another example, where this dictionary is going to have only two values. We have one at index 0 with a monster, and then one at index 2 with a monster. We only have a monster on top and a monster on the bottom. The middle monster has been defeated. After that, once again, we are turning the keys into a list. So now we have a list with zero and two. And now imagine that our index is one, i.e. we want to pick the second monster. Via this system, this one is now becoming a two, while an index of zero for the selection would still be a zero. That way we always pick the right monster, even if there are gaps among the opponent monsters or amongst the player monsters, could also be a case. Anyway, with that, we don't need the print statement anymore. And next up, we have to actually highlight the targeted monster. 
for that part, we don't need input anymore and we want to work inside of battlesprites.draw with the current monster. So essentially the monster that we are currently targeting should have a white outline, like we have done for the currently active monster. To make that work, we will first of all need a whole bunch more arguments. And let's create the parameters first of all, inside of the draw method. Besides the current monster sprite, I want to have the site, I want to have the mode, then I want to have a target underscore index, and finally, I want to have the player underscore sprites along with the opponent sprites. After that, let me copy all of the parameters and then paste them after self.currentMonster. The site that we are working on, we're getting from self.selection site. The mode is going to be self.selection mode. Target index will be self.indexes along with the target. After that, we will need self.player sprites and self.opponent sprites. Quite a bit of data, but that is what we need to highlight the currently targeted monster. First of all, though, we have to do some setup. Like we have done before, I want to get the available positions. I want to get the sprite underscore group, which is going to be the opponent sprites if side is equal to opponent and else layer sprites. With that, we know what sprites to target. And then, like before, we want to create a dictionary with sprite.position underscore index and the sprite for sprite in sprite group. And finally, I want to get the actual monster sprite that is currently targeted. Sprites, then indexing with the list of sprites.keys along with the target index. Cool, and with that, we have a monster sprite. That means inside of this if condition, we want to add a second line via or. I want to check if the sprite dot monster sprite. And once again, as a reminder, the sprite that we are working with here is the monster outline sprite, which has one attribute that stores the monster sprite itself, which is what we actually care about. If this is equal to the monster sprite that we have gotten up here, then we want to create an outline as well. Let's try that part. If I now run all of this and I can select a monster, we get an outline for the targeted monster. So that is working really well. Quite happy with that. So we are making progress. Also, if I now press escape, we are getting back to the attack options. Let's use the shield because I think this monster has battle cry. This one should only target our own monsters. That is also working well, although for this part, I want to disable the monster highlight for the currently selected monster. Because without that, the selection here looks a bit weird. For that, inside of groups, when we have the first condition, we want to disable this part if the player is selecting the player monsters, which we can do via an and not I want to check if the mode is equal to target and side is equal to the player. Or in other words, we only want to highlight the current monster if we are not in target mode and the side is the player. Let's try that part. And now we want to get to Charmadillo and use Battlecry. And that is working really well. Now if I press space, nothing is going to happen, but we have a nice selection system. Which means next up, inside of battle.py, we want to work in the input method. And let me hide all of the if statements that we don't need to make this a bit less confusing. We still want to work inside of target. At the moment, we are only getting the current monster sprite that we have to use. The player is pressing space and we are in the target mode. After that, we are getting a monster sprite to target. And then we want to check 
if self dot selected attack. If that is the case, we want to attack a monster. Because remember, inside of selection mode attack, we have gotten a selected attack. Later on, we can also catch a monster. Then we have an else statement that for now is going to be pass. We have selected a monster sprite and we have an attack. That means we want to attack that monster. That unfortunately we cannot do immediately. Instead, I want to get self.currentMonster.activate underscore attack. Or in other words, what we are going to do, once we get to this part, we want the monster to play an attack animation. Once that animation is over, we actually trigger the attack, which means we have to work inside of the monster and give it two arguments. We want to have the monster sprite, or in other words, the target, and then we want to have self.selectedAttack, i.e. the attack that the monster is supposed to execute. After that, self.selectedAttack, self dot current monster and self dot selection mode should all be none. That way we can continue to the next monster. So inside of the monster sprite, we will need a method called activate attack. On sprites, monster sprite, we want to have, let's do it right above, update, define activate attack with self, a target sprite and the attack. And also let me minimize all the other methods so it's easier to see what's going on. If that is the case, I want to set self.state of the monster to attack. On top of that, we want to set the frame index to zero. That way we ensure we are always playing the attack animation from the beginning. Also, we want to set self.target underscore sprite to the target sprite. That way we can reuse it later on. And self.current underscore attack is going to be the attack. Both of these values we have to reuse in just a bit. Hence, we want to store them inside of an attribute. And for that to work properly, I want to create them as well inside of the dunder init method. Which means in there, I want to have self.target sprite, none by default, and self.current attack, which is also none by default. That covers this part. And the last thing that I want to do is I want self.monster.reduceEnergy, depending on what attack we are using. I.e., once the monster has attacked, we want to reduce the energy, and that happens inside of the monster. Remember, in here, we are storing the actual information. And for that, we will need another method define reduce underscore energy with an attack. And also we will need self. The only thing that we have to do in here is self dot energy minus equal the attack data, the attack, and then the cost of that attack, which has to be a string. Or in other words, inside of game data for the attack data, we are subtracting this cost from the energy of the monster. And that was quite a bit of code. Let's try main.py. I can still select an attack and I can select opponents if I now target one of them. The energy of the monster should decrease once I execute that. And it does. We now have a bit less energy and the monster is playing an attack animation. So that is working, but now the game doesn't do anything anymore. Small steps, I suppose. To continue, we have to work a bit more inside of the monster sprite. And we have to expand the animate method. Basically what we have to do, if the monster is animating, we want to apply the attack after an attack animation. Which means after we are increasing the frame index, I want to check if self.state is equal to attack. On top of that, and self frame index is greater or equal to the length of self dot frames and attack. So basically, with this if statement, we are checking if the monster is playing the attack animation and the animation has finished. If that is the case, we want to actually apply the attack. 
which we cannot do at the moment. But what we can do is set the state back to idle. That way, we are only playing the attack animation once. Let's try that part. If I now attack a monster with a different attack, we get an attack animation exactly once. So that part is working. So how can we actually apply the attack? For that part, we have a bit of an issue because we want to apply the attack inside of the battle class. And there we have all of the monsters. Now I guess inside of sprites, we would have the target sprite that we are getting from activate attack. We would have a target, but we also want to have the animations inside of battle. Really, we should have the actual attack logic in there. It also makes a whole bunch more sense. For that, I want to create another method. Define apply underscore attack, for which we want to have self, a target sprite, the attack that we want to choose, along with the amount of damage. For now, let's simply print the target sprite, the attack, and the amount of damage. Now, this apply attack, we have to get into the monster sprite, which we're going to do when we are creating the monster. There, we have a monster sprite, which is going to get one more argument, which is apply attack. For that to work, inside of this class, we will need apply attack as well, that we then want to store as an attribute self dot apply attack is apply attack. That way, once the attack animation is finished, we can call self dot apply attack. With the parameters we have just created, target sprite, attack, and amount. Target sprite is going to be self dot target sprite. The attack will be self dot current attack, and then we need an amount. For that, we have to look at the monster because in there we have the attack damage. Let's call it self dot monster get base underscore damage. And for this part, we want to know what attack we have selected, i.e., self dot current attack as an argument. And then inside of the monster class, I want to have define get base damage with self and an attack. The value that we want to return is going to be self dot get stat and attack, i.e., we're getting the attack damage. And this we want to multiply with attack data of the attack, and then we want to get the amount of damage or healing it does. I.e., if you look at game data, we have the amount. This we're going to multiply with the base damage of the monster. Or in other words, self dot gets that and attack is what we're getting from up here, where we are getting the base set of the monster and multiplying it with the level. This we are then going to multiply with the damage of the attack, and then inside of sprites, we are applying that amount, which means inside of battle, we should get a value. Let's try, and we are getting an error. That name apply attack is not defined. And that happens when we are creating a monster. This should be self dot apply attack when we are creating the monster sprite. Next attempt. And now, if I choose Scratch, we get one attack animation, and then we are printing the target sprite, the attack, and the amount of damage caused, or at least the base damage. This doesn't include defense or elements yet. But at the very least, we have something, so now we don't need setup or create monster, and we can work inside of apply attack. To cover what we want to do, Number one, we want to play an animation for the attack. Then we want to get the correct attack damage amount. Or in other words, we want to include the defense of the monster and the element type. For example, if a fire attack hits a plant, then we should double the damage. And if a fire attack hits a water monster, then we should half the damage. Next up, we want to update the monster health, and then we want to resume the game. And I guess we can go through this step by step. Number one, we want to play an animation. For that, I want to create another sprite called attack sprite. 
this we have to create inside of the sprites. I want to have class attack sprite. For the parent class, this one is going to get the animated sprite. The one we created ages ago. This one here. Because ultimately, all that this attack sprite is going to be is it will place an animation. But this animation, it's only going to play once and then disappear. Or to visualize all of this a bit better. If you look at the graphics folder, there we have the attacks, which contains a couple of animations. Those we want to play once after the monster has attacked. We also need to import them, but that's going to come later. First of all, define init with self, a position, frames, and groups. Then super dunder init, where we are initializing the animated sprite, which means we want to have position, frames, and groups. After that, we are also going to need a Z layer that we are this time getting from the battle layers. And on there, we want to get the overlay. Also, when we are creating this animated sprite, we are setting the rectangle position to the top left, which I don't want to do anymore. Instead, I want to update self.rect and place the center to the position. That way we can place the attack right in the middle of the target monster. After that, we need an animate method with self and delta time. In the original sprite, we are simply playing the animation forever, which works in the overworld, but for this monster, we want to play the animation once and then destroy the sprite. For that, we want to get the frame index and increase it by the animation speed multiplied with delta time. After that, if self dot frame index is smaller than the length of self dot frames. If that is the case, we want to update self dot image, which is going to be self dot frames with the integer of self dot frame index. No need for modulus because we are already checking if we are inside of the length of the list. If that is not the case, else we simply want to destroy the sprite using the kill method. And finally, we have to call update with self and delta time, and then call animate in there with delta time, and do not forget self. That way, we have an attack sprite. It's fundamentally a fairly simple class. After that, inside of battle.py, we have to import it. So import attack sprite, which means to apply the attack sprite, I want to get the target sprite rect dot center for the position. After that, we will need the attack frames, which we don't have at the moment, but we're going to get them in a bit. Self dot monster frames, they're going to be in that dictionary. And there we have the attacks. Or in other words, in just a bit, when we are importing the assets, Inside of the monster frames, we're going to add one more key value pair. To pick one animation from that, we want to get the attack data along with the current attack. And then from this entry, we get an animation. Or in other words, if you look at the attack data, at the end, we have an animation. Finally, we are going to need the groups all the way at the end, self.battle sprites. So that's going to cover the attack sprite. The one thing that we don't have yet are the frames for the attack. For that, we want to look at main.py and add an attacks key along with a value. And for this one, I want to create an attack importer. For the file path, we want to go up a folder, then to graphics, and then we have the attacks. So next up, we have to create one more import method, which is going to be define attack underscore importer, for which we are only going to need a path. Then we are going to create a new dictionary for all of the frames that is empty by default. After that, for folder path, the subfolders we don't care about, and the image names in walk join and the path unpacked. After that, for image in image names, 
And then we get all of the image names inside of this folder. First of all, in there, I want to get the image name, which is going to be image.split, wherever we have a dot, and then we want to pick the first item. That way we get rid of .png at the end. And then we can get the attack dictionary and assign a new key value pair. The key is going to be the image name. The actual value we are going to get from import tile map. Because once again, if I open this thing, we have tile maps. Each animation is four frames that we want to isolate. Which means for import tile map, we have four columns, one row, and the path to this folder is going to be the folder path along with the image name. This would return another dictionary with key value pairs where the key would be the column and the row and the value would be the actual surface. And in this case, we are lucky because we don't care about the keys at all. We only want to get the values. And all of that, we want to turn into a list. That is simply because when you look at all of the animations, they are always in one row. Hence, the position doesn't actually matter. And finally, I can return the attack dictionary. And that should be it if I now run main.py and I attack a monster, we get an attack animation, and that is looking really good. That took a while, but we got there in the end. So with that, we can play an attack animation, and I suppose we should try this a second time with another monster. Let's try this one, and let's go with explosion. And that's also working pretty well. Finally, one more attempt is going to be not this monster, but the second one, because in there we have Battle Cry. And let's try to heal this monster. And that is working. Also, notice for this one, we are getting a negative amount. That means later on we are going to heal. So, next up, we want to get the correct attack damage. For that, first of all, we will need the attack element which we can get from attack data, the attack, and then the element. For the target element, we want to get the target sprite. In there we have the monster, and the monster has the element. After that, I want to double the attack if the attack element, for example, is fire and the target element is equal to sand. That would be one condition. If that is the case, we want to get the amount and multiply it by two. Or in other words, the damage we're getting from the monster is now twice as strong. And well, for this part, we have to cover the other conditions as well. There are only three in total. We want to check if attack element is fire and the target element is plant if the attack element is water and the target element is fire. And finally, if the attack element is plant and the target element is water. If any of these conditions are met, then we are doubling the attack damage. And the opposite we can do half attack. For that, let me simply copy the if statements in which we want to multiply the attack damage with 0.5. So for example, if the attack element is fire and the target element is water, then the attack is going to be weaker. This could also apply if the attack element is water and the target element is plant, or if the attack element is plant and the target is fire. So with that, we are incorporating all of the elements. And this system is only going to work if you have very few elements. If you have more than that, it's going to cause issues. But I think for our purposes, this is still totally fine. Although we do not include the defense of the monster. Or in other words, if you look at the game data and monster data, all of the monsters have a defense stat. This we also have to include. The way I incorporated that one is I have created a target underscore def which I want to be a value between 0 and 1. The higher the defense of the monster is, the lower of a multiplier we want to have. 
First of all, I'm getting the target sprite dot monster dot get underscore stat. And I want to look at the defense of the monster. Just to demonstrate what we are getting, let me print the target defense. If I now run all of this, we are getting an unexpected character. I think it just doesn't like the slash here. Speaking of which, the or shouldn't be there either. Next attempt, main.py. The game doesn't crash anymore, good start. And now if I target a monster, we are getting name element not defined. Things are going great. That happens because the element here should be a string. Next attempt. If I now attack again, we are getting something. These numbers we are getting from these four print statements, where the first one is the target defense. For this monster, it's 20. Or in other words, the monster we have is going to be this one, Aatrox, at level 2. And inside of game data, if you find Aatrox, we have a defense of 10, and this we multiplied by 2. That way, we are getting 20. Now this 20, I want to turn into a fraction, something like 0 0.8 or 0 0.9. That if the monster has a very low defense value, we want to get 90 something percent of the attack damage. For that, I want to subtract the value from one. That way we would get negative 19 at the moment. To fix that, I want to divide this value by 2000. That way this 20 is going to become a really small number. And that we are then subtracting from the one. Let's try this again. And if I attack the monster with the same attack, we're getting 0 0.99. Since this monster is super weak, the defense shouldn't really matter that much. However, if we increase the level of the monster to, let's say, 15, and run all of this again, if I now attack the monster, this is 0 0.925 which I think is pretty good. Now, this 2000 here you can play around with, depending on how strong you want the defense to be. But that you can do in your own time. In my case, I want to get the target defense again, because we have to make sure that this number doesn't become negative. If that was the case, an attack would heal the monster, which, well, would be weird. For that, I want to use max with zero, along with min, just to be sure that we stay between one and the target defense. With that, we have the proper target defense amount. Finally, with that, we can update the target sprite.monster.health minus equal the amount multiplied with the target defense. That should actually be visible in the game. If I now run all of this and I attack this monster, the only one with health, we are reducing the amount of health. And now that we have that, inside of the monster, we don't need the random amount for health and energy anymore. If I now run main.py again, we have the full amount for everything. And if I attack this monster, we are reducing the amount of health. So that is working really well. Although after that, nothing is going to happen and we also don't need a print statement anymore. Instead, what we want is to resume the game, which we do with self update all monsters and resume. So next attempt and I can still attack. And after that, the game continues. So let's try a different monster, this one. And it's a low level, so it takes a lot of damage but the game itself is working really well. I suppose what we should be doing after we are applying the damage, I also want to self.check underscore death. That's gonna be another method and we don't need apply attack anymore. But below that, we will need define check death. No need for custom parameters. And in there, we want to look at all of the sprites for monster sprite in self dot opponent sprites dot sprites plus self dot layer sprites dot sprites. We know a monster is that if monster sprite dot monster dot health is below zero. After that, we want to separate the opponent monsters from the player monsters. 
which we can check if self dot player sprites in monster sprites dot groups. Once again, player sprites is the sprite for all of the player monsters. If that is in any of the groups of the currently selected monster sprite, then we know we are on the player side. Let me add a comment. Player. Now in this case, we want to ignore for now. So let me add a pass in here. What we care about are the opponent monsters, which are going to live inside of the else statement. For now, what we can do is simply monster sprite dot kill. Although that is not going to work perfectly yet. But let's try. If I attack this monster and attack it a second time. Okay, needs a third attempt. There we go. Now it disappears. But, well, there's lots of stuff missing. Let's go through it one by one. When we are checking death, we already know if the monster is below zero in terms of health. So we know if the monster is supposed to be dead or not. And if that is the case, we want to create a new monster. That way, once we are killing a monster, we are replacing it, but only if there is a monster. So for example, for the dummy monsters, we can only see these three monsters. So if one is selected, we should select the next available one. But that we can cover later. Also later on, I want to implement an XP mechanic, but that we can ignore for now. And there's another issue, and that is, when you look at sprites, once monster sprite has been defeated, we can still see monster name sprite, monster level sprite, and monster stat sprite, which obviously is not what we want. To fix that, let's start with monster name sprite. This one is going to need an update method. With self and delta time, we can ignore, so underscore. We basically want to check if this monster sprite has been killed or not, or rather, in terms of monster sprite, we want to know if this monster sprite is still around. Now, what you have to be aware of, when we are calling the kill method on a sprite, we don't actually destroy the sprite. Instead, what we do is we are removing it from all of the groups. That way, it doesn't really do anything anymore. That behavior we can use, because inside of update, we want to check if not self.monstersprite.groups. Sprite.groups is going to give you all of the groups inside of a sprite. If the sprite isn't at any groups, this will give you an empty list, which would trigger this if statement. If that is the case, we want to call self.kill. The same logic we want to apply to all of the other sprites as well, which means inside of monster level sprite, let's do it all the way at the bottom. I want to check for death. And then finally, inside of the update method of the stat sprite, I also want to check for the same condition. There we go. And make sure you don't accidentally put this if statement inside of this for loop. Cool. With that, we have the monster stat sprite, the monster level sprite, and the monster name sprite. Now we should also put the same thing inside of monster outline sprite, just so we don't have some random sprites in the game. With that, I can now run main.py again. And if I attack with the splash attack, this monster is fire, it should disappear. And there we go. Now we have gotten rid of the monster entirely. Also, if I now select one of the other monsters, we are getting the proper selection behavior. That is because of the logic we implemented earlier. That part is working pretty good. Cool. So next up, I want to check if we have a new monster, which I will store in a variable new monster data. This is going to be a tuple that has a monster, it has an index, a position, index along with a side, or rather an entity, so player or opponent. Although for that to work, we need to do a bit of groundwork. When you're looking at the dummy monsters, we have five monsters in total, and three are on the battlefield. If one of them dies, let's say this one goes away, we want to replace it with the first available monster. In this case, Jakana with level two. In other words, the first thing that we need is to isolate these two monsters. Or in other words, what I actually did, when we are running the setup method, we are creating all of the monsters. But on top of that, I want to remove the opponent monster data. Since the opponent can't really change monsters, once a monster is on the field, that monster will get deleted from the monster data. 
or in other words, I want to look at for i in range length and self dot opponent sprites. Let me print what we get. i, if I now run main of pi, we're getting the indexes 0, 1, and 2. Using those indexes, I want to delete self.monster data with the opponent and then using the index. As a consequence, after we are setting everything up, I want to print self.monster data with the opponent. And now inside of main.py, we are only getting monster3 and monster4. And then if one of the monsters has been defeated, we want to pick the first one and store it inside of monster data. In other words, I want to get self.monster data with the opponent. And from that, I only care about the values. All of that we want to turn into a list and then pick the first one. To get the index and the position index, I simply want to get the monster underscore sprite that was defeated and then get their index and position index, which we are already storing in there. Finally, the entity. Since we know that this else statement is only triggering for the opponents, this one is always going to be opponent. There's one more thing that we have to do all the way at the end. We only want to run this entire line if self.monster data and opponent does exist. If it does not, else we should get none for this value. Or in other words, we only want to get a new monster if there are any values left inside of the dummy monster dictionary or whatever dictionary we have for the opponent. Now that we have a new monster, we also have to make sure that we are getting rid of this monster from the monster data dictionary. For that, I want to check if self.monster data with the opponent. And if that is the case, I want to delete self.monster data of the opponent. And I always want to get rid of the lowest key i.e. minimum self.monster data and the opponent. That way we can get a new monster and remove the previous one. So with that, we have to create a new monster after we have killed the current one. But there's one more thing that I want to do. I don't want to kill the monster immediately because it looks a bit weird. Let me run main.py again. If we kill a monster, let's say this one, it disappears way too fast, which doesn't look good. So instead of killing the monster right away, I want to call monster sprite dot delayed underscore kill, and then pass in the new monster data. Also really important, this delayed kill is going to apply to the player and the opponent monster. Hence, it shouldn't be inside of this if statement, but it should be inside of this if statement to check if the health is below zero. So I have to indent it one more time. Although the XP comment does need to be inside of the else statement, like so. And now we have to figure out a delayed kill method inside of the monster sprite. I want to minimize all of the methods and then create define delayed kill with self and a new monster. There are two things we want to do in here. First of all, self dot, let's call this one the next monster data, which is going to be the new monster. After that, we want to start a timer that we are getting from Dunder init that we already have a remove highlight timer. Besides that, I want to have a kill timer which is going to be a timer with a duration that I have set to 600. The function we want to call once it times out is self.destroy. Inside of delayed kill, self.timers with kill and activate. On top of that, I want to make sure that we don't accidentally call this one multiple times, which we can do with if not self.timers the kill timer and active. 
i.e. we only want to run all of this if the kill timer currently is not active. After that, define destroy. No need for custom parameters. All we really want to do in here is to call the kill method. And on top of that, if self.nextMonsterData, then we want to self.create a monster, which is the method that we have inside of the battle class, create monster. For this one, we are going to need monster index, position index, and entity, which coincidentally are the same methods that we have inside of the new monster. In there, we have a monster index, position index, and the entity, which means to create this monster, we simply have to unpack self.nextMonsterData. Although before that, we have to get create monster into the monster sprite, which we can do via another parameter, create monster. And don't forget to store it as an attribute, self.createMonster is create monster. Also, when you are creating a new monster inside of the monster sprite, we have to add self.createMonster. That should actually be it. If I now run main.py and I kill the second monster, it disappears, and after a while, we're getting a new monster. We can defeat that one as well, and at some point, we should run out of enemies. Oh well, we're getting list index out of range, but we're getting something. Now to fix this error, we want to look at groups and then work inside of this if statement, in which we are checking for the outlines. The second part of that if statement, this line is causing the issue. And to fix it, we want to add a bit more. Sprite dot monster sprite dot entity is equal to the side. That way, we are checking if we are on the player or the opponent side. On top of that, I want to check if mode exists and if mode is equal to target. That way, we have quite a bit more. So now let's try to run the game again. It doesn't crash. And if I get rid of enemies, they still disappear. And it doesn't seem like we are crashing anymore. Although now an opponent is active, so we can't do anything anymore. So that we can work on next. Now, for the monster attacks, we want to work inside of the battle class. Let me collapse everything and then look at check active. At the moment, we only do something if the player monster is ready. However, if the opponent monster is ready at the moment, we simply stop the game. And this we want to extend via an else statement. I want to get self.timers with, let's call this one, opponent delay. And that timer, I want to activate. If this is the timeline of the battle, at some point, one of the opponents can attack. But that I don't want to happen right away. Instead, I want to highlight this monster for, let's say, around half a second. And only after that are we going to trigger the attack. Because of that, we have a timer that is going to trigger after 600 milliseconds. And before that, we are highlighting this opponent monster. So the player is aware that there is going to be an attack. That being said though, timers doesn't exist inside of the battle class at the moment, or at least I don't think it does. No, it doesn't. Let's create it all the way at the top. I want to have some timers. Self.timers. It's going to be a dictionary. And the timer that we have just created is called opponent delay. The associated value will be a timer with a duration of 600. And the function we want to trigger once it times out is self.opponent underscore attack. Although I think we also have to import from timer the timer class. So right at the end of the battle system, I want to have define opponent attack. There are three things that we want to do in this method. We want to get the ability of the monster. Then we want to get a random underscore target. And finally, we want to get self.currentMonster and then activate attack with the random target 
and the ability. And as a reminder, activate attack is what we already have inside of the monster sprite. So somewhere in there we have activate attack. That way we are reusing the logic from the player monsters, which is quite handy. Although before we are going to work on that, there's one more thing that I do want to do inside of the main section, and that is going to be update timers. All we are going to do in there is for timer in self dot timers dot values and then timer dot update. As a reminder, for all of the timers that we have, at the moment it's only one, but there are going to be more, we have to call the update method on every single timer. Otherwise, nothing is going to happen. That we can do via a method, and that method we have to call inside of the update method. Let's do it right after the input. self.update timers. With that, we can get the ability and the random target. After that, we should have a monster attack from the opponent. That part will be your exercise. I want you guys to get the opponent monster ability and the target. Pause the video now and see if you can figure this one out. For the ability, I want to get self.currentMonster.Monster .monster and then get underscore abilities. And from that, I want to get a random value, which I get via choice. That we have to import via from random import choice. That would give us the ability. And let's simply try for now if this is working at all. Meaning I want to print the ability and then inside of main.py in the dunder init method, the first monster can get a level of 50. So it gets ready really fast. Let's try. And there we are getting one of the abilities. Let's try it again. We should get a different attack and we do. That looks good. After that, we will need the random target. For this one, we do have to be a bit careful because if you look at attack data, and let me minimize everything. If we get an attack like burn or spark or scratch, we now want to target the player. Whereas if we have heal or battle cry, we want to target our own team. The naming here isn't ideal, but I hope you get the idea. I want to first of all get the side, which we get from attack data. We're using the ability to pick the data. And after that, we want to get the target. And once we have that, we can check. If side is equal to player, then we want to get a random target of our own team. Meaning random target will be choice of self dot opponent sprites dot sprites. And else we want to get a random target that will be choice of self dot player sprites dot sprites. That way we're getting a random target. Let's print it, random target, and run all of this again. We are getting a monster sprite in two sprites. Okay, that wasn't particularly helpful. We could instead print random target dot monster. That should be better. And now we're getting a monster, which is Friolera level 29, one of our monsters. And just to test the other side, inside of game data, for the monster data, when we are looking at Aatrox, this one, we can change its abilities to only be able to heal. That way, if I now run main.py again, and this thing is running, we are getting monster Gulfin level five. So that is also working. Although this I don't actually want to do. With that, I can get rid of the print statement. And I think five lines for something so simple isn't really necessary. So let's reorganize this a bit. I want to assign the random target to the opponent sprites, but only if attack data ability and the target is equal to player. If that is not the case, else we want to assign a random value from the player sprites. And if you have a bit more space, this is also still readable, but well, the same logic applies. Finally, we can get self.currentMonster.ActivateAttack with a random target and an ability. Let's try that. And we're getting attack and something happens. And now I can do something as well. And things are coming together.
And with that, we are getting to the next error, where we don't have a new monster data. That happens because when we are checking the dev, and one of our monsters has died, because when the player monster dies, nothing is really specified yet. That we do have to work on. For that, we want to get all of the active monsters, which needs to be in a list where we have an index and the monster. That we can get via list comprehension. I want to get a monster sprite for monster sprite in self dot player sprites dot sprites. That being said, I don't want to get the monster sprite itself. I want to get a tuple with monster sprite dot index and monster sprite dot monster. I suppose remember for new monster data, we want to get the actual monster and the index. And that's what we are getting in here. After that, we also need to know the available monsters, which is going to be another list comprehension where we're getting a tuple with an index and a monster. That we can get quite easily because we can do for index and monster in self.monsterData of the player. And from that, we want to get all of the items. However, there are a few conditions that apply here. Which means if monster.health is greater than zero, i.e. we don't want to place a dead monster, and we want to check if index and monster is not in active monsters. Or in other words, we don't want to pick a monster that's already on the field. Once we have all of that, we can create new monster data. For that, we can use list comprehension a third time, and I want to create a tuple with a monster, the index, the position index, and then the entity, i.e. the player. To get that, I want to use for index and monster in available monsters, i.e. we are looking at all of the available monsters and then we are reorganizing the data. Monster we can keep, index we can also keep, although for the position index, we want to have the current monster underscore sprite and then get the position index from that one. Now this would give us a list and we only care about the first value, i.e. index zero. However, this I only want to do if we have available monsters in the first place, i.e. if available monsters has any kind of value, then we want to create a new monster data. If that is not the case, else new monster data is simply going to be none. Let's try that. And if I now run the game, we can get attacked. So let me defend and at some point one monster should die and we get another monster. That looks pretty good. Also, if I destroy one of the opponent monsters, they also get a new one. So that is looking pretty good. With that in place, we can work on the XP mechanic. Meaning if we defeat one of the opponents, we're getting some XP. For that, first of all, we have to figure out the XP amount, which we can get from the current monster sprite dot monster dot level. And I simply multiply this with a hundred. And this value, I want to spread equally across all of our player monsters that are currently on the battlefield i.e. divide by the length of self.player sprites. And after we have that, I can simply do for player sprite in self.player sprites player sprite dot monster and then update XP with the XP amount. This method does not exist inside of the monster, which means in the monster, I want to minimize everything and then create a new method, define update XP with self and an amount. In the most basic sense, all that we want to do in here is self.xp plus equal the amount. And I think we already have XP, yeah we do. So in there at the moment, we only have a random value, but this one by default should be zero. And let's try all of that. If I run the game and we defeat one of the opponents, 
all of our monsters get a bit of XP. This might be hard to see, but if you look at the black bar, now we get a very small amount. If I defeat another opponent, this might be more visible. There we go. If you look for it, you can definitely see it. So that part is working. And also, I want to set the level of Aatrox back to something like 10, so the game runs a bit faster. After that, I want to expand the update XP method to incorporate a level up. The way I approach that is I first of all check if self.level up minus self.xp is greater than the amount. If that is the case, we simply want to add the XP to the amount and nothing else is going to happen. We are not going to level up. However, if that is not the case, else, then we know via the current XP amount, we are going to reach the next level. Which means self.level plus equal 1. On top of that, we have to increase self.level up, which is simply going to be self.level multiplied with 150. And finally, we want to retain some of the XP, self.xp. Or in other words, for a monster to level up, let's say we need 200 XP. And at the moment, the monster is at 150 and then gains 100 additional XP. We are going to level up at XP 200. But then we also want to retain the XP that are overshooting, which we can get via the amount minus self.level up and minus self.xp. And that part is going to be a bit difficult to visualize, but let's see how far we get. So I want to defeat some opponents. And you can see for Lavia at the bottom, this should happen fairly soon. Let's defeat this one. And we are nearly at the level up. Let's defeat this one. And there we go, Lavia leveled up. That's a good start, but we don't get any more XP and we get list index out of range. So two things that we have to cover. Number one, the XP mechanic. For that, inside of the monster, we have to change XP before we are updating level up. That way, if I run main.py and let's kill this one, then we can kill this one. We are very close to a level up. Okay, a bit more. I guess we can defeat this one and then... And there we go. Lavia leveled up and we retained the extra XP. Although now, if I defeat the other enemy, we're getting an error message that we have list index out of range. And that happens for two reasons. Number one, inside of the groups. We're getting an error because inside of the sprites, the ones that we have created here, we have no content. Well, actually, there are two possible cases why this could go wrong. Number one is when there are no more enemy monsters, this value is empty, so any indexing operation would give us an error. That is an issue we can fix right away. Simply by adding if sprites, and if that is not the case, none. So in other words, we only do all of this if there are any sprites left whatsoever. And that is going to do something, but there's still another issue. And that is, if I only destroy the middle enemy, so let me always target the one in the middle, like so. At some point, once we run out of monsters, we're going to get an error. That is list index out of range in the same line. That error happens inside of battle.py when we are updating the target index. Basically, the way you have to think about it is that when we have three enemies and we're getting rid of one of them, we have to update the index as well. Otherwise, we're getting this error here where we are trying to get a number too large for the list. The way I have approached that inside of input, all the way at the bottom, after we have gotten the last general, I want to set all of the indexes back to zero, i.e. we are doing, let me minimize this, we are checking for all of the different inputs, and then we are setting self.indexes to k and zero for k in self dot 
indexes. So in other words, we are taking this dictionary, we are copying all of the keys, and then for the value, we always have a zero. That way, after we have done any kind of input and we go to the next monster, we start again from scratch. Oh, also, this indexes, we only want to trigger when we are pressing space. Let's try all of that. And I'm gonna start by always attacking the middle monster. Because that earlier caused the most issues. However, I also want you guys to pay attention to when I'm selecting one of these attacks. Earlier, we always kept the same index. If I select the fourth item or the one with index three and I use it, when we selected the next monster, we got the same index, but now we always start at the top, which feels much cleaner. So let me, oh, that was the wrong monster, but this seems to be working reasonably well. So for the final one, disappears, and there we go. Now we can't really do anything anymore, and we're getting an error, but that doesn't really matter. Once we get to this case, we want to end the battle anyway. Although that is going to come later. First of all, though, I can minimize the input and the dunder init method, and then work on the next part, which actually happens inside of input. Because in there, we currently can attack a monster, but we cannot catch one. So that we have to account for as well. To explain that mechanic, let me run the game again. And essentially, once a monster is ready, I want to select the target monster, and then, at the moment, we are only printing catch, so that doesn't do anything. Which means, inside of battle, once we get to catch, we want to do more than just print catch. I want to set self.selectionMode to target, and self.selectionSide should be the opponent. That should already do quite a bit. If I now run the game and I go to catch, we can select one of the opponent monsters. Although if I press space, we don't really do anything. And for that, we're going to need this else statement. So basically at the moment, we are in selection mode target, but we do not have a selected attack. And in there, I basically want to check if monster sprite dot monster and health is below 10% of the max health, which we can get via monster underscore sprite dot monster and get stat max underscore health. And that we can multiply with 0.1 or whatever number you think works well. If that is the case, I want to update self dot monster data with the layer and then add a new index and assign the monster. The monster we can get from monster sprite dot monster, and the index is simply going to be the next number. Or in other words, at the moment, we have 11 monsters, meaning the next index should be 11. To get that inside of the monster, I simply want to get the length of self dot monster data of the player. On top of that, I want to get the monster sprite and run the delayed kill method with none. That way the monster disappears after a few milliseconds. And finally, we have to self.update all monsters and resume the game. If that is not the case, else we want to do something else, but for now I simply want to print cannot catch monster. Let's try all of this first. And while we are testing things, I want to set the catch rate to let's say below 90%. That's gonna make things much easier to test. If I now run main.py and I attack one of the stronger monsters, that should be good. And now if I catch this one, it disappears. And if I switch the monsters all the way at the bottom, we should have another monster that looks good. Although if I press space, nothing is going to happen at the moment. So that we do have to work on, but step by step. First of all, this is working. Next up though, if the player tries to catch a monster with too much health, then I want to create a timed sprite. Or in other words, I want to display a sprite for a very short amount of time. Now the image that I want to display is going to be inside of graphics in UI. There we have a cross. 
If the player tries to catch a monster with too much health, I want to display this cross over the monster for a short period of time. And for that, we are going to use the timed sprite. In terms of arguments, I want to have a center position. I want to have a frame or rather a surface since this one isn't animated. Then we will need a groups and a duration argument. None of these are terribly difficult. For the center position, I want to get the monster sprite dot rect dot center. The surface I want to use, we already have self dot battle sprites. In there, we have UI sprites. And this one contains a cross. This is already imported. For the groups, I simply want to have self dot battle sprites. And the duration could be, let's say, 1000 milliseconds or one second. With that, we can create a timed sprite. Although before we do that, I want to import it right away. With that, inside of the sprites, I want to create another class, timed sprite. And the parent class for this one is going to be a sprite. After that, I want to call define dunder init with self, a position, surface, groups, and duration. I want to call this super dunder init method. And as a reminder, we are going to initialize this init method, which means we need these parameters where we have position already covered, surface covered, groups covered. And the one more thing that we need is the Z parameter for which we are going to use our battle layers. And this one should always be on overlay. After that, we do have to update self.rect.center, which should be the position. And that's the same issue we have already seen with the attack sprite. We have done the same thing in there. So essentially for the original sprite and animated sprite, we have a rectangle and via the position, we are placing the top left, which is not what we want to do for the attack sprite and the time sprite. We always want to place the center which we achieve via these lines. On top of that, for the time sprite, we will need a self.def underscore timer, which will be a timer with the duration that we're getting from the parameter all the way up there. I want to set auto start to true. And then the function I want to call once it triggers is going to be self.kill, the inbuilt function of any sprite. And after we have that, I simply want to call update with self and delta time, although delta time we don't actually need. So an underscore here is totally fine. And then self.devtimer.update is all we need. And that should be it. If I now try main.py and I try to catch a monster with full health, we are getting an error because battle sprites object is not subscriptable. Let's have a look. I think that happened when we are creating the time sprite. So there we have the error and I can see it already. We want to get the graphic not from battle sprites, but from monster frames. This one actually contains the graphics. Next attempt. And now if I try to catch a monster, we are getting the error symbol message thingy. That's working reasonably well. That covers catching a monster, and I am going to leave it at 0.9 for now. Although later on, this one should be switched back. Perfect. We are making progress. So with that, we have covered quite a few states. There are two more. The next one, if self.selectionMode is equal to switch, i.e. we are trying to switch the monsters. If that is the case, I want to get an index and a new monster, which I can get from the list self dot available monsters dot items. Don't forget to call this one and then use indexing with self dot indexes and the switch. Also, let's print index and new monster just to make sure we have something to look at. If I now run main.py, and I try to switch a monster. Let's go with this one. We can see the monster we have selected is four and Spartu. 
We can try another one. That still looks pretty good. Let's try this one as well. So, yep, that seems to be working quite well. Which means at this point, we simply want to get the current monster and kill it. That way, we're getting rid of the sprite. And next up, we can create a new monster. With the new monster that we have just gotten, then we want to have the index and self dot current monster dot position index. And you might be wondering, why can we still access this current monster even though we have just killed it? The reason for that is that killing a sprite doesn't actually destroy the sprite. It simply removes it from all of the groups. That way you can still access all of the attributes, which is super handy. The last thing we are then going to need is the entity or the site of the monster, which is always going to be player for this one. After that, I want to get self.selectionMode and set it to none, and then self.updateAllMonsters and resume things. That should be all we need in here. If I now run main.py, I can select another monster. Let's go with this one and we get another monster. Also, if I now try to attack another monster and then try to catch it, that part still works. And now if I try to switch monsters with the one we have just caught, that part also works just fine. So that is looking pretty good. So with that, we have covered all of the major states, but there's one that we haven't covered yet. Inside of selection mode general, index one. This is telling a monster to defend. And at the moment, this doesn't really do anything. To fix that, before we are doing anything else, inside of the if statement, self.currentMonster.Monster, and then defending is going to be true. That we can then use. When we are applying an attack, we are already calculating the damage mechanic in quite some detail here. And essentially, after we are calculating the target defense, I want to check if target sprite dot monster dot defending, if that is the case, then target defense is going to be reduced by 0 0.2. Oh, and also we should create this defending attribute inside of the monster. In the dunder init method, let's do it under stats. We want to have self.defending, which by default is going to be false. On top of that, after the monster gets ready again, we want to disable this defending attribute, which means when we are checking for active and one of the monsters does get ready, then we also want to set monster sprite.monster.defending to false. Although this part is now very difficult to visualize because we have to wait for the other monsters to attack us. Let me just always choose defend and let's hope we get the right monster to be attacked. And well, they always attack the weakest one at the moment. And there we go. Riolera got attacked and the damage is actually really low. Although that might not mean very much. But well, basically inside of apply attack, we know that this number is going to update. So play around with it if you want to change the numbers, but I am fairly confident that it works reasonably well. Righty, with that, we have apply attack, which means there's just one more thing that I want to do in this section. And that is for the battle system, I want to check end of the battle. So we know when either the opponent or the player has been defeated. For that, we don't need custom parameters. And then we have to check two conditions. Number one is opponents have been defeated. And number two is player has been defeated. I suppose we could start with the player because that part is a bit easier. All we really want to check is if length of self and player sprites. And if that number is equal to zero, and just to test that for now, let's print game over. After that, inside of the update method, I want to check self.check 
and battle. And I guess this we should be doing before we are doing anything else. That should be a bit safer. Righty, now to test this one inside of main.py. When we are creating the monster, the player shouldn't have three monsters with level 100. Although for the opponent monsters, I want to have three monsters with a level of 100. And just so we don't have to wait for too long, let me comment out most of the monsters. And let's try this again. And now we should be losing pretty quickly, simply because the opponents are way stronger. So there we're losing one monster, there another monster, and we should be gone. Cool, this has nearly worked. We are getting game over. But after that, we are getting an error message that we cannot choose from an empty sequence, which is okay, this line is not going to run anymore. But basically what happened is when we are checking the opponent attack, we cannot pick a random target anymore, simply because there are no player monsters left. But that's okay because we're not going to get to this line. So instead, we want to run pygame.quit and exit. And since we are importing pygame and sys inside of settings, these two lines should work pretty well. Let's try to run all of this again. And we should be defeated pretty quickly. Cool. And the game just ends, so we are good to go. This covers one part. Next up, we have to work on the opponents, which is going to work in a fairly similar fashion. I want to check if the length of self dot opponent sprites is equal to zero. If that is the case, I simply want to print battle one. On top of that, I want to get for monster in self dot monster data and the player monsters, so dot values, and then reset all of the monster initiatives, i.e. monster dot initiative is going to be zero. That way, when the next battle starts, we don't have some random value already. But that should be it. If I now go back to main.py and for the opponents, I want to have more reasonable levels. Let's say five, six, and seven. And now we can try this again. And if I just defeat them randomly, I should use the proper attack type, but you get the idea. And there we go. All of the opponents have disappeared and we get battle one. Although this we get many, many times, which might cause an issue down the line. To account for that, I want to add and not self dot battle over. And then once this if statement triggers, I want to set battle over to true. On top of that, in the dunder init method, I want to create another attribute self dot battle over, which by default is going to be false. That way, and let me comment out most of the monsters. We should only see battle over once, which is going to be much safer. And there we go. We have won the battle and everything still works just fine. Perfect. So with that, we have basically all of the battle logic. There's just one minor final thing that I want to cover. And that is when a monster gets defeated, you can see something like minus 50 health, which is kind of a cool effect. And if you want to keep it, just skip this part but I want to limit the lowest health to zero. And for that, inside of the monster, let me minimize everything. I want to insert a stat limiter in which we are setting self.health and self.energy. And basically for both, what we are going to do, we are going to make sure that we have a max value of either zero or a min value of self dot health and self dot get stat with max underscore health. Or in other words, we first get the larger value between zero and the smaller value between self dot health and self dot max health. That way self dot health can never go beyond the max health or below zero. And the same thing we want to do for energy. So let me copy all of this. The only change that we have to make is this needs to be self.energy 
and the max value should be max energy. After that, we have to make sure that we are calling the stat limiter. That's going to happen inside of the update method. You can put it basically wherever you want. Self.statLimiter. And with that, if I now run main.py again, and let me try to hit either monster with water attack, so we do lots of damage, and we always keep it at zero. So that looks pretty good. Perfect. And with that, we have finished the battle system. Now later on, we have to add some sounds, but that's a fairly minor part. What is much more important for now is to connect the battle system to the overworld, which will be the next part. I'll see you there. So with the overworld and the battle system in place, we have to connect the two. And that's going to be the last major part that we have to work on. Although on top of that, there are a few more minor things that I also want to cover. Most importantly in there, we have the evolution system. So if a monster hits a certain level, we want to switch it to another monster. Besides that, for the characters, I want to have a nurse that heals all of the player monsters. And finally, I want to add all of the sounds. That part should be fairly straightforward. Once we have covered all of that, we have the entirety of the game. So let's jump right in and get started with the easiest part, the nurse system. So here we are back in the code and I have cleaned up the tabs a bit. The Python files that we will need are main.py, entities.py, battle.py, along with support.py and game data. Although the first three are the most important ones. And to get started, I want to implement a nurse so that when the player goes to a hospital, we can get healed. For that, when we are creating the characters, that happens in there, in the setup method. I want to add one more argument, which is going to be nurse. The value for this is going to be a boolean. And basically what I want to check is obj.properties and then we have a character underscore id. If that value is equal to the string nurse, then we know we have a nurse. Now to understand what that means, in tiled, we have to find a nurse. In the overworld, we don't have a nurse. But if you go to hospital.tmx, we have one nurse here. And there you can see character id is nurse. That is what we are looking for. Also, this nurse should be a bit further down so the player can actually reach it. Oh, and by the way, while we are here, inside of world TMX, the player shouldn't be in the top left. He should rather be further down here. With that, we know if a character is a nurse or not, which means next up, we want to work inside of the character class. First of all, we have to give this one another parameter, nurse. And then inside of Thunder init, turn this into an attribute self dot nurse is going to be nurse. That's all we need in here. Next up, we want to work inside of main.py, more specifically in end dialog. At the moment, we are only getting rid of the dialog tree and then unblocking the player. Not very much so far. And in this section, we're going to expand this method quite a bit. First of all, I want to check if character.nurse, and if that happens to be, I want to cycle through all of the player monsters, i.e. for monster in self.player monsters.values. And then set monster.health to monster get underscore stat with the max underscore health. That way, we are setting health to the maximum value. And the same thing we want to do for the energy, except now we want to set it to max energy. That way, we are healing all of the monsters. And only after that is the case, do I want to unblock the player. And with that, we have the nurse. Now to test this, inside of Dunder init, I want to comment out battle, but we will need the attribute self.battle although it should be none by now. Keep the instant sync of this battle class. We are going to need it in just a second and it's going to save you some writing. Anyway, if I now run main.py, we are not getting an error. And if I go to the hospital, I can talk to a nurse and we are getting our monsters have been healed. 
Now, this isn't really something we can observe right now, because our monsters have the full amount of health. But what we can do, after we created all of the monsters, for monster in self.playerMonsters.values, monster.health multiply equals 0 0.5. That way, if I run the game again, we get 50% health for all of the monsters. So now if we go to a hospital and get healed, all of the monsters have the full amount of health. So that is working really well. With that, we don't need this for loop anymore. And we have covered one part. Now we have a nurse. After that, if the character we are talking to is not a nurse, so L if, and we want to check not character dot character data, and then we want to check for defeated. Or in other words, when we are finishing a dialogue, we want to check if the character we're talking to is a trainer that hasn't been defeated. If that is the case, we want to start a battle. Although for now, let's simply print start battle. If I run the code and talk to a character, we should be getting start battle in the bottom left. And we do, that is looking pretty good. Which means if this is the case, we actually want to create one instance of the battle class, which we can do by copying the values that we have created earlier. And then we don't need this self.battle anymore. We want to create a battle class and I think all of this should happen over multiple lines, so it's a bit easier to read. We have the player monsters, then we have the opponent monsters. Next up, we have the monster underscore frames. We are getting a BG surface. And finally, I think this one is simply called the fonts. So with that, we are creating one instance of the battle class. And there's one thing we already have to change. We want to get for the opponent monsters, the actual monsters of this trainer. And I should actually do a reminder, if we're looking at the entities and the character, there are two data points we are working with at the moment. The first one is this character data defeated. This you can find inside of the character in character data. But ultimately what we are referencing is inside of game data. There we have the trainer data, and this one contains the defeated key value pair. By default, all of these values are false, but once a trainer has been defeated, we are going to set this to true. Besides that, all of the trainers have some monsters. Those we have to get into the character, which means for the character, I want to create another attribute, self.monsters, which is going to be a dictionary comprehension where we want to have an index and then a monster. All of that data is going to come from for i and data in character data, and we want to get the monsters. And from that, we want to get the items. If you look at game data, monsters is simply a dictionary where we have the index of the monster and then the monster along with the level. That we want to convert to an actual index with the monster class. For that, we want to call the monster class and then pass in the monster name and the monster level. That we can make quite explicit because data right now is a tuple with the monster name and the monster level, which are the two points of data we want to pass into monster. So name and level. That should be it for this part. Although if I run main.py, we are going to get an error that we have a name error, monster is not defined. That happens because some trainers do not have monsters because they are nurses. So if I go down a bit further, at some point there should be a nurse and the nurse obviously doesn't have monsters. To account for that, when we are creating the monsters, I want to check that we are only creating this dictionary if there are monsters in the character data. If that is not the case, else we want to attach none to this value. So if we now run the entire thing, we are getting the same error. And I just realized I made a mistake. When I talked about this error, that monsters is not inside of character data, 
This would have been the next step. The actual error that we have gotten is that this monster class doesn't exist inside of this Python file at the moment, which we can change quite easily from monster import monster. And now if we try all of this again, there we go. Now this all works just fine. That means next up, when we are creating a battle class for the opponent monsters, we can get the character and the monsters. Besides that, we also have to cover the background surface. At the moment, we are always using the forest, but that we can make more flexible by using character dot character data. And in there, if you look at game data, we have a biome that I want to use. That is all we need to get started. If we now store this instance in self dot battle and run the game, and we are getting to a fight. We can also still attack and everything is working just fine. So definitely doing some progress. But obviously there's no way for us to leave this window, which isn't ideal. Also, I want to have a transition from the overworld to the battle. At the moment, we are switching a bit too abruptly. As a consequence, instead of assigning battle to the attribute right away, I want to set battle to the transition target. And after we have done that, set self.tint mode to int. Now, this is a system we have implemented way earlier when we have switched between different levels. So this tint screen is what we're going to work in. Essentially, what we are going to check is if the tint progress is greater than 255, meaning we are covering the entire window. After that, we want to check if type of self.transition target, if that is equal to the battle class, then we know we want to create self.battle and set it to self.transition target. Meaning now we are setting battle and getting all of this. While we are here, we can also set an L if statement self.transition target is equal to level. Then self.battle is simply going to be none. So this would be the other way around where we are going from a battle to the overworld, which simply means that we want to set battle to none. Finally, if neither of those are the case, else, then we want to run the setup method to create another level. And that's all we need to get started with this part. So if I now talk to a trainer again, we should have a nicer transition. And that is looking much better. The rest still works just fine. So with that, we can get from the overworld to a battle. But how can we get back? For that, we will need another method that I have called end underscore battle. Besides self, we will need a character parameter. In this method, I want to get self.transition target and set it to level. Then I want to set self.int mode and tint the screen, and then check if we have a character, in which case we want to set character dot character data defeated. And this one should now be true. On top of that, self dot create dialog with this character. Or in other words, once the battle ends, which means inside of the battle class, we are gonna call check and battle. So in there, instead of printing battle one, we want to call this end battle method. And then check if we have a character, if that's the case, we want to set this character to defeated and then display the defeated dialog. That's all we need for now. So next up, we have to make sure that this end battle is inside of the battle class. Or rather, when we are creating an instance of this class, we have access to this method, which we can do via another parameter. I want to add end underscore battle. The value is going to be self dot end underscore battle. That means inside of battle.py, we have to add one more parameter, end underscore battle, and turn all of that into an attribute, self dot 
end battle is going to be end battle. On top of that, when we go down a bit, instead of printing battle one, I want to call self dot and battle. And now we have to get the character in there, which we are also going to do via a parameter. So we want to have a character or a trainer, doesn't really matter what you call it. For that, we have to once again work inside of main.py and then add another named argument. We want to have a character. That part is really easy because we already get the character. So that we have to pass in there, character, and then we are good to go, although we do have to store that as an attribute as well. Self.character is going to be character. So quite a bit more data. But now, when we are checking for the end of the battle, we can call self.endBattle and pass through self.character, which means we are calling this end battle. We are setting the transition target to level, then tint mode to tint, and we are creating a new dialog. After that, we are going to tint screen. We are tinting everything, so things are going to black. And once we are reaching the full value, so 255, we get to this if statement, and we know that transition target is level, which means by the end of it, battle is going to be none. Let's try. If I now, let's talk to this character, I think it's a bit easier to defeat. So we should still get a transition, that looks good. And now if I defeat the monsters really quick, there we go. We get a transition, we get a dialogue, and that is working really well. Although afterwards, we are not able to walk anymore, but we are making progress. First of all then, once the battle is over and we are ending the dialogue, we have to unlock the player, which we can do via an else statement self.player.unlock. That should be all we need. Next attempt. Okay, we are making progress and I can walk around perfectly fine again. And now if I talk to this character again, we are always getting the defeated dialogue. Perfect, that is working quite well. So next up, we need a system that if the player walks in tall grass, we want to have random monster encounters. Or in other words, there should be a random timer that if we are in tall grass, after some random period of time, we should be attacked. Imagine that this is the timeline of the game. And our player currently is here, meaning a random amount of time has passed, this specific number doesn't really matter. What we want to check is, if the player has touched some grass, then we want to create a timer that runs for a short amount of time. And if this timer runs out and the player is still in tall grass, then we want to start a fight, which means we have to do two things. Number one, once the player gets into tall grass, we want to start a timer. And after this timer is finished, if we are still in tall grass, then we want to start a battle. I have organized all of that via two methods. Let's put all of that in a separate section, monster and counters. First of all, I have define check underscore, let's call it monster. No need for custom parameters. And we basically want to check if the hitbox of the player is inside of any of the grass patches. For that, first of all, we need to know where all of the monster grass patches are, meaning we have to create another sprite group, self.monster underscore sprites. A better name here might be grass patch or something like that, but I think you get the idea. Now we have monster sprites. That means next up, when we are creating the entire level, we want to check for all of the grass patches, those. They should be inside of all sprites and they should be inside of self.monster sprites. That way we always know where all of them are. That's a good start. So next up, when we are checking for the monsters, we want to check if the list comprehension sprite for sprite in self.monster sprites, i.e. we are getting all of the monster sprites, but we only want to get the ones that are colliding with the player hitbox, i.e. sprite.rect.collide.rect with self.player.rect. 
hitbox. On top of that, I want to check and not self.battle and self.player.direction. So in other words, we are checking three things. If the player is colliding with tall grass, if there's not currently a battle, and if the player is moving. I think all of them are fairly straightforward. If that is the case, I want to start a timer. Let's call this one self.encounter timer. This is what I want to activate. Also, I want to make sure that this timer is not currently running, which we can do with another if statement. If not self.encounterTimer.active. Only if that is not the case, do we want to start the timer. Now, this timer doesn't exist at the moment, which means inside of Dunder init, all the way at the top, I want to create the encounter timer, which will be a timer with a duration of 2000 for now. And if this thing times out, I want to call a function, which is going to be self.monster underscore encounter. This method does not exist at the moment and we'll create it in just a second. First of all, though, we have to from timer import timer. Cool. Next up, we can call this timer. And besides that, we will need define monster underscore encounter. No need for custom parameters. And for now, let's simply print monster encounter. Now, before we can test all of this, there's one more thing that you shouldn't forget. And that is we have to update the timer. That's going to happen inside of the update method before we are doing anything else, self.encounterTimer.update. On top of that, what you shouldn't forget inside of update, self.checkMonster, i.e. we are calling this method. With that, if I run everything and we are touching grass, after some time, we should get monster encounter. At the moment, this happens every two seconds. So that is looking reasonably well. That means check monster is working. We are not going to need it anymore, but we do have to write some logic inside of monster encounter. First of all, we want to check the collisions again, which we are doing via sprites and another list comprehension. Sprite for sprite in self dot monster sprites, but only if sprite dot rect dot collide rect with self dot player dot hitbox. The same thing we have done inside of check monster. Basically, this list comprehension. Although now we want to check if we have some sprites and self.player.direction, which means we know that this method is only going to be called once the timer has timed out, meaning we know that the player has been moving in grass for two seconds. After this timer, we want to check if the player is still in grass and if the player is moving. If that is the case, I want to set self.player.block and create a new self.transition target, which will be another instance of the battle class. And for the arguments for this one, just to get started, we can look at the transition target for the character and paste it in there. Although we will have to make some changes. The two arguments we have to customize are the monsters and the background. To get both, we have to look at tiled. And specifically, we want to look at the monster layer. Because in there, and let me hide everything else, we get all of the monster encounter patches. And if you look at one of them, we're getting a biome, a level, and the monsters. Notice here that the monsters are simply a string with comma-separated values. Tiled doesn't allow you to have a list, which is a bit annoying, but we can work with it. So what we want to do is get all of this into Pygame and then create custom monsters and access the background surface. And for that, actually, we do have to work inside of the sprites. If you scroll down a bit, there we have a monster patch sprite, which at the moment doesn't do very much. And adding all of the details and then creating a battle once we are in tall grass is going to be your exercise. There are two parts to the exercise. Number one, I want you guys to import the tile data into the monster patch sprite. You will need a level, a biome, and the monster names. After that, once the player is on top of one of those patches, use the data to start a battle. 
should be reasonably doable. Pause the video now and see how far you get. First of all, we have to work inside of setup and then work a bit more with the grass patches. At the moment, we are looping over the layer of the monsters and then create a monster patch sprite. In there, we are actually already passing in the biome, which should give you a hint of how we can access the other data. You can simply copy obj.properties because we also want to have the monsters and then the level. Once we have that, inside of sprites, we will need after biome, the monsters and the level. And for now, let's simply print what we get. I want to print monsters and I want to print the level. Let's try all of that. We are getting the names of the monsters and the average level. So that is looking pretty good. Although that data we have to organize a bit better, which means inside of the sprites, I first of all want to create self.biome, which is the biome we are already getting. We want to store the monsters, but this should be a list, which I can get with monsters.split and then split the string wherever we have a period. And finally, self.level is simply going to be level. Just to make sure that all of this is working, let's print self.biome, self.monsters, and self.level. If I now run main.py, we're not crashing, and we are getting a whole bunch of data. Now you can see I was quite lazy when it comes to the grass patches. We basically always have the same monsters at the same level, but the data is working. That's the important part, which means we don't need this print statement anymore. And next up, we can work inside of main.py, specifically in the monster encounter, because this sprites is going to contain all of these monster patch sprites or at least the ones the player is colliding with. So for example, to get the background surface, we still want to get all of the BG frames, but then for the key, we want to get sprites and the first one. And on this, we have the biome attribute. Besides that, we need a couple of monsters, which we are going to create via dictionary comprehension. And just as before, we want to have a dictionary with an index and a monster, which we can get via a for loop, for index and monster in enumerate sprites zero, and then we have the monsters. That means for the key, we can get the index. And for the monster, we want to create one instance of the monster class in which we are going to need the name of the monster that we're getting from the for loop. And then we will need a level, which we can get from sprites zero dot level. And this I want to randomize just a bit, meaning I want to add a random integer that goes from negative three to three. That way we don't always get the same level. Although I don't think we have rand int available at the moment, we do not. So all the way to top from random import rand int. That is almost all we need. The last thing that we have to change is for the character, we want to have none. So with all of that, let's try the game. And let's see if something crashes. So at the moment, the player simply stops walking, but we do not get a battle. Something has gone wrong. And I can see it right away. We have to set self.tint mode to tint. Next attempt, if I now walk around in the tall grass, we're getting to a battle. And I can still attack the monsters. Let me use their weak types. And. After that, we go back to the overworld and we are not able to move anymore. But that is a thing we can fix quite easily. We simply have to look at and battle and then check if we don't have a character, if that is not the case, self.player.unblock. Next attempt. And now should get a battle. We can still defeat all of the monsters. And after that, we can walk around again. Also now we are getting some experience that is looking pretty good. Cool. That is looking really good. There's just one more thing that I want to do. When we are encountering a monster, 
I want to set self.encounter timer and switch up the duration, which we're going to do via rand in again, and then get a random value. I went with a value between 800 and 2500. So the next encounter could be really fast or quite a bit away. That means if I now try all of this again, I can walk around and we're getting a battle. So let's defeat the monsters really quick. And then we can walk around again. And now we get a battle much faster. And our monsters do not update their initiative only after we get attacked. So something has gone wrong, but we are definitely making progress. So let's fix this bug really quick. Basically, inside of battle.py, when we are creating a monster, I want to make sure that monster.aust is equal to false. That way, if I run my.py again, and let me speed all of this up. And now we get another battle, and there we go. We are getting the proper behavior. Everything else is also working just fine, so this is looking pretty good. So with that, we have the entire transition between the battle system and the overworld. We are making a ton of progress. The last major chunk then is going to be the evolution system, for which I want to create a new Python file. So a new file, and then let's call it evolution.py. We will need from settings and import everything. Also, we are going to need a timer, meaning from timer, import, timer. Once we have that, I want to create a class called evolution. And then we will need a dunder init method with a whole bunch of parameters. We will need frames, a start monster and end monster a font. And then we want to end the evolution to get back to the overworld. In there, we will first of all need a display underscore surface that we are getting from pygame.display.get underscore surface. Then we will need self.start monster underscore surface and an end monster surface. The way the system is going to work, we're going to show the first monster and then slowly fade it out to white. And once we have reached the full amount of white, we are switching to the evolution. So in practice, we are simply showing two different surfaces, which we can get via the frames. And both start and end monster are simply monster names, which means those we can use inside of the frames. So I want the start monster, then get the idle state and the first frame. Now this is going to be very small. And to make this a bit more visual, I want to put it inside of pygame dot transform.scale to x. That will make it twice as large. The same thing I want to do for the end monster with the only difference being that we want to now use the end monster. On top of that, I want to create a timers dictionary where we have a start timer, which will be a timer with a duration of 800 milliseconds and auto start will be true. Besides that, I want to have an end timer, which is going to get a duration of 1800. And the function we are going to call is going to be end evolution. Or in other words, when we are starting the evolution, we will show the monster or the start monster for 800 milliseconds. And once the evolution is done, we're going to show the end monster for 1.8 seconds. With that, we can already get started with a basic update method for which we need self and delta time. And first of all, in there, I want for timer in self dot timers dot values and then timer dot update. That way the timers are going to work. Next up, I want to check if not self dot timers and start is active. That is going to be the start timer. And only after this timer is over do we want to do stuff. And the thing that we want to do is self dot display surface dot split. And then I want to tint the entire window, which we're going to do via self dot tint underscore surface at position zero and zero. 
This tint surface doesn't exist at the moment, but we can create it quite easily. And for that, I want to create a section called screen tint. We simply want to create pygame.surface with the same dimensions as the display surface. So self.displaySurface and get underscore size. This surface we want to make semi-transparent, i.e. self.tintSurface set underscore alpha, and I want with a value of 200, but you can play around with it. That was quite a bit of setup, but now that we have that, inside of main.py, I want to import from evolution the evolution class. And now we have to figure out when to display this thing. And for that, I have created another method, define check underscore evolution. No need for custom parameters, and basically we want to check for index and monster in self dot player monsters dot items. We first of all want to check if a monster has an evolution in the first place. For that, let's have a look at the monster class. So we have quite a few Python files. At the moment, we don't have an evolution value in here. So we have to create it self.evolution. This value we are getting from the monster data, then self.name, and in there we have evolve. So if you look at game data and the monster data, inside of monster data, if you look at the first monster plumet, you can see we have an evolve property with the name of the monster and the level needed to reach that evolution. If a monster has reached the final stage, then evolve is going to be none. So just to make sure you see what we are getting from self.evolution, let's print the value self.evolution. And if I now run main.py, we are getting an error because I have to add pass in there. But next attempt, and now we're getting either none or a tuple with the name of the monster and a level. That's looking good. If a monster has an evolution, we want to check if monster.level is equal to monster.evolution, and we want to get the first index. That would be the level. So inside of game data, we would, for example, get 15. If we have reached that level, we want to play the evolution animation, for which we want to block the player, i.e. self.player.block, and then self.evolution, is going to be one instance of the evolution class. For that, we are going to need all of those parameters. Frames are going to be self.monster frames, and we only really care about the monsters here. The start monster will simply be monster.name, and the end monster is going to be monster.evolution with value zero. The font that we want to use is going to be self.fonts along with the bold font. End evolution will become a method that we will create in just a second, self.end evolution. That we have to create right away. Fine, end evolution with self. Following this method, we'll set self.evolution to none and unblock the player, i.e. self.player.unblock. Finally, Inside of the run method, we want to have one more overlay. If self.evolution, then self.evolution.update with delta time. And now to test this system, if you look at the player monsters, there we have Lavia, which is level 3. And inside of game data, if I find it really quick, there we have Lavia. And this one evolves to cleave on level four. So we should get this one quite easily. Which means if I run main.py, we are getting an error message that there is no attribute evolution. That happened because when we are creating the dunder init method, we don't have an evolution. That we can add quite easily at the end, self.evolution is going to be none. Next attempt, the game doesn't crash. And now if I encounter random monsters, 
I can defeat them really quick and look at Lavia's level. We should be reaching level four and we do. And now we do not get anything. So something went wrong. And well, the thing that went wrong is we are not calling this check evolution method. To fix that, we want to look at end battle. And instead of an else statement, I want to check l if dot self dot evolution. Then I want to unblock the player and self dot check evolution. So next attempt. And now we are getting a tinted screen, which means that the evolution system does work. Although at the moment it, well, doesn't do anything. First of all, I want to create a rectangle via self.startMonsterSurface and get F rectangle. I want to place the center right in the middle of the window, which means a tuple with window underscore width divided by two and window underscore height divided by two as well. After that, self.displaySurface.lit with self.startMonsterSurface and the rectangle. And while we are testing all of this to make things a bit easier inside of the dunder init method, I want to set the level of Lavia to four right away. And also we don't need the dummy monsters anymore. And then after we are creating everything else, I want to call self.checkEvolution. That way, once the game is starting, we are getting the evolution screen right away. And at the moment, nothing's going to happen, but that we can work on. At least we can see the monster. Also, before we continue, this print statement is getting a bit annoying. In fact, I don't think we need the monster class at all anymore. Next up, inside of evolution.py, we are already displaying a monster, but this I want to tint. Or to be a bit more specific, I want to apply a white tint to the surface. For that, we will need self.start monster surface white. Quite a long name, but basically what we're going to do. We're going to get pygame.mask and then from underscore surface, the self start monster surface, which we are then going to turn into a surface right away. To see what we are getting from that, let me blit this start monster surface white right away. With that, if I now run main.py again, we are getting something like this. A good start, but we want to get rid of the black background. That is not a problem at all. Self dot start monster surface white, and then set underscore color key with a black value. Next attempt, and that is looking good. Now this monster surface should fade in very slowly, for which we're going to need two more values. Self dot tint underscore amount and self dot tint underscore speed. Those values I have set to zero and 50. The tint amount has to start at zero, although the tint speed you can customize. After we have that, I want to get self.startMonsterSurfaceWhite and set the alpha value to self.tintAmount. That way it's not going to be visible in the beginning. But what we can do when the timer has timed out and we are actually displaying things. I want to get self.startMonsterSurface and that would display the monster itself. After that, I want to get self.tintAmount and increase the value by self.tintSpeed multiplied with delta time. And now that we have that value, self.startMonsterSurfaceWhite, we want to change the alpha of this other surface with self.tintAmount once again. Or in other words, for this white surface, we are setting the alpha value in the init method to zero, so it's not going to be visible. But in the update method, we are increasing the tint amount value and then updating the alpha value. 
That way it will slowly fade in. That we do have to display via self.displaySurface.blit with self.StartSurfaceMonsterWhite along with the rectangle. Let's try all of that. And the monster is slowly becoming white. So that part is working. It might be a bit slow. Let's change to 50 to 80. It might be better. So now all of this happens quite a bit faster. But once again, choose whatever value you think looks good. In my case, I want to go to the next step. And that is going to be that we only want to do all of this if a condition is true. If self.int amount is smaller than 255. If that is not the case, else, then we want to display the evolution, for which we're going to need another rectangle, which we can get via self.endMonster surface and get a rectangle, where we are placing the center right in the middle of the window. For that, we can duplicate those values. Afterwards, self.displaySurface.lit with self dot end monster surface and the rectangle. Next attempt, we are getting the monster and after it gets completely white, we're getting the evolution. That looks really good. Once we have all of that, we can also get self dot timers and the end timer and activate it. Remember for this timer, once it times out, we are calling end evolution. That way, we're getting back to the overworld. Although this timer, I only want to call if it is not currently running, meaning if not self.timers.end.active. And with that, if I now run main.py, we're getting the evolution after a short amount of time, then we are evolving, and then we can walk around again. Although if you look at the monster index, nothing has changed. That we can work on in a second. First of all, I want to finish the evolution screen. Because I also want to have some text in there. That's going to happen inside of the Dunder init method. I want to have text. Specifically, I want to have two text surfaces. Start text surface along with an end text surface. Both of those we are going to create via self dot render where we will need some text then faults and then colors with the black color the text for the start surface is going to be an f string with the start monster and is evolving and make sure that all of this is actually a string and pay close attention here start monster is what we're getting from the parameters we are not actually storing this inside of the class. We are turning it right away into a surface or into a piece of text. For the end surface, I want to have another f string with the start monster and evolved into the end monster. That way, we have two surfaces that we want to display. The first one is going to be in the first if statement, where we are still displaying the original monster. I want to create a text underscore rectangle with self dot start text surface and get f rectangle. I want to place the mid top to rect dot mid bottom plus a vector for an offset of zero and twenty pixels. After that, self dot display surface dot blit with self dot start text surface and the text rectangle. Also, before we are displaying the text, I want to have some background, which we will create via pygame.draw.rectangle. I want to draw on the display surface. The color is going to be colors and white. Then I want to get the text rectangle and inflate it by 20 pixels. And then finally, 0 for the border width and 5 for the border radius. That should be all we need for one part of the text. Let's try all of that. And we get evolution has no attribute render. That happened up here. 
Instead of self.render, this should be self.font.render. The font we're getting from up there, and in fact, this shouldn't be self at all. This should just be font.render. Next attempt. We are still getting the evolution, and now we're getting some text as well. Good start. So next up, we have to display text in the else statement. We can simply copy the original piece of text and paste it in there. For the text rectangle, I want to get the end text surface, although the rest can stay the same. Then for pygame.raw.rect, we can keep all of this the same as well. And finally, we want to display self.end text surface along with the text rectangle. That should be all we need. Next attempt, we get the evolution, and after that, we get another piece of text. And then we can walk around again. Perfect. That nearly finishes the animation for the evolution. There's just one more thing that I want to do. If you look at the folder for the project, in graphics and other, we have a star animation. This I want to play once we get to the evolution. It's not terribly complicated. We simply have a whole bunch of stars and that's basically it. To play those, first of all, we will need an import. And that happens in the dunder init method under import assets. Right below the BG frames, I want to have self dot star animation underscore frames, which we can get via import underscore folder. Then we want to go up a folder to graphics, then to other, and to there we have the star animation. Let me run the code to make sure this is working, and it does. That's looking good. After that, we want to look at check evolution down there. And if a monster is evolving, when we are creating one instance of the animation, I want to pass in self.star animation frames. That means next up, inside of evolution, we want to get the star animation frames. Or I guess we could just call it star frames. That's a bit easier. For those, I want to add another section with the star animation. In there, we want to have self dot star frames, which is going to be star frames. Also, we will need a self dot frame index. And before we continue, I want to scale up all of the frames inside of this list, like we have done for the start and end monster surface which means a list comprehension with pygame dot transform dot scale to x with the frame for frame in star frames. That way the entire thing looks a bit more coherent. Cool, once we have that, when we are seeing the final monster, I want to run a method called self dot display stars along with delta time. This method doesn't exist right now, so we have to create define display stars with self and delta time. This is just going to be a basic animation, i.e. self.frame index plus equal some kind of animation speed. I think I went with 20 and multiply it with delta time. And then if self.frame index is smaller than the length of self.star frames. We want to get a frame, we want to get a rectangle, and then self.display surface with the frame and the rectangle. The frame is simply going to be self.star frames with integer of self.frame index. The rectangle is going to be frame and get a rectangle that we want to place right in the center of the window, which we have already done a couple of times. I can copy the line. And that should be it. If I now run main.py, we get the evolution, and once we are done, we're getting an error message. A surface is not callable. 
That happens because I forgot to add dot lit. So next attempt. And that is looking really good. Everything else also works just fine. So I am quite happy with the animation. That means we can close evolution.py. And the next important part is that we actually get another monster. So we are applying the evolution. After the evolution animation, I want to get self.player monsters along with the index that we are currently on. And with that, we are overwriting the current monster, which is totally fine because we want to create a new monster with monster dot evolution and zero. I eat the evolution monster and then the monster dot level. That way, if I now run all of this again, we get the evolution. And at some point we get a new monster. If I now open the index, we have a whole nother monster. And to test all of this just a bit more, inside of Dunder init, I want to set the level of Lavia back to three. So now if I am over a grass patch, we should still get a battle and I can defeat the enemies quite quickly. That part is working and now we get the evolution. And then we have another monster and we can continue the game. That is working quite well. Also at this point, we shouldn't check evolution anymore inside of Dunder init. And also once we finish fighting a trainer, we should check for an evolution, which means inside of end dialogue, once we have defeated a trainer, self.check evolution. Don't forget to call it. And in the game, let's try to find this trainer. Shouldn't take too long. We get some dialogue and afterwards we're getting the evolution. This part still works just fine. And then we can once again continue everything. Cool. With that, we have the evolution. That means we are basically done besides the audio. So let's get started with that. First of all, we have to import a couple of files. and That's gonna happen inside of import assets. At the bottom, I want to have self.audio. For which I want to have an audio importer with a file path. Up a folder. Then we want to go to audio and that's actually it. If you look at the project folder inside of audio, we have a whole bunch of files that we want to import. For that, we want to work inside of support.py and let me minimize everything. At the bottom of the importer functions, I want to have an audio importer along with a path. And for all of that, we have already seen something similar, except now I want to have a dictionary with the files. Then for folder underscore path, the subfolders we don't care about, so an underscore, and then we have the file names. In, walk, and join of the path. After that, we want to look at all of the file names, i.e. for file name in file names. Next up, we want to create a full path using the join method and then stitch together the folder path with the file name. And once we have that, I want to get the files dictionary and create a new key value pair. The key is going to be the file name and this we want to split to get rid of the file ending, which means wherever we have a dot, we're going to split it and then pick the first value. The value we are going to assign to this key will be pygame.mixer.sound along with the full path. At the end of all of this, I want to return the files dictionary. At the end of all of this, I can print self.audio, run the entire game. It doesn't crash and we get a dictionary with a whole bunch of sound files. That's a really good start. That means we don't need the print statement and we can collapse import assets. Now we have to figure out when to play the sounds. And the first sound I want to play is if one of the characters notices the player, I want to play the notice sound. 
for that, when we are setting up all of the characters down here, I want to add a notice underscore sound, which is going to be self dot audio and notice. After that, inside of entities.py, when we are creating the character, we need one final parameter, notice underscore sound, that we want to store all the way at the end. Self dot notice sound is going to be the notice sound. After that, inside of the raycast, once the character sees the player, we want to get self dot notice sound dot play. And with that, if I now run main.py, we should be able to hear a sound. And we do. That is working pretty well. So that covers the entities. We also don't need the sprites anymore. The next important part is going to be the battle. There, we want to have a whole bunch of sounds that we are going to pass into it when we are creating one instance of the class. And this happens in two spots. So when we are ending the dialogue, we want to have the sounds, which we're getting from self.audio. This I can copy because next up, when we have a monster encounter, we want to have the same value. And after that, we have to make sure that we are storing all of this as an attribute. And let's place it all the way at the beginning. Self.sounds is going to be sounds. And to make sure you can see what's going on, let me print what we are getting. Self.sounds. If I now run main.py and we are getting into a fight, the game doesn't crash and we can see a whole bunch of sounds. Now, for the battle, the only sounds that we are going to use are going to be for different attack moves. For example, we have fire, we have ice, we have green for healing, and then a few more. The way this system is going to work, if you look at game data and hide everything besides the attack data, every attack has an animation. For example, there we have fire, green, scratch, and so on. The name of the animation is also going to be the name of the sound we want to play. So if we have the fire animation, we also want to play the fire sound. Fairly straightforward. When we are applying an attack that happens down there, right below the attack sprite, we also want to get self.sounds and then get the attack data along with the attack and then we have, I call this one, the animation. That way we get the name of the file we want to play. And well, this we want to play. If I now run main.py and we can get into a fight. That sound is working and the fire sound is working. Let's try one more for ice. That is also working. Cool. So with that, we have all of the sound effects. That leaves us only with the background music and that we have to work with inside of the game class. So we don't need battle, support or game data. First of all, in the dunder init method, after we are doing all of the imports, I also want to self.audio and get the overworld and play that one. Also for an argument, I want to add a negative one to play this one continuously. The argument we're specifying here is for the loops. If you set this to five, you'll play the audio five times. A negative one plays it forever. Cool, that is working well. So with that, we have an overworld sound. That means we don't need dunder init anymore. And next up, if we are ending a dialogue and then starting a battle, we want to do two things. Number one, we want to get self.audio with the overworld and then stop that track. On top of that, I can actually duplicate the entire line because we now want to get the battle music and play it. Once again, with negative one, 
So we are playing this continuously. Also, this we have to do for the end dialogue and for monster encounter. Meaning before we are starting the battle, we want to stop the overworld music and start the battle sound. Let's try all of that. Okay, this works reasonably well, but once the battle is over, we do not stop the battle music. For that, we want to look at end battle. And then once the battle is over, we want to get self.audio battle and stop the music. After that is the case, we want to check if we have an evolution, then we want to play the evolution sound. If not, we want to play the overworld sound. For that, we want to look at check evolution. And if there's an evolution, we know that we have a value for self.evolution. However, if we don't have self.evolution, then we simply want to get self.audio, the overworld, and play that one. On the other hand, if we do have an evolution, then inside of this if statement, I want to get self.evolution and play that sound. Finally then, inside of end evolution, i.e. the evolution has finished, we want to get the overworld sound and play that one with negative one. This should also happen up here. And on top of that, we want to get the evolution sound and stop it. And I usually put the stop sound before the play sound. That just feels a bit better. And I think that's it, if I now run all of this again. And that part is working as well. So with that, we have the entirety of the game. And this was a longer tutorial. I hope you found it useful and I'll see you around.